heartiest welcome to all the panelists for contributing the valuable time and expertise for the symposium hosted by Rizvi College of Architecture. I, Khadija Khan, would uh, like to extend a warm welcome to the guests online and offline, the principal of the college, Professor Rekha Desai, the faculty and all my students. It's wonderful to see everybody present and connected with us today. Uh, to invoke Almighty on the onset, I would now like the students to start with the prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. A'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'een Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeem wa sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim Ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim wala al-dhalleen Ameen Thank you students. At this point, I would like to request our esteemed principal, Professor Rekha Desai, to present the welcome address. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning, all the speakers and all the uh, moderators, our students, and all the people who may have joined uh, from the link that was shared. We are very happy to have you all here. <clears throat> so, uh, I think yesterday we did the opening of our uh, exhibition, the work done by the students, and uh, uh, exhibition put up by Aslam on the Bishtis of uh, Mumbai and it's a very interesting uh, exhibition which you I would invite you all to come and have a look so I'm not going to take much of the time because I have a, I did the introduction yesterday also so I'll just say welcome to Ainsley welcome to Anupam and welcome to Simeon and the theme is very interesting we are looking at Mumbai and uh, we all understand, we all relate with Mumbai, like, you know, somebody said that in Mumbai is infectious, like, you know, you can never get enough of it. Like. And um, so we thought why Mumbai becomes so interesting and it has its own um, issues, it has its own um, concerns. So we thought let's, uh, let's talk to people, like, let's invite people and let's discuss Mumbai and it's high time that we do that, like, you know, otherwise, as Minas was saying that uh, always the real estate people and the high-end high people are talking in Mumbai and they are being heard, like, you know, we, so we thought 
let's also at our level even the artist we, mumbai has so much like you know mumbai has multiple layers we all say man, mumbai is has its multiplicity it has multiple languages it has multiple communities staying together so this was a dialogue which we plan to continue ahead so we thought let's start talking at least a little bit so even for our uh, ad we chose two of the communities to uh, we try to map them we took uh, uttan and gorai as one of the site where the students worked on um, uh, the east indian communities and they have produced some really good work which is in the form of an exhibition put up in the college and for the third year we had identified um, uh, sasun docks as the site where they are looking at koli communities and again they have documented some very good work so um, so we 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 said let's let's start talking about mumbai and we have some very interesting panelists and uh, we will be having these two days events which will uh, i think benefit all the students also and to us also listening to various voices so now i'll hand over to minaz and uh, mamira ma'am who will do the introduction of the symposium and the yeah. speakers before that i will just welcome pradna ma'am who has joined us uh and nuzat my friend i think she has joined from singapore and all the other people who have hello ma'am so good to see you <laughs> yeah so it's nice to see people joining who say uh, husain is there and some others to other people are there so welcome all of you to rizvi college of architecture and please forgive us if there is some hitches glitches from our side because it's it's it may this digital medium can be a little difficult at times but uh, we hope to have very interesting journey ahead and i hope you all enjoy the sessions ahead over to you minas and then meera ma yeah thank you yeah so now i would like to call upon the curators of the symposium professor meera maligankar and professor minaz ansari to introduce the nuances of the conference to the students of the college so can you hear me yes uh yes good morning everyone it's a beautiful morning we are here to discuss bombay bombay mumbai mumbai so our city speaks in many voices and uh, uh, every voice narrates its own story its own journey its old relationships and new connections that we keep building and which creates the multilayered saga that our city is however as uh, rekha just mentioned you know there are the voices that we predominantly hear are those which drive economic change the voices of the real estate market the share bazaar the movie industry and such so we are trying to unravel what is hiding behind this loud cacophony of sounds which are you know thrust upon us by the media so there are some sounds some voices which are sung in local dialects some are mingled in the food that we eat there are others which are displayed in art festivals in the built heritage that we have around us and finally there are those which are whispered by the city's natural elements the informal settlements and by often the invisible communities that we have and as we can see uh voices of mumbai is a very simple idea but it is extremely multi layered so are all these voices heard and as a a community of architects what are the voices that we need to hear and what are the various lenses through which we need to see the city other than the lens of uh, architecture and built form so uh, once we started uh, you know uh, pondering over this we re realize that there are so many individuals and groups in our city who have been uh, doing their bit to contribute uh, to the betterment of the city to bring about positive change in the city to document the city various things and therefore the symposium created a platform for not only architects and urban planners and urban designers but also environmentalists artists researchers citizens photographers who have it uh, all of them to share their connections and their concerns uh, for the city and to help us as audience as an audience to see the city through a different lens uh, i hope you all can see my screen 
yes nina okay so uh, uh, the initial discussion started with looking at a city through various lenses and the first lens that we talked about was heritage because uh, as i mentioned yesterday bombay is a city of living history we walk in and out of heritage through our public spaces like railway stations and museums and uh, village uh, heritage precincts writing uh, bombay as we know is you know a writer's perfect muse from uh, research and uh, uh, you know phd thesis from all over the globe to uh, fiction to uh, into various forms of documentation which we will see today uh, so much has been written about uh, mumbai uh, mumbai is always also a city on the move we all use different forms of transport there are motorized and non motorized forms of transport which help connect us all together as a city and of course you know mumbai is a city with a forest unlike any other it has a large forest at its heart which uh, you know uh, perhaps uh, functions it has a very very important function in uh, providing life to the city uh, we have public spaces uh, given the fact that we have a huge coastline and uh, we hope to see that we have a city for everyone uh, to meet and uh, we see art and culture as a glue that my binds the city together uh, communities of the city as a, a melting pot where everyone comes together and there are so many boundaries which get blurred in everyday practices and food <laughs> we see the city as a city with an appetite i'm sorry for the spelling mistake uh, but uh, it, it's it's a uh, it's a city which bonds over food so these were the various uh, aspects of the city which uh, we started pondering over and then we started looking around for people uh, who had contributed to one or many uh, you know more of these uh, aspects through their work and through their thoughts and through their writings and uh, here we are so i would request uh, you know the co curator professor meera malekaukar to tell us more about who these different voices are and how they have come together uh, to become the voices of mumbai on our symposium thank you minas thank you for the introduction of the conference i uh, hope i am audible i'm sorry yes, welcome ma'am welcome all panelists good morning sibin ansley and anupam uh, here we have six panel the five first panel which talks about history and writing am i audible yes okay yes ma'am you are so they say like invisible city the city however does not tell its past but contains it like the lines of a hand written in the corners of the street the grating of the window and the banister of the step so the city but to read the city we have various we like various astrologers are there who can read the palm we have the people wise people here who can read the city read the history of this city and then they document it and our first panel which talks about heritage and writing we have various people who can read the city and document it in various modes we have material heritage we have architectural heritage as well as we have cultural heritage so here we have anupam sa who will talk about material heritage we have ainsle who will talk about architectural heritage and we have simin patel who will talk about cultural heritage this is our first panel and then generally per se development need not conflict with environment but however the kind of environmental model we are following that is quite detrimental to environment but here we have so many people fighting for environment they want to restore the balance between environment and development and so we have these environmentalists here with us who will talk about the infrastructure development as well as how it relates with your environment how we can preserve our environment as well as continue the developmental aspect everyone knows about hussein indorwala he is activist in environmental work field so he will be talking about uh, his uh, experience about the environment uh, we have uh, talking everyone was about this fight for the mangroves as well as wetlands in the mumbai we have he has done immense work in making the cyclists visible in the city 
we have pedestrians we have motorists but for cyclists i exclude everyone so that we our city should have mumbai firoza firoza suresh as our panelist in this panel your minas please move to next so uh, thank you uh, meena ma'am thank you minas ma'am uh, when we are talking about mumbai our student has map with we are talking about mumbai and here we have various communities we have kolis we have indigenous people and we have east indian community in mumbai so our students has mapped east indian community and their area in gorai uttan and our third panel will talk about how, what they have mapped what was the idea behind it and with us we have kokila deshpande as expert panelist to give feedback to the student as well as give her opinion yeah minas next then, then we will our first day will end with the students presentation for the second day two we have public spaces art and culture here we will have three very well known people who are working in public spaces we every know alan alan abraham his work for restoring the steps in bandra is appreciated well appreciated and acknowledged by any uh, everyone so he will be talking about his project of the these steps and in general what is the role of public spaces in city life then we will have two artists hussein uh, we will have uh, bf everyone knows about this bollywood art projects so bollywood art project actually we had the hand painted uh hand painted culture of posters for the bollywood bollywood is integral part of our life in mumbai and those hand painted posters now randit dhaiya of bap bollywood art project he has taken ahead and his posters hand painted posters are displayed all over the world right from many film uh, many uh, many film festivals to mumbai his biggest and tallest poster is there on the mtnl building so he will talk, be talking about his bollywood art project in this panel and we will have uh, hussein qureshi so he, uh, uh, st plus art this project is uh, i mean our students are actually mapping uh, sasun dog project and in sasun dog uh, this sasun dog art project they have they have contributed to this sasun art project and he will be talking about how that public art in the sasun dog project has enriched the experience experience of the sasun dog as well as what is the role of public spaces and art in our city life this will be our next panel yeah and obviously we are talking about all tangible heritage but we have the food we have the community of course city has got appetite and and unless and until we talk about food and community we cannot finish our discussion about the mumbai and basically our students are discussing this gorai as well as uttan area of east indian community and here in our this panel we will have the uh, we will have a panelist discussing food and community we have two panelists who are extensively working east indian community in food and she was ex hod of xavier xavier college of mumbai and she now is working in this community she herself is east indian and she will be talking about her experience as well as the uh, heritage of east indian community then we have mogan mogan rodriguez is tour guide and he takes the tour for the people and he makes everyone aware of the uh, east indian community present in mumbai so he is the community and finally we have kurush dalal kurush dalal is archaeologist but apart from archaeology he is food blogger also and he has extensively written about uh, food anthropology and he will be talking about food communities and mumbai so i think we have a lot of uh, okay sorry and the last panel least but not least our students has mapped the sasun dock and that they will be pre presenting their research about the sasun dock project and with the student we have selectiona mahajan ma'am selectiona mahajan ma'am is well known writer as well as researcher in mumbai she was urbaner with uh, all india institute of local governance and she has she has 
has worked in various projects of Mumbai as well as DP plan. And she will be here with the student to comment on their work as well as give her in value. They are quite interesting and I hope everyone will enjoy it. And uh, I, will, I welcome all the panelists and I invite our moderators, Sona and Urvashi to take it over. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so as it said, a good discussion increases the dimensions of everyone who takes part. On that note, let's all participate in the discussions with zeal and enthusiasm. We now start our first panel of discussion, Heritage and Writing About Mumbai. Through the works of the three panelists, we hope to understand and deliberate on various aspects around heritage and conservation in the city. We would also like to comprehend the experiences of writing about the city. Our first panel's moderators, Professor Sona Gandhi and Professor Urvashi Purohit will now take over. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meera ma'am, Minaz and Khadija. A very good morning to all of you. We extend a very warm welcome to our very first session of Voices of Mumbai. We start off our symposium with our first panel discussion on heritage and writing around Mumbai as we try to dec decipher the meaning and the implication of heritage and writing through our three esteemed panelists, Mr. Anupam Sa, architect Ainsley Lewis, and historian Dr. Simin Patek. So we begin with Mr. Anupam Sa. Mr. Anupam Sa is a heritage conservation oh. restoration strategist, strategist and educator and serves as the consulting head of art conservation research and <laughs> oh, just just give us a minute huh? yeah. Yeah. you need to be a little lighter, mic is on louder one. and uh, No, no, no. Pam, the voice is a little. So we, anyways, we have a few minutes. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, scheduled for nine thirty. Uh, so I would just like to talk about the exhibitions that are there in the meantime for a few minutes while while we are sorting that out. We, we still have three, four minutes. People are joining online. Right? So let us wait for them. So, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Yes. So at the college uh, campus, we have two uh, students' exhibitions uh, which have been put up. Uh, this is the documentation work that they have uh, uh, carried on uh, in the last uh, in this uh, current semester one is of uh, the village of uh, uttan uh, uh, wherein they have done uh, extensive mapping of uh, not only built form but culture and uh, activities uh, the other is this the, this one has been done by the fourth semester and the sixth semester uh, it's uh, they are uh, uh, they have documented the area around the sasun docks so both these exhibitions are uh, there for another week in the college and uh, we'd be very happy if you know people from academia and industry come discuss uh, the same with the students and give us some feedback on the same. And uh, as uh, Rekha had also mentioned, uh, we have uh, a photographer uh, Aslam Sayyar who has put up his exhibition wherein he has documented the life of uh, the Bishtis during the pandemic and how that community is uh, fading out and adapting to the changing times. So this is also uh, on till uh, the 4th of March. Aslam is going to be here on campus uh, today and tomorrow till 4 o'clock. So yes, we can now go back to our... This. It is almost 9.30, so we can begin. Right. Um, so we begin our um, 
discussion with Mr. Anupam Sa. Mr. Sa is a heritage conservation restoration practitioner. He's a strategist as well as an educator and he serves as the consulting head of, a, of art conservation research and training at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale at Mumbai. He's the founder director of Anupam Heritage Lab India Private Limited and Himalayan Society for Heritage and Art Conservation. He works with a systems approach that enables him to network heritage conservation with other sectors. His primary interest these days is to build up the art conservation profession in India. He has been conferred with the Sanskriti Award for Social and Cultural Achievement UNESCO Asia Pacific um, Commendations and the Knighthood of the Order of the Star of Italy for Excellence in Art Conservation. Through his presentation, he will speak about conservation, restoration of material heritage of Mumbai. We welcome you, sir, and request you to start with your presentation. As stated in the program, um, you have about 15 to 20 minutes, sir. Thank you so much. Um, sir, you're on mute. Uh... Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, thank you very much, first of all, to the principal Rizvi College of Architecture for uh, taking this initiative in um, um, providing this platform. Uh, you know, like all leaders, I think this is one thing that they do is they provide platforms for people to be able to voice their thoughts and their opinions. And so that some people can speak and some people can hear. Um, but that is what a conversation is about. And if you see the word conversation, uh, the Latin versare means to pour and con means together, so to pour together. So all of you, the moderators, the organizers, uh, the visionaries who thought about this program and the group of people who are attending it, um, we, we come here together, mine is the first presentation. Um, so we'll pour our thoughts together. And I hope that as one speaks for the next 13 minutes, what's left of the 15, um, I hope we'll be able to, um, you know, um, create a solution, so to speak, uh, when different things are brought together. And may the solutions then enrich our lives and bring about our personal and professional growth and the growth of the city. When we talk about a city like Bombay, um, what we have with us uh, is, um, it can be beautiful, but eventually when you say that you like Bombay or you like Kolkata is because of the people, you know, and there are different types of people. There are those who write literature and there are those people who literature is made of. And similarly, similarly for Mumbai, um, this is a city that literature is made of. You know, it's there reflected. You mentioned Hollywood in the introduction. Uh, you mentioned, in fact, Bollywood precedes Hollywood. So um, uh, whether it's movies or whether it's uh, books, um, or whether it's conversations like this, Mumbai is the stuff of literature. And there is a continuity in it. Right? There are little, little events that happen once, you remember, but there are other things that go on perpetually. It's, all, it's, a, it's a living tradition, so to speak. Now, Bombay is a place where each of us lives. All of you who are studying there, who are sitting in the audience there. Uh, you know, when I say it's a life spent in empty spaces, <laughs> um, after all, all of us walking on the road, all of us sitting down in a classroom, it's an empty space because you're surrounded by shells. So all the tangible things that are in 
in Bombay, the building, these are solid blocks. And there's a building on the left. And between these two buildings is an empty space. And that is what each of us inhabits here. As we walk along the road, you cross Flora Fountain, you have a fountain on the right, and you have Dada by Noroji's statue on your left. And you have a building behind it and a building on the left of it. Again, there's an empty space where all the vehicles are moving and the people are walking, right? So if you see these, space, if you see these uh, tangible forms that are surrounding you and me, um, I'm calling it an outer face, the facade of things, because that is your visual aspect. You know, what they call the bhautik swarup. It is the, the physical visage of something. And then when you're inside, like I'm in this room, this is my space that I've just moved into. This is the inner faces of these buildings. So if I say Mumbai for me, I've come from Nainital. It's a beautiful town. It's snowing a lot there these days. It's up in the mountains. It's cold. Right? But for me, Mumbai has been these outer faces and the inner faces here. And I pick up for this conversation of the next few minutes. I have the buildings, I have the trees, I have the public statuary. And then for the inner faces, you have the interiors and it's art. This is one of the buildings in Mumbai, about 100 years old, literally 100 years old just now. George Whitted, the architect, Scotsman, he designed this building known as the Prince of Wales Museum of Western India. And then by promulgation of uh, an amendment, uh, it is named known as the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahalai, the CSMVS Museum. Now this museum is one of the buildings here, right? Now, what is there in, about CSMVS? This is the start of a panel discussion. So I'm gonna throw four or five points ahead for all of us from my side and my other colleagues will do the same and then we'll have a chat about things. There are tremendous amounts of drawings and writings of this building. Tremendous amount of drawings and writings from the architectural drawings, you know, the draftsman's lines with a ruler and a pen. Of course, now you have AutoCAD. But of course, you cannot use AutoCAD unless you should not use AutoCAD if you don't know how to first draw with your own hands. You know, that rigor and discipline is extremely important. Then you must think, sometimes we launch ourselves into our work immediately. These are our books. These are our things. Let's go and study. I think it's time to spend some time looking at things. The basalt that you see on the building here and the basalt you see on the buildings all around me, even as I speak, this is millions of years old. The little rock that you pick up just by the roadside is millions of years old. And that millions of years old stone has been fashioned by human beings eventually into rock has been fashioned into stone and then created a building. So the building could, the structure of the building itself is as old as a million years, right? Even though we say it was just literally celebrating its hundred years just now. So I think you got to look at the materials with which things are made. And when you create something from the basic materials that make up the earth, right? And you create an edifice and you create a building you bring people into a building. You bring a country into a building. You bring India into the building. From the way this building, Bijapur ka dome ka ye dome hai. Taj Mahal ka jo finial hai, uska design ye hai. Rajasthan ke chhajje udhar hai. Gujarat ke mensule udhar hai. You know, and they called it a term, you have terminologies, you know. You have Indo-Saracenic architecture. Yeah, whatever you, you are, the architects know what that means, right? So these are, um, it's a capriccio, the building. It's bringing in so many cultures together in itself. And it physically brings people into it. 
it brings audiences into it it brings the people who are working into it and that is what and when people come into an institution when people come into a a, a museum or when people come into a office space they bring the attitudes with them they bring the approach to them they bring the way they've been brought up with them you know and then the building is as much as its people all of us who are now studying and would go out into the world that is what the world will be it will be us it will be our sensitivities it will be our physical presence it will be our languages it will be the way we interact with each other and it will be the value we will bring uh, how we will add knowledge into the world's uh, body of information right so it's not just stone is all this that we bring into it and you see other buildings name the buildings wilson college afghan church um any other building the csmvs uh, all these buildings it's very good to have information knowledge but how to destroy a building soon in mumbai is by very well meaning efforts like you said na maa ne bacche ko bigad diya well meaning tha lekin anjane mein nahi mamta mein ho gaya you want to preserve these buildings we've now armed with all this information about conservation and let's go and there are resources available nowadays and you you see the buildings there's something called pointing many of you children uh, students would know uh, students would soon be our colleagues yeah you put this cementish type of thing between the two stones that they call pointing right when you put that like in yourselves when you have anger and frustration if you put these cement lines around you you know you cannot breathe and it all builds up inside you and then you burst you have a breakdown similarly buildings when you big put this pointing around you seeing it happen i'm seeing it i'm been 10 years 8 years 10 years in mumbai i'm freaked out this whole blinking place is being covered with this pointing efforts um and uh, um and the stones are falling apart because the moisture and the uh, is not allowed to go out of the building so must understand the processes before we launch into something even if it is what we think is good obviously all of us do things which are good the other face that i see in bombay as an outsider as an outsider means who's come from somewhere else right sometimes we are able to see things more in perspective because we have not seen these things before and we are wow what a city man dude this place is crazy yeah we have the trees it's a very strange relationship here what i find of trees and i was thinking whether mai iske bare mein bolu ki nahi bolu lekin maine generally kabhi bola nahi hai iske bare mein but the fact is i find it ridiculous that you have all these buildings in front of we have all these buildings behind the trees and the trees in front of buildings trees that were never supposed to be there probably in the designs this is probably the only city with architecture where you cannot see the architecture you see trees and we are all doing these forced relationships about ecology and this and we can't cut the trees and all i come from a place in the mountains where tr- trees and vegetation is our love you are forcing the trees to live in a place where they can't even breathe aap hamare experiments dekhiye plants ke sath jo pehle kare gaye hain these are living creatures don't worry what the west has taught us that they are inanimate they are completely animate they can sense things right there is a place for everything we are forcing the trees are forcing the buildings to get weakened and we are forcing the uh, you know the buildings to push the trees into these very very strange spaces and stunted growth and breathing and all the pollution that lands on them and at the same time the reason why architecture was created uh, the a- entire reason of the existence is lost because um they are not supposed to be like that so we have to understand and be balanced about this thing about what goes where 
Nobody wants to touch an issue. Yeah, these are forced relationships. Sort them out as soon as possible. Have a conversation about them. See where the trees ought to be and where the trees ought not to be. Instead of destroying millions of acres and thousands of acres of forest, you're fighting to save one tree which doesn't want to live in, you know, in concrete. There are so many other technologies by which you can get this done. Now, public statuary in Bombay, I see a lot of it. And what you see is, you see, there's always a custodian of something. To be the head of something, to be the boss of an office, to be uh, the, 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 the mainstay in a family, uh, whether it is a mother or grandmother or it is a father or somebody, these are thankless jobs. Because the, the person at the head is trying to do one's best with the intentions of, you know, for a larger purpose. But it's always misunderstood and it's thankless. Like the government of India, no matter what it does, it's a thankless job. Any government, anywhere in the world, because it's their job, they better do it. And if they don't do it, then it's worse, right? Here also you have the uh, urban local body, you have the BNC. That's also a thankless job because we're all, it's about the potholes, it's about this, it's about that. But you must remember, they have to do with what they have as human resource. And it's time for all of us and you and me to come together and chip in with them. They're going into this major effort of doing something for the public buildings. They're trying to do something for the landmarks that make this place. They're trying to do the all the sculptures that are there. If you go around Oval Maidan, if you go around this, they're all trying to do projects by which they can enhance the image of the city. But there are so many other things that are competing for attention. So we must be a little gentle with those who lead us. And, um, and that's what will um, help, including, you know, um, putting all these um, tangible heritage of Bombay in place is to have a conversation with them. We must remember, we are the ones who know more than them. So then why not go ahead and hold their hands and make them work with us? Yeah, instead of just um, uh, bashing. And then when it comes to the inner spaces of buildings, you have all these things that make up a building. And if it's an old building, you call them historic interiors. You have the ceramics, you have the copper, you have the bronzes, you have the silver, you have the doors and windows of wood, you have the drapery and the upholstery and the curtains, and all this makes up a building. When you're conserving a building, you're conserving its historic interiors also, because without that, what is the building? And it's the historic interiors that form the space for the people to live in. And I'll just close with a few shots of what the conservation of inner spaces is, the conservation of the material heritage. It's about conservation of the sculptures, it is conservation of the monuments, it is conservation of the stone, the material heritage of it. It's conservation of um, uh, statuettes, things that make us happy, things of significance for us. And you conserve them and you restore them. These are two words that you will get in the conservation of architecture, that you'll get in the conservation of works of art. And the process is like a doctor's. You examine it, you see the objective signs of damage, you analyze it, you do x-rays, you do infrared photography, um, you find out what is the cause for the damage, and then you treat it. You treat it so that it looks beautiful. And you do the same for the terracotta, you do for the stucco, 2000 years old from Afghanistan, here in Bombay. That Harappan pot is about 5000 years old. You have the sculptures, you have the gilded bronzes, you have the ivories, the Indo-Portuguese, the world has come together here. You have the miniatures. You have the cloth paintings. You have the textiles. You have the ritual objects, you have the wood. You have the world coming together here. Right? So just a few thoughts as to really what makes us and makes our city. And to do that, whether you're learning how to work and create buildings or whether you're learning how to create art or conserve art, it is important to understand the material and technology of things. If you're looking at creating and looking after children, 
or even as teacher students, we must know what is it that they're composed of. Unless we know its structure and its composition and the way it has been molded, it'll be very difficult to, for us to understand the degradation of something or the problems with something. Yeah, because mothers always know how to get the child feel better because she knows exactly how he has been made in the mind and in spirit. Body is a different thing. And that's why it is important to understand the material. The books that you're writing on, do you even know how that paper was made? Have you even given a thought to that? Or that ink, what is it composed of? What is that pigment or the dye being carried on? How is it flowing down that nib and that paper that you're writing on? How has it evolved over centuries in the dead? Yeah, and that's when we can make things beautiful once again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stop at this just now. My other colleagues will speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insightful presentation and uh, adding a new perspective to our understanding of material heritage. I'm sure all of us are going to take home a lot of things that we will ponder about, we'll research, we'll probably try to understand a little more. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we now invite architect Ansley Lewis. Ansley Lewis is a double gold medalist from SEPT and established his practice in 1997-98 in Mumbai. He also has to his credit an educational stint with ETH Zurich. He has completed his master's in urban design from USM's Kamla Raheja Institute for Architecture and Environmental Studies. Since its inception, his firm's primary concern has been uh, exploration of varied spatial nomenclatures using three-dimensional studies including large-scale models and computer-generated animations. Uh, the nature of work undertaken varies in scale from uh, large urban design schemes, townships, institutions, hospitality projects, conservation projects, and interior projects of residential as well as commercial spaces. Ansley has a passion for design and his work has been published in professional architectural journals. He has won several awards nationally and internationally, and the one of them being uh, UNESCO Asia Pacific Cultural Heritage Award of Merit 2019 for the restoration of Our Lady of Glory Church in Baikala in Mumbai. As an academician, he is the Dean of the Postgraduate Program of USM's Kamla Raheja Institute, and his academic interests are in architectural pedagogy, architectural design, housing, and conservation. Uh, through his presentation, he talks about the Catholic community's conservation initiatives, and the presentation is titled as Voices at the Grassroots. The community has invaluable, tangible, and intangible assets, and the advocacy to create awareness within the community led to several initiatives of conservation. And through his presentation, he takes us through this journey, a successful journey of several years. We welcome you, sir, and we request you to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. So would you like to go to the slideshow just, presentation? Just a minute. Mode? No, no, just yeah. Small, just a minute. Huh? Yes, sir. Is it shared the screen? Uh, so the screen is shared. We are still seeing the PowerPoint present. Uh, the PowerPoint screen, not the okay. presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Now it is. Yes. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay, uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the management, the principal, um, Amira Malikaukar and uh, uh, Menaz and Sari for having put this together. I think it's a fantastic initiative uh, for students. Uh, I think uh, as uh, academicians, we are sowing uh, a grain into their heads and uh, it will only bear fruit after many, many years. Uh, not not in the near future, but probably in a few years down the line. Um, so I think uh, this is a great initiative and we do hope you'll carry it forward uh, over the years. Yeah. Um, so my presentation is entitled Voices at the Grassroots. Um, and uh, uh, I will start with um, as an academician. And since I'm presenting to students, I think it's important that uh, that um, uh, we kind of uh, make you aware of what is uh, being kind of presented here. There are five aspects to this presentation. The first is the definition, theoretical provise, and literature review of uh, communities and various aspects to it. The catalyst who initiated this kind of uh, process, uh, the philosophy of a structured action plan, which, uh, which the group followed, and uh, the in initiatives, uh, advocacy, voices at the grassroots, and interventions, and of course, the conclusions. Uh, but I would like to state here that uh, none of this is linear in process, okay? Um, probably the voices at the grassroots were heard first, and then we talked about an advocacy and put something together. So, I mean, uh, this presentation, uh, because we're talking about it in a linear fashion, in a PowerPoint mode, uh, I'm presenting it to you in a linear fashion, but uh, it all happens uh, simultaneously with a lot of layers and various aspects to it. Um, so the first thing is the definition of a community. So a community can be defined as a place where one lives, plays, works. Uh, it, may um, it may also loosely refer to an academic community, et cetera. And, um, or it can also defi be defined as a, a set of people who live in a particular place. An American uh, sociologist uh, described community as consisting of persons in social interaction within a geographic area and having one or more additional common ties. Okay, and he goes on to say that uh, what is essential about a community is the we feeling. Uh, and, uh, and for that, it is essential to have um, four ingredients to it. Uh, the people, the territory they occupy, the interaction uh, which, which happens on a day-to-day -day basis or on occasions, and the common values. Um, so uh, the common values in this case, which we are looking at, is the idea of uh, the Catholic religion. Um, so one of the things is that the Catholic uh, re religion was introduced sometime around the sixth century, as uh, mentioned by Cosmos Indico Indicopolis and Jordanius, who worked among the Christians in Thane and Sopara areas. And um, the extent of this areas is now what we call Salset Islands. So it's a little bit of the history which I am giving out to you. Um, and uh, these people existed there before the Portuguese and the British kind of that Mumbai actually covers several parish groups, which are smaller kind of uh, uh, groups which are attached to a church. And uh, the area of influence is up to the Mumbai metropolitan region. So there are various kind of, um, uh, um, kind of religious activities which revolve around the, the, the church and the parish which uh, hold the people and the congregation. Uh, but one of the things which one sees is that initially in the uh, 70s and 80s, late 70s, early 80s, there was um, very little kind of knowledge about conservation of um, tangible heritage. Uh, so um, these are some archival images of 
at the St. Michael's Church in Mahim, not very far from where you are. Um, Our Lady of Salvation Church, uh, which was then designed by Charles Correa, and uh, a Mount Carmel Church in Bandra. Um, uh, so when the community kind of uh, expanded and the population grew, it was very important to kind of, uh, they, the, the, the authorities in the church didn't think it was important to kind of uh, conserve the churches, but they demolished it and built larger structures. Um, but one of the catalysts is the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul, who established a pontifical commission for the conservation of the historic and artistic her heritage of the church in 1988. And um, the later this, um, this kind of um, commission was called the Commission for the Cultural Patrimony of the Church. And uh, taking this forward, we as a team of people involving architects, a priest, um, uh, people involved in heritage conservation, and uh, people involved in kind of restoration of various objects, uh, got together as a group. And uh, we kind of, um, uh, we kind of formed the uh, body which is called the Committee for the Preservation and Promotion of the Historic and uh, Artistic Pat Patrimony of the Church. And uh, one of the, and the five kind of points which we looked at is um, we thought that it's important to educate the clergy. Uh, we need uh, to kind of inform the people how to kind of uh, obtain permissions for a heritage church. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of adaptive reuse of space because of the migrating of population from South Mumbai to North. Um, we go on uh, documenting churches and uh, it's important that we also um, educate the people about preservation of records, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so after several discussions, we actually thought that we actually have to have twofold approach. One is advocacy uh, and manifestation. Uh, so when we talk about advocacy, we talk about conducting seminars, visiting heritage churches and uh, uh, presentations at the museum. And uh, of course, uh, when we talk about the uh, manifestation, we kind of uh, give the people, the parishioners and the parish priest uh, who heads, uh, who is the head of the church at that point of time, a way to go forward in terms of conservation. And of course, we do a lot of exhibitions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, so what, what we see is that um, there's an urgent need uh, and strategy and a guidelines uh, and an action plan for restoration, extension to churches. The extension usually happens in, in, uh, um, in uh, uh, Salsit Island, which is north of Mumbai, and uh, uh, possibilities of adaptive reuse in South Mumbai. And, uh, uh, through the structured action plan, we actually talk about, we kind of use the principles um, of the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings, which uh, talk about the uh, um, uh, churches of heritage value in Mumbai, uh, need to have an action plan to skillfully repair or any uh, strategy for restoration. Uh, we, we kind of uh, inform people that experimentations in old buildings is not in place. And uh, this is an image of uh, St. John's at Thane, where there were glass uh, blocks used in the historic church. Of course, now it's restored and it's, uh, it's got back its old glory. Uh, we talk about um, uh, the work which has to be undertaken has to be in uh, cognizance of the existing heritage structure. And as professionals, we, we, uh, we have to look at what damage would happen later on. Uh, the extensions which are provided should complement uh, the, the building, especially if you look at this building, the extension actually touches the old heritage church smack on without understanding any details, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which is required. Uh, the maintenance, if it's carried out, um, can actually resolve most issues. Um, uh, the buildings have to be studied before uh, um, any kind of work is undertaken, usually people just uh, restore, uh, restore the buildings or repair the buildings based on some advice given by a local contractor. Um, and the work is uh, focused, most of the work is focused on achieving a good looking interior and exterior. 
so they don't do not understand the the, the life of the material which is there etc and it it uh, leads to kind of interiors which are completely uh, um, uh, wet because of the leaking roof but the solution which is thought about is to put uh, ceramic tiles on the wall and um, uh, this is um, one of the things that um, uh, most of these churches in South Mumbai, which is in Girgaon, St. John's, uh, the recent Christ Church, where the population has moved up, uh, actually uh, do not have too much of people visiting the church and finances to look after them. And uh, these are some images of the Gloria Church when we visited um, on our several, several visits to the churches, in, uh, to all these churches in the area. And uh, uh, we, we do not see that the old and the new are kind of um, uh, interface with each other. So we see that there's no attention to detail. And when you come into the, the details of, of the altars, et cetera, et cetera, no documentation is undertaken. And uh, we are actually showing that what can be done as an interesting way in which you document so that you preserve the old. Besides this, while visiting various churches, uh, which was, we used to do over the last uh, few years, uh, we realized that many of the artifacts, which are of immense value, were just locked up and stored in godowns, and very often they were discarded and thrown away. And uh, what we began doing is um, we, we kind of started collecting it, and I'll show you what we have kind of initiated. And um, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, mo most of the people do not understand the value of heritage, and they talk about uh, they talk about a spankling new interior with new materials. Okay, uh, but um, uh, based on this, uh, I mean the issue is that we have to understand the various uh, ways in which we go about, and. Uh, uh, yeah, um, so we, we understood that basically this is based on some internationally accepted principles. However, we need to revise these principles by uh, because of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we talked about an action plan to help mitigate the damage of our heritage. Uh, we also talk about the appreciation of heritage uh, to help conserve the legacy that we have inherited. But two aspects which we need to look at is the whole oral history that needs to be archived, which was going to be lost, and the intangible social and cultural aspects that need to be documented. And uh, now I get into the aspect of advocacy. So what we do as a program is that we have seminars. This is Vikas actually uh, talking about what conservation means. Uh, we invited Anupam Saar to kind of uh, deliver a lecture on how do you kind of restore uh, a material, simple ways in which you kind of re restore and preserve fabric, uh, uh, steel, uh, silver, et cetera, et cetera. And we had uh, Swati Chandarkar, um, a stained glass expert, who actually conducted site visits for the people so that you uh, they understand the value of the stained glass, uh, which is available to us. Um, but when we come to the core of this presentation, we talk about the voices of uh, at the grassroots. And here uh, we become, uh, we have become uh, very um, kind of important players in this because we actually take trips to various churches and we just ask the people to show us their go downs. And uh, uh, you can see David, Fleur, myself, Mr. and Mrs. Murthy, and Father Warner must be clicking these photographs, but yeah. But what we found astounding is that these documents and manuscripts, uh, which belong to 1888, were lying in sacks in the rain. And that's when we picked it up and, and the authorities were very happy to give it to us. You all take it and do whatever you all want with it. And over a period of time, we began collecting a lot of this. But while doing this, we also had a kind of a checklist and, and what the people need to do when they actually talk about conservation. So we, we kind of told them the processes, 
that they need to kind of this, the statutory authorities that they need to kind of meet. We also kind of did our own pro bono work where we actually document churches and we give them suggestions of how it can be done if they do not have the finances. And the interventions is an important phase because we realized that we got so many artifacts and we now we don't know what to do with it. So what we, um, we, we just collected it and we spoke to the authorities and the authority says, yes, we'll give you a go down to store it. And um, we said, no, uh, we want to actually make use of these, uh, these uh, artifacts to kind of educate the people. And um, uh, this is Cardinal Oswald Gracious, who's actually taking a view of the artifacts which were not yet restored, just collected. And uh, then he, uh, he was very pleased with what we have. And he then assigned us a space to design a museum. And this museum, uh, which was set up approximately about uh, 10 years ago, um, uh, is designed and has become a very important kind of gem in the Archdiocese of Mumbai. Uh, so you can see the design uh, which, uh, which I've kind of undertaken is uh, basically borrowing some of the ideas of history where this is the Arambol, which is, uh, which is the door. Uh, you see these traditional doors which have this kind of wooden stay across. So we kind of use it. Uh, and these are the inside of the museum where we actually display the objects in such a way that uh, knowing the population and knowing the, uh, yeah, the, the idea of a museum that it can become a boring space, we kind of gave this idea where you actually interact with the objects uh, and they, they give you a sense of interest in what it is about. Um, so these are the, this is the main space and believe me, it's a very, very tiny museum compared to any other world museums, etc. Um, uh, but uh, these artifacts collected, we did a great timeline. I mean, I would say that this is a collaboration. This timeline is a collaboration with various people providing history, et cetera, et cetera. And we did a comparative analysis, uh, a comparative uh, documentation where we show what happens internationally and we show how old the churches are. And when the people visit the museum, they realize that, oh, some of their churches were older than the Taj Mahal. And that's when they realize what's happening. And we've interfaced this timeline with artifacts within it. So while you're walking around, suddenly you encounter this old laser cut drawing of, of the uh, Salvation Church, uh, which, is, um, which is now demolished and Korea's building is in place. And um, as you go along, you see this artifact of the body of Christ, which was burnt on one kind of occasion. So a lot of material is there, fabric, paintings. And one of the, uh, at the midway of this journey through the museum, you have an amphitheater, uh, which kind of becomes a space to educate. So that's what happens on a regular basis, where people from different kind of walks of life, different age groups come in, uh, where, where they are educated. Uh, it's a group of about 30 or 40 people that can accommodate it, but that's what happens. And then you journey back. But as I said before, it is not, not only become, uh, it has become um, a place for not only the religious, but also for lay people. Uh, who visit the museum and ap appreciate the effect. Um, it has, uh, so when we, one comes to writing, it is not enough just to kind of do, there are various modes in, uh, modes in which you can actually write. Uh, so this is an article um, in a magazine, uh, Indian Architect and Builder, which actually talks about uh, the museum design. Uh, so we have used various kind of formats to kind of uh, educate the people and push this out to people. Uh, another important thing is that this little museum somewhere in Goregao actually uh, gets, gets, um, gets uh, some of the objects actually uh, taken to uh, South Australia, Adelaide, and uh, to Western Australia in Perth, where James Bennett uh, and Russell Kelty uh, historians uh, kind of did, uh, kind of put together 
and curate an exhibition called uh, Treasure Ships, a Art in the Age of Spices. And uh, it basically talks about uh, the kind of artifacts which were produced during the Portuguese and the Dutch kind of col uh, colonization in these areas. And uh, these are the objects which are there, you can recognize them. And along with that, we have smaller exhibitions, okay? And with these exhibitions, we bring out these catalogs, uh, which people are handed out. So, I mean, the writing is not only academic writing in some sense, it's also taking these various forms which happen. And uh, we have another exhibition uh, where we actually move objects from the museum out into the public realm so people can encounter it. And these are some images of that. Um, and once again, we bring out a writing this. And along with that, because of this, we have a lot of kind of initiative which talks about, um, uh, talks about uh, preserving and conserving our buildings. So that's the Arch, uh, Archbishop House in Colaba. Um, then the Gloria Church, which is uh, then kind of taken up for conservation. And uh, because of this, you get after six years of work, which uh, we work on, uh, David uh, Cardoz and myself work on, we get the Asia Pacific Award for Merit. And one of the things to kind of get the award for mer merit is to send a dossier of the work which has, be which has been undertaken. And then we use this material to actually produce a book, okay? Which is in hard copy format and then given out to the parishioners. I think we printed about 100 copies. Uh, so we didn't really go into this ISNB kind of marking, etc. It's just a book to kind of document, preserve, and people will know about what has been undertaken and various other heritage conservation projects. In this project, you see that this is an extension where the old facade is broken. This, in, this is in uh, St. Anthony's Church uh, uh, Maloney. And, uh, the kind of work which is there. And after 10 years of work, we actually come out with a coffee table book on the kind of artifacts within the, um, within the museum. Besides that, we have smaller kind of publications. Um, Anupam Saag uh, helped us with, uh, with, the, uh, with the restoration of this painting by uh, Gladstone Solomon. And we actually brought out a book on the kind of, um, on the kind of process which is there. And uh, it's very important to write about the various milestones through pamphlets, souvenirs, booklets, uh, as it becomes a way to archive. I mean, when I was doing my research on the Church of Goa, I realized that the souvenirs which are published, besides having all the ads and praising various people, it had a lot of information about the history of the church. But unfortunately, in today's day and age, we talk about the digital world, we talk about we talk about paperless kind of uh, things. So very few of us are actually writing about things, uh, which is a pity because very often it can all be lost. So in conclusion, um, the, the 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 committee for the preservation and promotion of the historical patrimony of the church has done significant work to preserve and promote various things. Um, the uh, Archdiocesan Museum is continuously up to updating itself, but one of the important things which we need to uh, kind of focus on is the intangible aspects that need to be documented and updated. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for taking us through the sensitive manner in which this entire uh, conservation effort by you, your team and the entire community has been taken up and we thank you for letting us also have a have a peek into this entire thing thank you uh, we now move on to our third panelist for the session dr simon patel she is a noted historian who did her phd from balliol college oxford university and her dissertation focused on the ways the parsi community of bombay modernized in the 19th century she is also known as Miss Bombaywala and is the founder of Bombaywala Historical Works, an organization that showcases Bombay's built environment and social history. Simon's forthcoming book on Irani restaurants drive, dives into the world of Irani strongmen and dons and the cafes that they operated for. Uh, she has received a New India Foundation Fellowship as well to complete the book. 
Her presentation, which was titled as Stories of City Structures, uh, shares the processes, negotiations, and thrills behind the creation of this uh, Bombaywala's Stories on City Structures. We request Dr. Simin Patel to begin with her presentation. Over to you, Ms. Um, firstly, thank you. Thank you so much for including Bombaywala's work in this symposium. Um, it, is, uh, it is a great honor and I'm in wonderful company and I think um, Anupam and Anstey are, you know, saving things. We, we can't save things. We just story tell and we document and then these things go away. And once we get to Bombaywala, the website, I'll show you how that's happening just last week. Um, that everything we kind of story tell eventually goes away. <laughs> so my father says that, you know, you're like this panoti, you go to some place and then in a couple of months it's gone. Uh, but really that is our story. So it's nice to come after two people who can really save things. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so when I started Bombaywala as a blog nine years ago, uh, our tagline was knowing city structures. Um, I was sitting in the UK doing my PhD, but I was finding this really interesting information on Bombay that I wanted to share uh, with a larger audience. So with me sitting in the UK and my friends from Xavier's in Bombay, my undergraduate friends from Malhar Festival, uh, we started Bombaywala in two continents um, and have been running it. Um, I, um, we started it on Navro's Day, which is 21st March uh, 2013. And over the years, it went on. It was like a cool but kind of conventional blog that really kind of needed a revamp. Um, and then, sorry, this is like some personal history, but um, I had this little lockdown meltdown. And the result of the lockdown meltdown was that I completely rethought Bombaywala. And the way that you see it today is a lockdown baby. It's an absolute product of lockdown. And um, what is interesting is that I think eventually this will be a lockdown archive. It will be about Bombay in COVID times. And I think Minas mentioned how the exhibition on the Bishtis is about Bishtis in lockdown. Um, recently also there is a wonderful movie uh, called If Memory Serves Me Right on film critic Rashid Irani who passed away um, last year. It is a story about a film critic and the owner of a once, uh, once the owner of an Irani restaurant and it is about this single man who couldn't really manage in lockdown. So uh, I know we're talking about archives and we're talking about stories, but it's nice to know more and more as we, as we speak to other people and see other people's work, that we will have a decent lockdown COVID archive of Bombay in the, times of, in, in the time of, of lockdown. Um, yes, so this, this brings me to the question of an archive. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, obviously the archive was a print archive. I was sitting at the Maharashtra State Archives at Elphinstone College for one year, going through uh, the Times of India, the Bombay Gazette. I was trying to look at um, different things in the newspaper. So I was looking at things like advertisements, notices, less conventional stuff. But at the end of the day, I was looking at a print, uh, a written archive. Um, for various reasons, I didn't join academia after my PhD, and uh, I got to work on this book on the Irani restaurants of Bombay. And that's, you know, when my archive totally changed into this very rich oral archive. Um, and I spent hours and hours and years and years with second generation Irani restaurant owners documenting their stories. These stories are not available anywhere else um, because, you know, there's very little information on Irani restaurants in the papers. At Max, you'll find some advertisements or you'll find some, you know, court cases. So what I realized was the value of an oral archive because it is an archive that no one else can also have in many senses. Um, and so uh, at Bombaywala and in my work now, what I'm doing is working with a very rich oral archive or an oral archive, the archive of the built environment. So each shop that we cover is an archive. Each calendar, each clock tells us, tells us a story. Um, each, you know, bald fan or takla fan, as you say, everything in that establishment is telling us something. Um, and that is our built archive. And then there is obviously still the written archive, which we haven't completely given up on. And when we get access to the Times of India through ProQuest, 
which has become this whole issue for people who are not affiliated to a top or foreign academic institution. We lose access to ProQuest, which is where the Times of India archive is basically catalogued and so easy to, you know, just type in what you want and you'll find a, a hundred things on it. Many, uh, many of us after our PhD lost access to ProQuest and then we would ask other academics in abroad to give us their passwords. Um, now we don't even have that. So um, it would mean going to the dusty archives at, uh, at Elphinstone College and spending half our life over there to get one kind of little thing of consequence. So um, there are also practical reasons why we are making the, um, we are using these different archives and not just the print archive. It's just because sometimes we don't have access to it. Um, I just a few pointers that I would kind of like to share with the students about writing um, and about language. Language is very important and when you interview, you pick up on the language of your subjects and that language is beautiful. Um, with all these shops and establishments, I know people say chawl system. They never say chawl or, you know, chawl buildings or something. It's always chawl system, you know. And so then I try to use chawl system in my language. And, you know, there are many people who say old structures. This old building has gone and you work on old things on Bombay. There's really unhelpful ways of thinking about, you know, your work in the city. I would use original, say the original structure, the original building. Stop using words like old. Um, even heritage, we can do away with a little bit, talk about the built environment, talk about historical structures. Anupam mentioned historical interiors. These are more interesting ways of talking about things. Um, and uh, again, when I say original, I'm again using the language of Irani restaurants. If you had two Irani restaurants in the city, both called Persian Bakery, one would be original Persian Bakery, which was at Grant Road, and the other one would be new Persian Bakery, which was in Dadar. So what I'm, so this is a nice way, original and new, to talk about two com sort of competing establishments in the city. So use original instead of old, use terms like new, um, you know, it, it's being true to the city and you're not being old and fuddy-duddy and, you know, things like that. Um, Okay, so the other thing about the, the Irani restaurants and about writing is that these were my best subjects. So they were my first subjects that I, you know, started to talk to in about 2015, 16, right after my PhD, and they have really been my best subjects. These are um, the second generation Irani owners, so basically um, upper middle class, middle class college going boys whose fathers had migrated from Iran in very, very harsh circumstances. So the father's journeys were very different, a rags to riches if there ever was a story of men walking from Iran come, uh, in harsh circumstances coming to Bombay and building huge Irani restaurant building um, businesses, 14 shops per Per, uh, per person, that uh, per subject of mine. So that's huge. The, their sons are, you know, not privileged, but are, were better off. And these guys, you know, they just wanted to talk to me about bikes and chicks and, um, you know, physical culture, all their gymming, weightlifting, bodybuilding, Mr. Bombay championships. No one was talking to me about food. Everyone was 75 plus. And, um, and what they really wanted to tell me was about their early years, where they were basically dons of the neighborhoods that they operated from. So now when you look at Irani restaurants, you think they're these kind of relics and all the owners are much older and slower and things like that. But no, these guys were the bosses of the areas they were from. Grant Road, Dobi Talao, they were ruling these places, Bori Bandar. And for me, the way I've written the book, and I hope to share, you know, the, when the book is out, share it with you all, um, is really getting their language, which is about daring and which is about power and control and how I wanted to write like these guys. And so that's, that, that, that's at the level of my book. And at Bombay Wala, what I try to do is write like my subjects. So the language that I use is their language. And sometimes it's simplified and the storytelling is simple. I mean, 
you can go into it and then find complex things about gender and spatial dynamics and all that. But the question is that I don't want to write like that anymore. The problem with academia is you have to write in this very dry way. And you know, my supervisor used to say, Simin, this is a very stylish magazine piece you've written like that. And But academia didn't want that. And now I don't want to write in that stylish magazine piece way either. I just want to write in a way that gets the rhythms and languages of the of my subjects. Um, so, um, yeah, another another point I sort of want to mention to the students is that Bombay history has become real. In the last, say, seven years or so, Bombay history is now a little industry. It's a small industry in which you can make a little money and actually survive, and this can be your sole source of income. Um, this has also meant, obviously, that there are. it is much more competitive. There are 10 organizations, at least, who are trying to document the city, who are doing walks in the city. Um, and so now you're competing. You're competing with organizations like yours. You're competing with news publications. Bombay has become big news. And, um, you know, dailies, digital, print are all covering Bombay in interesting ways. So you are now competing with 10 better funded, larger institutions. How do you make your mark? And this is a sign that, that Bombay has become an industry. It's professional, and you can't just go around clicking photos of the city, putting them up, and think you're some Bombay historian. You need to have a story that nobody else can have. And um, what are the ways to do that? Um, so I'll just um, share Bombay Wala screen with you all. Um, OK, are we seeing things? Are we? Uh, yes. Yeah? yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So this is this uh, this is Bombay Wala. It's a lockdown baby, uh, and looks like this since about a year and a half. Um, and this banner, the top banner you you see here, is always the first post. Uh, we try to cover one establishment per month, um, and I'll just show you what happened to laundry uh, central laundry, which is why I say we can't save things. Um, we also do a small video, a little movie, it's called a short short because it's so short, um, on each establishment. So when we cover an establishment, we do one post and one little movie um, on the establishment. So we've covered it in a good way and we have that archive with us. One point Bombay Wala used to do, we used to do walks in the city. This is our little cat corner. So we always trying to find an establishment which has a little cat and we'll put it over here in this little box. Um, so the next time we change it, it has to be with a photo of a cat. Um, cruise music class, which is a wonderful little music, evening music class at Dobi Talao. Puttu and Sons Washing Company, which we'll get to. And the main thing, which is really the establishment's page. So this is how let me just. So this is how it's done. Um, we focus on one establishment which belongs to one of these categories. The latest one we did was the central laundry, which belongs to the category of washing company. And now we have three washing companies. Um, Puttu and Sons at Gamdevi, Star Cleaning and Dyeing Works, and the Central Laundry at Girgaon. So what I was telling you all about kind of being on top of your game is that um, a shop like Umrigar Stores, these are masala makers, um, a legacy brand which has a wonderful stall in Fort Market. And the thing about this is that stall is really not functional. So what we had to do is do a staged photo shoot of Umrigar's stores, convince the family to come to the store, let us shoot over there, um, and it's processing, right? You all can see, um, yeah, okay. Yes. And this is, this is the result. Now, this is not regularly possible to go and shoot um, this family at the store. Half the store is now at their home. So we then went to their house, which is at Bora Bazaar Street, very close to Fort Market, and shot over there. This was the founder of the masala um, making uh, shop, and this is his wife. Um, and the owner, they were masala makers by week, but by weekend he became a well keeper. 
So all the wells around Bombay, this man uh, would go and restore and clean and look after, and that was his weekend activity, and he did it till, about, you know, I think till his late 70s. So they are masala makers by week, well keepers by night, um, and they have this wonderful store, which is really not in use that much in Fort Market because they feel, you know, customers don't like to come to this shabby market. They rather come to their home. And I was like, no, no, this is this is where the action is. This stall is lovely. But, you know, so it's a bit of a process. Um, and then another very kind of touching post was this central shorthand and typing institute. So in this day and age of computers and laptops and Zoom calls, there is still a central shorthand and typing institute functioning in Bombay um, and run by a lovely lady called Mrs. Balsara. Um, now Mrs. Balsara stays very close to the actual institute and she is now has been since COVID operating from home. And I stay very close to the institute, so every time I go past it, I look. And even now, um, it hasn't opened. So my sense is that it's probably not going to open again, and it wasn't open when we shot either. But what we did was convince Mrs. Balsara to open the institute for us to do a shoot. Um, so first we start with her, you know, kind of hidden over here, half the front area is for the shorthand, the back area is for the typing, we see, you know, here we have parts of her body, half her body, her hands, her hands again on the Godrich typewriter, which she, which she says are the, the, the most sturdiest typewriters. And then that's a lovely portrait of her. Um, and um, she, she has these wonderful quotes that she inspires her students and their parents with. It's also a love story. She joined this institute as the principal uh, as a student fell in love with the principal the principal then became the principal of the government law college and mrs balsara took over as the principal of the shorthand institute so a story of two principals falling in love and you know all the rest it's not easy to figure out through the text but again it's pretty layered and you have to kind of really look in and kind of figure what I'm saying, and that's not always easy. Um, this is the view of the Institute from a taxi. This is also how I um, sort of look at the Institute and see if it's open or closed. I work with a photographer, Philippe Kalia, who's based in Bangalore now. Um, I kind of collect all the institutions, wait for Philippe to come, and then we go and Philippe shoots all these different um, different places. Again, here, this is your typing uh, typing section. And uh, if, you, if you want to do shorthand, you have to do typing. If you, if you only do typing, you only want typing, you don't have to do shorthand. And then again, this is her, you know, uh, little teacher's day cards and then, you know, her leaving the premises. But again, I don't know if this institute will happen and I don't know if a shoot like this would be possible again. Uh, and in a mean kind of way, it's like, oh yeah, Bombay well, I got this story, but um, th that's thinking competitively and thinking like this is a business and there are 10 other people who can do this. Um, so that's that. And I just, uh, how much time, would, uh, am I okay on time or? Uh... Yes, uh, yes, I mean, you are okay on time. Okay, yes. so I sure. wanted to kind of uh, end with the case of the central laundry. Um, sure, sure. Laundry in Girgaon um, and in Kandewadi, which is, you know, the bhaji, bhaji market area of Girgaon opposite Gaiwadi. And my friends at this Irani restaurant, they were like, oh, you know, Kandewadi is much cheaper than our bhaji gali at Nana Chok, so go and check it out. So I go walking, checking out um, Kandewadi and, you know, 10 in the morning, who do I see? I see this lady, uh, uh, Shubhangi Dinana Joshi, sitting at... Uh, the counter of Central Laundry, uh, her husband Dinanath wasn't there then, and I say, okay, this is it, woman at the counter, alone, heading an establishment, and that's my, that's my deal. I go roaming around the city, either walking or in a taxi, and I look for establishments which are run by women, uh, because it's still so rare and their public roles are, are you know, they, usually you can't be in the shop. So it was a lovely, it was a lovely premises and it was a woman helming it. And I said, oh my God, this is it. And so then I did the story, waited for Philippe to come. We went, we shot. Um, and then here, here again, the, the, the 
uh, laundry was founded by her father-in-law. Uh, the clock, calendar, these are perfect markers of historic establishments in the city. Sunday closed. That's her husband, Dina Nath, the old way of, you know, kind of, I shouldn't say old, but, you know, original way of wrapping the, the clothes. And this is it. This is really wonderful example of Girgaon, middle class, Bombay life. Um, and the, it's established in 39. Um, and it's in the heart of this bhaji market. Right across are all these wadis and chawl systems that are being demolished for um, new developments. So here is an, a, a former customer who used to stay across. He was a tenant. He stayed in Dada Maharaj Wadi. Now Dada, is, it will become, he will return um, as an owner of the flat and uh, the building will now be called Dada Maharaj Heights. And this is the story for the whole of Girgaon. Every chawl is going and towers are coming up. And as a result, these towers have apartments, the apartments have washing machines. So the business of this laundry is basically going down. And you know, um, here they here specialist in terracott and silk, the central laundry specialist. Um, this was the ironing man from UP uh, who was with them for 25 years. And again, calendars, calendars and clocks you'll see in all these historical establishments. They're like key, key to the to the fabric of the place. Um, and then we made a small little one minute movie on the on the uh, on the shop now okay just one second um, okay oh, yeah sorry give me a second Okay, and then last week I was doing an interview at the at a at a at a gym called the Famous Physical Culture Home in Girgaon, and I was talking to the master of the gym, and he said, "Oh, I stay at Kandewadi," and I said, "Oh, we've covered the Central Laundry at which is at Kandewadi," and he said, "Ah, you know what's happened? Uh, it's completely changed." And I said, "What?" And then we had this little full saga at the gym, and then Philippe and I went walking to find the new Central Laundry. And um, can you all see this new, uh, yeah. So basically this is what happened. You know, this lady in lockdown, she was telling me ki, you know, everyone wants a fancy laundry, sabko fancy laundry chahiye, hamari purani laundry nahi chalti hai and stuff like that. And basically a couple of months ago, they got a new management and this is the way the, the laundry has been, um, modernized there's absolutely no need for any of this only the ironing room technically could have been changed and and uh, steam technology could have been introduced there but instead um, they go and do this and and this this establishment is lost and okay that's me um, here I'm interviewing um, Mrs. Shubangi, and this is the new the new management, and he's totally brazen, you know. He said, I took over on the condition that first thing that they would do is change the whole premises or new look chahiye, and that kind of a thing. And and that's that's how it is. And what is lost is the interaction between the shop and the street. And this was this was very important. Look at how these collapsible doors are actually advertising boards for the laundry. Collapsible doors, they open up onto the street and they become posters for the establishment. And look at this guy here, he's gory, he's the vegetable seller outside, and he used to kind of get on the shop's uh, platform to kind of, you know, uh, for a little shelter and, you know, feeling, homely feeling or whatever. Um, and this, this, economy of the street is lost is what architectural historian Swati Ch Chaturbhatiai says that in middle class neighborhoods in Calcutta they were designed to engage with the street and the para, your para, your neighborhood was very important. Um, these were urban forms of togetherness where everybody could gather and now Gauri is not to be seen. This is the new setup. 
the ironing man had to leave because he couldn't um, could, couldn't fathom the new technology. And this is what we have. So it's a way of life that has gone. Um, and yeah, this is really what we, we try to document. So um, sorry, I don't know if I've run over, but. Uh, Not at all. Yeah, so. Do we have a minute or is that, uh, is it difficult? I can... uh, I'm sh it, it, sure, sure, Simi. Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, I'm totally over. I just wanted to share a small one minute movie we made on the. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay. Uh, so this is the little movie that we made on the Central Shorthand and Typing Institute. I hope the sound is clear. Which is Latin. Yes. Celery et accurata manu means, uh, celery means speedy and accurata means accurate. Hence. Thank you so much, Dr. Simi. That was that was profound. That was it was absolutely an enthralling, mesmerizing conversation and the journey that you took us um, through. Those stories, um, unbelievable. I'm sure many of us resonated with the typing class, brought back memories uh, when we attended, and you talked about the para in Calcutta, yeah. which is, I am afraid, losing out to the large gated um, housing developments that are being built. So the interaction that one could have with neighbors, just if you get down the steps and um, the Pada Pujo, the Durga Puja, that is all giving way to now those large gated communities, which may have its own advantages. But yes, um, uh, possibly many of us didn't look at it like the way you did. and. I'm sure many of us will now have a completely new way of looking at um, those uh, places, those stores, and maybe have stories to contribute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was indeed an insightful set of presentations. I'm sure it got everyone thinking. Now, um, the audience can send their questions in the Q&A box as the moderators take the discussion forward. Yeah, um, it was. it's an absolute honor to have Anupam Sa and Slay Lewis and Simin together on the same platform. We're really privileged to have you all together. and. Um, when we all listened um, to what um, you said about material writing, about um, restoration, and about the stories, um, I'm sure many of us who are present here, I'm sure that we would like to know that when we do speak of heritage, when we do speak of conservation, um, 
sometimes for many of us they're simply used as synonyms but we know that they actually are not um we do have a rather debatable or debated question um should heritage be conserved for its historical relevance or should it be adapted for reuse in present circumstances how do you feel about this we talked about um anupam sa saying that you should know you know the composition of what you've created so you know how it must be um sort of kept um um ansley lewis who talked about um um places uh, artifacts with which uh, through which you wanted to educate and and simin when you talked about stories that you want to reach out to people how where do you think all this would converge um any thoughts anupam would you like to start yeah with? yeah where uh, you know there is a there is a verse in the panchatantra you know there's a verse in the panchatantra where all this will converge i'll just show it to you quickly 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 see look at this in case of force of book or sword a woman man or loot or word the use or uselessness depends on qualities the user lends when ainsley lewis took up those objects that were just lying around in different churches and different altars and different places father warner came together they said let's do something with them they've created a gem of a museum from nothing what they did with it one is an architect one is a clergyman and there are the faithful the flock is there the parish is there and all of us are delighted by it you know one of the biggest uh, and most respected agencies for scholarships called the inlax foundation uh, i just got a call from them i want to see that museum that gem of a museum that you were everybody is talking about the museum it came from nothing what they did with it what did simon do with some stories which were never there until she told them these were the forgotten things so i think about conserving anything is about the significance you place for it an old person is a useless person there's really no value that they bring to the house they don't earn any money they don't help you pay the rent it's a pain but you'll do anything for your grandmother anything because there is a significance attached to it so i think talking about conservation does not happen unless you put a significance on things and that is your call is the significance of the faithful it is the significance of someone who is using it as a livelihood it is the significance you can place of history it's the significance of just a memory or until until the significance of things is understood by us as children and as adolescents and as elders until then there's no need of keeping anything or preserving anything हम तो घर से कार्डबोर्ड के बॉक्सेस भी नहीं फेंकते हैं इट्स नॉट डिफिकल्ट टू थ्रो बॉक्स बिकॉज यू फाइंड द सिग्निफिकेंस इन इट आई कैन कीप सम बुक्स इन इट आई कैन कीप सम पेपर्स इन इट व्हेन आई शिफ्ट माय आर्काइव फ्रॉम दिस प्लेस टू दैट प्लेस आई विल नीड दैट बॉक्स सिमन हैज प्लेस्ड द सिग्निफिकेंस टू दैट बॉक्स बिकॉज शी वांट्स टू कैरी हर मटेरियल फ्रॉम वन ऑफिस टू अनदर ऑफिस एंड देन गेट अनुपम टू स्टोर इट फॉर अस अरे पहले तो डालडे के डब्बे भी नहीं फेंकते थे उसमें गमले में plant to go everything at significance bilkul i think to your question about you know whether should we conserve or should we not conserve it's entirely about what significance we are able to think of and the significance sometimes you have to be initiated into it to be able to recognize the significance of things and about the significance i'll take one one minute ainsley before is about this writing of heritage one thing that india is missing out completely completely i'm talking about my own profession let's say about art conservation everybody is using technical terms from the world which is great the mind is so beautiful indians are privileged to be able to read and learn so many languages and be comfortable with them but at the expense of your traditional vernacular terms and 
as some other speakers also mentioned, language is a subtle but very powerful medium to impact change. Jab aap apne basic language shabd agar aap use nahi karte ho, to wo cheez ka essence kho jata hai. You write, you say that in English, you say that in Latin, you say, you will understand it. But what the Italian is understood with that Italian word is not what I am understanding. Please write your traditional vernacular terms. Gum Arabica, gum Arabica, gum Arabica. Koi kahi per koit ka otta gum hai, kahi per si kikar ke ped ka hai, kahi per babul ka hai. It has completely different connotations. Gum Arabic is a generic term everybody uses. Fresco, ajanta frescoes. Perpetuation of wrong information because students don't question their teachers. Check out everything that we are telling you. We are quite bounders ourselves. You should be surprised. Whenever we are saying something, just check it out because otherwise, until the next generation, that a brunch, that corruption of the, it will keep getting perpetuated. So I think you must, as students, as practitioners, we must start understanding. We, I was talking about the trees. You're calling it ficus religiosa is okay. Or oh, Alistonia scolaris is okay. But what about the traditional term? Because it carries with it vernacular knowledges, indigenous systems, your line plasters. There's so many things. And the other thing is about the... I'm digressing from what your question that was over. Uh, just about the writing part of it, we are afraid of writing. When we were students, we didn't have to say writing. It was a, we were really, Simon talked about, you know, the way to write. And then once you have the structure, because Simon knew the structure of writing, the discipline of it, she can now have the privilege and the luxury of being able to go and do it her way, like a bird on the wing. You know, and she can express it her way now, but she has the structure in her mind. We don't write or report our work because we are afraid of peers. Um, we always feel inadequate. It's not complete. People will criticize me. What will they think about me? I think we should be fearless. Gandhi ji ne bhi bola tha. Be truthful, gentle and fearless. I think these three are fantastic things. And in writing also, do write. As students, just start writing. In it. And of course, you can't write until, uh, until you do practicals. Huh? Because interestingly, nobody writes theory without the practicals. You always do practicals first, then you write. Can the principal of Rizvi College write about running an institution without having done it first? Similarly, for all of you st students or practitioners, do the work with your hands first. Make your plasters, plaster the wall first before you talk about making architectural drawings of buildings. Mystery ki tarah kaam karo, chheni chalao, hai na? Kasle mein masala lapeto to, phir jaake, then you can, you know, make your drawings. <laughs> That's true. That's so enlightening. And see, what would I, you like to say? I to think that? I think to add to what Anupam is saying is definitely the significance of a building is very important. I mean, you need to understand it, and that's why you give value to it. Uh, he took a great example of the grandmother who you look after, provides wisdom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, though she does not uh, earn, but also you must be able to hear the voices at the grassroots. Okay. Very often, uh, we as architects or uh, various professionals come in with that heavy hand that this is how it should be done and this is how we need to go forward. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And unfortunately, in today's day and age where we, are, we want instant tea and instant coffee, we do not have the time to kind of sit and work on a project to make it happen and convince people so that they feel that you, they, you are part of them and you know uh, whatever is happening. Uh, I think a great thing which uh, Simon brought to the table is about writing and uh, very often, uh, you know, and the fright to write, as, as Anupam kind of mentioned in all of us, I mean, when we started off with it, is that uh, we are too uh, 
afraid of getting it right and getting it right academically. And I like what Simon said that she was actually right at the uh, academic uh, academic kind of guide said that basically it's magazine kind of a thing. But I think the more you practice, the better you get at it. So maybe you can start off with a diary, a blog, but and it's very important that you actually put it down on paper because very often the digital world sometimes fails us with newer technology. And even a simple souvenir or a pamphlet of what you've done or what you've seen, or and you then archive it well, you will have it for life and 30 years down the line, you can actually refer to it and say, yes, I worked on this. I think uh, that that should be the way forward, yeah? Yes. Yes, Simin, what would you like to say to that? Just actually that I'm sitting in a former prayer room of a home um, which has been converted into a studio and I don't know if you can see the, 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 the flooring and that unit in the wall which is a tankabadi, an old school kind of wall, uh, cupboard which is within the wall and um, it's kind of made this into a new studio space but it was a 120 year old over 120 year old um, prayer room so um, which had you know uh, a much rougher flooring which we then just polished down um, and now this is my little pad um, but um, and it's a restoration and a renovation of a space which I think is now quite new um, but uh, so I, I see myself being able to also implement this but only at a personal level and really at that central laundry example, all that needed to go if they had to was change the back side of the shop where the ironing unit is. If you want break that divider, don't have that divider and do your steam unit there. Everything else was fine. They could have put shelves in the, in the cabinets, in the showcases and kept all their stuff over there. There was no need. Um, this is a practical thing. There are interesting pan shops that I see, historic pan shops in the city which have you know Gandhi and Nehru all painted in their glass panels and they've put some shelves they're not great um, glass shelves over there but at the end of the day the panels still are still there so you do a shoddy job but don't completely change everything you know shoddy job is better than uh, I know Anupam said what is it how to destroy a building quickly in Mumbai by well-meaning efforts there are no, um, that I think comes in, in your domains. In the sort of stuff I cover, there is nothing well-meaning. Um, there is no pointing or whatever you all were talking about. It's complete change and complete change signifies uh, modernity, technology, good laundry, <laughs> you know. So uh, I think we're dealing with uh, different subjects and I don't have the patience that they have to work with communities. I am struggling to find a place, interview, wait for photographer, publish before it's gone. So my timelines are crazy and it's kind of st stressful for me. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's how. Yes. Um, I we, we absolutely agree. So um, Anupam, you talked about um, um, knowing the indigenous word, the original name of the tree or um, the, um, you know uh, things around you. Actually, maybe that's also because many of us don't know uh, because we rely so much on the internet, which has its of cost, uh, of course, its boon. But a lot of it is so dominated by a certain type of a vocabulary that sometimes um, we kind of get lost into that or, or sort of um, just know that bit. And um, so, so the original or the indigenous is sometimes not quite um, there. And yes, Simin, absolutely what you said about the central laundry. Uh, imagine giving away the Burmese tea cabinets or something like that, that would be, um, um, that would be, a, that's, that's an absolute shame. Yeah. So where, um, where do you think, um, for the, for all the three of you, where, where do you think there could be a converging point? Can there be a converging point? If yes, where, if, if all the three of you were to kind of come together and 
yeah. converging point of what converging point of your work like um you 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 and like anupam you and ensley have worked together and i think so so here if can or can all the three of you kind of converge and bring your work together for us sort of your well sorry um like like you know if anupam is um, working on like the building the interiors and so when you are working on it before it kind of disappears and ensley is trying to so so that's what we are trying we to are, seek we are starting a magazine ah we are starting ensley and simon and i uh it's it was launched on this rizvi thing and it's a trade it's what is called the trade magazine style because academic writing is not happening um i've been playing with it i've been looking for people to do it with i never knew that uh, we are actually all converging together on this today and we're going to have a first meeting this week something may come of it something may not but we are converging to start a little magazine where people can write without fear and just write and start writing and that's the stuff of archiving and uh, what um, um I've been really inspired by this get together, and I think this is the first time I've met Simon a couple of times. I've met Ainsley a couple of times, but today I'm listening to them. We listen a little less. We talk actually, but it's good. And um, so, I don't know your good name. What's your good name? Uh, uh, I'm Sona. Sona Gandhi. Sona, yes, Sona. So thank you, and I would say that. At least this next week we are converging. That that is excellent. That is super. And uh, yeah, and Bharat me kete na ki swan hota na swan. Hans kete hain pani me dud mix hota hai to Hans pani ko aur dud ko alag alag separate kar deta hai. So Simon kari thi na that everything is going away hmm. and uh, she just has to wait for that quick, not even wait. She has to wait for that quick moment to happen and then before it goes away, you know, she has to do that. पंचतंत्र में एक और वर्स है उसमें लिखा है सिंस लाइफ इज शॉर्ट एंड ऑब्स्टिकल्स इम्पेंड सिंस लाइफ इज शॉर्ट एंड ऑब्स्टिकल्स इम्पेंड सिंस टाइम इज शॉर्ट एंड ऑब्स्टिकल्स इम्पेंड लेट सेंट्रल फैक्ट्स बी पिक्ड एंड फर्मली फिक्सड एस सोन्स एक्सट्रैक्ट द मिल्क विद वॉटर मिक्सड that's amazing and uh, yes absolutely. that's that's great so looking forward to this convergence i think uh, also i i mean uh, uh, a platform like this uh, let us see each other's work okay and it let us learn from each other's work uh, i think it's it's very important i mean uh, and uh, i remember uh, because of this conservation initiative when i was in mother nature and i was doing the work there uh you know uh, so there was an old table there i mean not too much of value it was it was just aged over a period of time but the the people there suddenly started having uh, so much of uh, attachment to it okay and gave it a significance that they said no 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 whatever happens is table we must keep okay so automatically um, it does not happen in a day okay and and these kind of initiatives and platforms and uh, we know the people who know how to document how to archive how to put it out into the public realm uh, that that helps a wider range of people to get that awareness and be educated uh, anupam said that a uh, um, uh, very important thing where it's well meaning when people do any kind of conservation whether it's a to a fabric or a whatever even the manager of that laundry was well meaning in his mind he thought he was doing a damn good job okay uh, i think we have to get to the point where we kind of uh, we kind of tell them that this is another way of looking at it okay and they they and this has significance and value which we must all appreciate and then things will begin to change yes i i think um especially our young adults here who have who will find some meaning and significance otherwise uh, most of them want things which are swanky which look good which have um 
very um, kind of a superficial finish, but that's what some of the young adults have started um, identifying with. So if um, they are uh, made aware of the significance, I'm sure, um, we, we're sure many of us will uh, be able to do things that. I'm uh, not against, I'm not against glitzy stuff. If you look at the museum, it's quite glitzy. I'm not against it. I'm saying, uh, what I'm saying is the critical mind is important to understand why you're doing a particular act. I think that we have lost that critical thinking, which is important for all of us uh, as to why we're doing it. So we all have the latest iPhone and whatever, whatever gadgets. I'm not against that. No, I'm not saying go back and do this, but uh, we need to be critical about every act which we do. Yeah. Thank I'm talking you. too much, I think. I guess. Not <laughs> at all, sir. This is, this is but, uh, really... But since there are students, I think it's important to yeah, put it out. Yes, there. absolutely. Swanky. Swanky is good. <laughs> Swanky is good? Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. That has its own significance. It's really up to us what significance we give to things. So. Thank you. Yes, that's that's also true, sir. Absolutely. Um, uh, so um, we will now quickly take um, a few questions from our students, um, uh, from our audience who is present here. Yeah. So I'll start with the questions. One of the questions that we have got is, all the panelists have spoken about varied facets of Bombay in living history and the different approaches which have been taken by different organizations, individuals. Uh, what are the overlaps within these varied approaches that can be pursued as a common ground that brings together a larger understanding of the evolution of Bombay? Can the student just express this himself or herself? articulated question. Sir, I put the question in the chat box as well. I think uh, it'll be difficult. No, it's okay. Students are on campus. So, uh, you know, we have some volunteers who are taking the questions and passing them on to the moderator. Uh, maybe that student can uh, get up and come near camera where the classroom camera is. No, it's okay. What are the overlap in these? Areas? I think the, the, the uh, first half of the question was similar to the last question, but the ending was about the evol what it can say about the evolution of Bombay, which is a much more difficult question. Um, so I think your processes can be brought to say what I do, in that you all do community building, awareness, all those things. The working with communities here is just fat fat go in document and story tell. So I would need your process to make left. mine more complete. But I don't know what that tells us about the city. I mean, historically, you had a in 19th century Bombay, you had a lot of associational culture. You had associations that citizens formed for the betterment of the city, which has basically died in today's age. If those civic organizations and associations came back, then we could work for the city in a different way. And that would be in keeping with Bombay's great tradition of civic involvement. Um, right now, we work as individual parties. Um, Sorry, Sir, I think we uh, to actually work with communities and the people involves a lot of time. And um, and if uh, you cannot give your time, uh, you could not, cannot contribute to the, the, the history and the stories of Mumbai. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, when you say evolution, evolution is a big word. So we don't know whether you're talking about evolution of the city, evolution of communi communities, or evolution of newer things which change uh, communities. So um, I, I didn't understand that word. Uh, but but um, uh, the thing is that if you kind of uh, spend that time to contribute, okay, uh, and you, you kind of learn from various kind of other ways in which people do things, you might say, oh, this is lacking from my end, and I need to add value to it. Uh, so I think uh, it is it is not a one-stop shop. I mean, when you kind of, uh, 
dwell on this topic, uh, the voices of Mumbai, you realize that uh, through your own uh, upbringing or your own background, uh, you will focus on a particular aspect um, or your professional training, you focus on a particular aspect and realize that you need to focus on another aspect as well uh, to kind of disseminate the information which you have. So, I mean, the overlaps are numerous and I don't think these are the only three ways that they, if you have more speakers, you'll see that there are several other ways which probably we all of, all of us panelists can learn from. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. Um, associations as well, yeah. Yes. I think oh. another, another overlap in everything is, I think what uh, from the two speakers that have spoken and even the moderators who were talking, I think there's a sincerity. I think that's a very, very, it's not just an overlap. I think it's an overriding atmosphere. So I think that always works in whatever thing you're working on. And that should be pursued as common ground. If I go by that question, which is a very well-framed question. So if there is that, that should be perceived as common ground. But Insley, you're from Bombay, right? You've been here all your life? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been here, but I studied in Ahmedabad for six years. Uh -huh. So I and only brought up of, uh, in Mumbai. Uh -huh. I'm from Goa, great uh -huh. grandparents are from Goa, but yeah, that's how it is. And Simon, what about you? Yeah, born and raised here. I see. Left after undergraduate. Uh -huh. Now back. Uh -huh. Yeah. But um, uh, sincerity but, and passion is also another word which I would like to add. You know, so, I mean, if you're passionate about it, then come what may, you just do it. And I think... Uh, very often as as young kids we, are, we, are, we take up a profession if you have a passion for it you'll pursue it but mm -hmm. even after doing an architectural course you might go in another direction and take it to another level yeah and also what is interesting is that um, as we are pursuing our different varied professions and everything we find that any job that we do like if we are graduating in something just now, whatever we did, as we grew and wherever we worked, it has led to our growth also. And we have found new things about ourselves. We find that we can work in these different directions also. And to have the courage um, to, to go with it, you know, because things the, the things keep forming. One shouldn't worry about, uh, I think one thing common in all of, all of us that we have done, and I suppose that will be for other people also, is that uh, we've managed to go ahead and do some things and you find that things develop around it. So it's not a lonely road. There's always things that develop around it. And there are disappointments as well. Yeah, but that's good. Yeah. Because so they, say, no, good, that... they, they say that in order to discover new horizons, you must have the courage to lose sight of the shore. You know, also, so yeah, disappointments, but but that's part of it, isn't it? Yeah, it makes then, it so much more sweeter. Then yeah, then the fruit tastes sweeter. Yeah, thanks, sir. So I think uh, the very fact that we say whether they converge at a point or not is somewhere. Uh, uh, it's wrong on our part. Why are we seeing it at different things? They're probably different facets of the same thing. And like you said, as we grow through, I mean, we when we travel on this journey, we go through various stages and realize that probably uh, there are more things to explore. And all of them are part of the whole. They're not different things. So, uh, yes, I think we'll probably reverse our, uh, rephrase our question and uh, understand that all of it is together. And uh, we're just trying to grapple with one part because probably that's our limitation and uh, we'll learn and grow and uh, uh, be able to assimilate all of that together someday so yeah 
uh, any more questions from the students uh, you all can reach out to the uh, to the system in the seminar halls and ask your questions uh, even the faculty members anybody may i ask a question to simit uh, simit you talked about uh, the irani cafes and you said the owners were like the dons the bosses of their area could you could you just tell us a little bit more about that i'm so fascinated by that yeah so i mean you know, all these guys are really big into what was then called physical culture so bodybuilding weightlifting all these championships mr bombay mr health league bharat kumar also so they they were big tough guys okay number 1 number 2 they had bikes they like chicks that was the kind of that was the kind of milieu and then you had small and then you had bombay's bigger local dadas rising at that time in the 60s so you had your varda rajan you had all these other the king of cyan you had serious players who and these guys were kind of fending off their very small locality around their restaurant to bigger players like all the smugglers in the docks and all the matka kings and these guys were all embroiled in this little world the irani defending his much smaller territory and the big emerging dons of bombay you know getting bigger and bigger so it's a small guy and the big guy and and the playground was there uh, the area right outside their their cafe but these are fully these are upper middle class people affluent but completely crazy you know kind of um absolute characters but they are they are affluent um yes yes thank you so much um uh, imagine uh, that uh, an irani cafe owner and a bodybuilder like goes to the gym etc and who co competes uh, so that those are two different kinds of personalities opposite almost that you would associate with an irani cafe so i think that's also something that our students wouldn't have possibly known as known about rather yeah just you know there is a common the present understanding of irani owners and you are seeing now these owners who are all 70 80 plus and that is our understanding irani cafes have suddenly become big nostalgia things over the last decade or two but the the history of these men is very different i mean you are seeing them in their 80s if you go to yazdani bakery in the fort you will still see their bodybuilding photos up uh, of all of them and they're still actually really tough guys um and what's also happened is britannia is the kind of um, restaurant everybody knows and mr kohinoor who passed away at 97 he was the most popular face um of these irani restaurants if you guys kind of google and he was not he i used to say you're the parsi in the irani community i used to tell him meaning he was that slightly gentrifying well spoken guy who didn't have a bike and you know used taxi scooter topper in st xavier in st xavier school and college these guys are never toppers you know these guys are back of the bench and you have the sole mr kohinoor who is the gentrifier and now everyone thinks everyone the iranis are like mr kohinoor but they're not they're the local local don chaps so anyway that's <laughs> Yes, that that was really very beautifully put. Uh, thank you so much, Min. That was that was great. Okay, um, we'll wait for some a uh, couple of questions if there are any. But what is interesting is what Simon is saying, and also is actually um, it's all about storytelling, isn't it? Yeah. Anything that we do, the professions, uh, the way a person takes an institution forward. it's how you weave your existing information and you put it out you know what they do in a satsang or they do in these uh, gatherings or in speeches in public for a really it's all about you know telling stories i mean story is not in that sense of the term ki matlab bilkul kahani bana di but articulation is very important and i find actually that missing in the institutions that i teach around mumbai the master students level 
very, very pathetic articulation skills. They are not able to express. No wonder relationships are falling apart. They are not able to express things to each other either. Probably, most probably. I, I was very surprised in Bombay. For me, this was, I thought it was a city where people were, um, I was very surprised at the lack of expression about their own subject. They, I don't know. What is the discipline, Anupam, of these students? The areas, what? Uh, these are more the history students, the art students. It's phenomenal. They're not able to express. In fact, I begin all my first week of all my teaching at the various institutions that teach and getting them to. It's not that they can't, it's just that nobody's forced them to do it. To describe an object, for example, or describe something. Or even describe someone you see to describe a cushion lying on the sofa. Not able to describe. Shab I think it also happens with language, you know. If you don't know a language, you know, dimag band ho jata hai pura. Aur itna, English mein itna wo ho gaya hai na. It's good, but I think people should be able to express it. They should also have the courage to express in their language. That they are comfortable. Yes. yes. And, uh, sorry. Sorry, sir. Please. Absolutely. I said the kahaniya aur bhi sundar ho jayengi. In fact, uh, one of our senior faculty members, uh, he also added to this, he just shared a note with us where he talks about that uh, when we talk about heritage or the original, voicing or talking about is necessary before we write about it, before writing, it is vital to speak. And like you said, it is important that how we articulate, how we express we need to have a conversation first and the conversation will have an impact, will have an effect. So yes, thank you so much, sir. Yes. Very true. And thank you to the gentleman or the lady who wrote that. Thank you. Yes. Sir. I think Minas wants to share something with us. Minas, please. No, I think there's a student question. Khadija wants to ask something. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, Ma'am uh, Simon, uh, I wanted to ask you about your PhD thesis, you know, that you were talking about. Uh, what's it about exactly? Because you were talking about all these, uh, you know, different things. And how do you how do you give topics to these things? And how do you kind of, you know, uh, put these in uh Put these in specific topics and subtopics. So I, I wanted to know about that. Yeah. So you know, I was really led by the archive. I spent a year at the Maharashtra State Archives at Elphinstone College, going through papers from the 1860s onwards, basically the Bombay Gazette, the Times of India. And I knew obviously I was working on Parsis in colonial Bombay and trying to say something about their modernity and how they evolved as a community. And I suddenly found all these advertisements of hotels in Bombay, Bombay's early hotel trade. And most of these hotels were run by Parsis. I had no idea about any of this. So it was the archive that led me because I go in, sweep in, and I'm looking for like Parsi names, this, that. And I keep seeing all these hotel advertisements. So I think, you know, my sort of the nicest thing I did in the thesis was this chapter on the early hotel trade and how it changes with the coming of Watson's Hotel, which came up in, in the late 1860s. And that changed hoteliering in Bombay. It was the first grand hotel. And it's unlikely that uh, Jamshedji Tata built the Taj because he was not allowed admission into Watson's Hotel because they were admitting Indians the year that they opened, they officially opened. So it's a nice fo folky urban myth that Tata was probably uh, you know, shunned from Watson's and therefore built the Taj, but it seems unlikely. But you know, you can still do a lovely little walk around the fort uh, on early hotel trade and see the older structures and the newer things. And 
how a structure could not be a bank, then it couldn't become a hotel, then it couldn't become a residence. That happened before the fort walls came down. There was a multiplicity, multiplicity of, of use of space. But after the fort walls come down, you have to design, design a space. It is a specific use and it has to be designed such. And that's what changes in the city. You can't have multiple uses. Abhi ye, then then, then this, then this, then this. You a hotel, you're built as a hotel, and then you compete as different hotels. So that was my favorite chapter, actually. And hmm. yeah, it sounds really interesting. Something to really ponder upon. Thank yeah. you. Take her for a walk one day, and <laughs> At we all time. would love that. That yeah. that we are go. We are. Thank you so much, Simin. That would be great. Yes, yes, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. No. Now, as we are coming to the close of the panel, I have just been thinking of you know the past two hours and the way they've just flown by, and when we started, we were talking about you know, de-layering the city and looking at it through so many different lenses. And uh, what is, uh, you know, very uh, interesting to observe is that through this entire conversation, we are actually finding overlaps. Though we, though we started off with, you know, se separating layers, we are actually finding overlaps. So as, you know, Simon uh, deals uh, in storytelling and finding stories within the city and so does Ensley through his work he's using artifacts to tell stories about the city and then we had Anupam who kept quoting from the Panchatantra and <laughs> so it's you know st stories in, uh, in stone and so many other ways uh, so it, it's been very very interesting and I'm, I'm glad at the way this entire con conversation has you know kind of evolved around uh, uh, built and unbuilt and tangible and intangible and the overlaps that we have found and the convergence that <laughs> probably will happen. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful to all of you. It's been a great start. Thank you very, very there much. There are two people in seminar two who have raised their hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can always take questions. <laughs> Hello. Seminar two students, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Anubam, sorry, give me a question. Sir, you can say that it's a conservation. So, we have to say that conservation and conservation is a topic and its significance. Every thing has significance. But at the time, it's a process. But उसको कंजर्व करना बहुत अच्छी चीज है। But जैसे मैम ने भी बता रही थी, सेवन मॉन मैम बता रही थी कि हर चीज कंजर्व होगी। तो उसके साथ एक एग्जाम्पल बता रहा था, अभी लॉन्ड्री का। So लॉन्ड्री वो ऐसे क्यों हुई? ये पहले क्वेश्चन है। मतलब एक कंजर्वेशन के पहले ये क्वेश्चन आना चाहिए। वो चेंज क्यों हुआ? मतलब वो डेवलपमेंट मतलब वो लॉन्ड्री के लिए वो लोग का मतलब वो लोग का प्रॉब्लम था कि वो लोग का धंधा नहीं हो रहा था शायद से ऐसा मेरा सोचना है सो इसलिए वो लोगों ने वो चेंजेस लाए वो लोगों ने ये चेंजेस किए सो अभी कोई भी प्रीसेंट या कोई भी हेरिटेज सिग्निफिकेंस का इम्पोर्टेंस इकोनॉमी से कैसा बढ़ा I think प्रश्न तो सुंदर है और economy और conservation का तो संबंध बहुत ही गहरा है because वो भी एक significance है ना economic significance तो बहुत जरूरी है इतने सारे crafts people आजकल जो शिल्पकार हैं जो अलग-अलग type के जो पहले काम क्या करते थे आजकल उन्होंने अपने सब ये काम छोड़ दिया है क्योंकि उनके बच्चों के लिए वो कारीगरी का कोई महत्व नहीं रह गया है आर्थिक there is no economic significance left and that is why they're leaving it. 
so unless something brings value to your family to livelihood which can get you enough money to educate your children why would that parent carry on with that thing and the same thing with the shop establishment the same thing with the hotel it is all linked with one of the one of the significance of something is economic significance right so aapne jo bola balki aapne to apne prashn ka uttar bhi de hi diya hai but you are absolutely right so it is important to see the economic significance of things but again again as i said it is up to you to see what are the significance do you find in something agar aapko usme koi aur teen char alag प्रकार के सिग्निफिकेंस दिखते हैं तो शायद आप प्रयत्न करेंगे कि उसको आ, उसका स्वरूप को आ, उसकी हिफाजत की जाए इन दैट सेंस इट्स रियली अबाउट दैट इट्स एंटायरली योर आउटलुक एंड दैट इज व्हाई इन मेनी कल्चर्स मेनी थिंग्स डिसअपियर बिकॉज वहां पर वो सिग्निफिकेंस को बेरी कर दिया गया है हटा दिया गया है अब भारत जैसी जगह में बुजुर्गों का आदर करना यहाँ के हर एस्पेक्ट में हर मतलब जीवंत है ये चीज बड़ों का आदर करना किताबों का आदर करना एक पेंसिल भी जमीन में गिर जाती है उसको उठा के आप लोग पर एक बार ऐसे कर लेते हो दिस इज अग्निफिकेंस दैट ऑल ऑफ यू हैव गिवन टू टूल्स ऑफ एजुकेशन विच मेनी कल्चर्स डोंट हैव राइट देर इज नो इकोनॉमिक सिग्निफिकेंस इन इट राइट बट it is a significance you have given so economic significance but i agree with uh, what the gentleman said is absolutely it's a very very important and overriding significance but you must balance it with other significances also thank you thank you so much you know what we should uh, once it opens out we should come to rizvi college and have a chat with the students I was just going to say that Anupam sir, that we need to, we intend to continue. At least we have started uh, having some uh, questions, and there is a dialogue which is uh, we are discussing this. So we need to, we intend to continue this further. Like you know, so we would definitely want you, Angli sir, and even Simin to come over to college and interact with the students one on one, and maybe take it little bit ahead. So. we will be in touch with you and we will see to it that we get these discussions ahead yeah <laughs> thank you thank you thank very much thank you thank you sir thank you anupam sir thank you ansli sir and dr simen patel uh we are leaving at a point where this deliberation will continue and like ma'am said even the students getting involved that's that's what we really were hoping to achieve through this set of discussions and it's a good start so thank you so much thanks a lot great to be talking with thank you thank you anjali thank you so much thanks a lot next week i'll send you an email we will meet up huh? that convergence <laughs> Thanks to yeah. Rizvi College, yeah. <laughs> and Sir Rizvi College of Architecture can be your conversion conversion point. Oh, definitely. We yeah, are yeah, converted. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to come to the exhibition before that, and yeah. yes, do, do let us know. Yeah, 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 maybe tomorrow I'll come in and show. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank Take care. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. We shall now break for thirty minutes, and I request the students to be seated in the seminar hall itself for the refreshments to be served. Thank you. Mobility and transport, and its impact on the environment in Mumbai. I would now uh, like to call Professor Minas to speak more about the same. Thanks, Patija. uh so i am just giving an overview of uh, you know the whole idea of this uh, symposium since uh, these panelists perhaps were not there in the morning and there were maybe others who joined in particularly for this session so uh, voices in mumbai uh, started as a very simple idea but then it extended it to something which is very layered uh as we've been saying you know mumbai speaks in many voices but uh, are all these voices heard uh what are the voices that we as architects uh need to be hearing other than the voice of you know fellow architects uh and what are the lenses through which we must see the city
so uh, as we all know there are so many individuals and uh, groups which have been uh, doing extensive work to um, kind of you know impact the city or document the city in their own way and uh, if we start you know kind of looking beyond uh, the uh, uh, realm of architecture and urban planning and urban design uh, we wanted to reach out uh, to a whole lot of people such as researchers and artists uh, people from the community uh, people who represented um, uh, you know representing certain groups of citizens so they are all here as part of the symposium and uh, they uh, help us see the city through different lenses the heritage being the first lens which we discussed in the morning uh, which where we see the city as a living history and writing about the city where we you know uh, proves to be a muse to uh, so many writers and over over the centuries i would say and uh, we also look uh, at uh, the city in terms of uh, mobility uh, you know a city which is always on the move and that is something which we will be discussing now through the you know three uh, uh, speakers that we have here and also what is the impact of this mobility and transport on our environment because we see the city also as a forest uh in um, the uh, panels which we cover tomorrow we will be looking at public spaces art and culture uh, so a city for everyone through its public spaces and how art and culture can be a glue that brings us all together uh and finally uh, all the communities who have kind of uh, uh, created a melting pot in in the city where there are so many boundaries which are blurred so many practices which are shared and uh, food which is one of them you know the city uh, with an appetite uh, and uh, how food brings us all together and what is the history of food so yes uh, i would hand it over to our moderators uh, for the day to you know take take this uh, conversation forward thank you yes so uh, good afternoon to all the panelists and all the students so i hope the students have had their break and they're back now so uh, welcome to all the panelists also here yeah? so uh, just to start the session just i'll just give a brief introduction of what we're looking at and uh, then we'll continue with the session so the session uh, is titled transport mobility and environment so uh, for larger cities mobility is a very important aspect especially for a mega city like mumbai uh, transporting millions of people is a mega task for the city but the question always comes at what cost so at the same time the health of a city is determined by its attitude towards its environment today we are looking at the environment beyond just recreational spaces to consider them as ecosystems which play a vital role in the city so uh, today on our panel we have mrs stalin uh, husain undurwala and firoza suresh people who are working on these aspects related to the city of mumbai uh they are not only talking or writing about these aspects but they are actively participating and actively involved in all these causes through various interventions and through various ways and in this way through their work they are becoming the voices of the people of mumbai so uh let's start with the first session uh i would like uh, saurabh to continue and uh, introduce the first speaker for the session hello uh am i audible hello yes you yeah. are audible sir yeah uh, uh hello to everyone and hello to our esteemed uh, panelists uh it's 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 a great uh, pleasure to have you all here uh to start the proceedings for this session uh, i would i would like to just uh, give a, a introduction to introduction to mr hussain indorwala uh hussain indorwala is is a teacher and an urban researcher uh he teaches uh, in in krvia uh, he he teaches planning theory housing and humanities which is uh, which is a core competency uh, of uh, of him um he's he's a coordinator of the research and consultancy cell uh, at at krvia uh his his research predominantly rests on politics uh, uh, you know policies planning uh, he speaks about urban history uh, 
uh, and urban political economy, which is uh, which is something uh, I would I would call as niche. Uh, he is um, he writes uh, in popular press uh, on urban urban development planning again policy as as important components um he has been part of uh, social movements in in mumbai for housing rights labor rights uh, mobility and sustainable mobility uh, he's been speaking about environmental justice and participatory planning um he also is closely working with community groups through collective uh, co collective for spatial alternatives csa and uh, action research uh, co uh, collective uh, he is also co conveyor conveyor of citizens group called amchi mumbai amchi best uh, it's it's a forum for public transport that has been advocating for reliable and affordable public transport in mumbai uh, i would like to personally uh, welcome hussein uh, hussein is a good friend of not only me but also rizvi college of architecture uh, he has been uh, he's been part of uh, one of our publications uh, on indore where uh, where the focus was on public housing and and policy so i would like to welcome hussein uh, and uh, you know I, I would like you to take up the take up the forum Thanks, Arup. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, and we you. miss you in KRVI. Okay. Um, so um, my presentation I've shared. So uh, is somebody yeah. running? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll just start. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm happy to be here and also to um, speak um, alongside Stalin and uh, uh, our city's bicycle mayor. Um, so um, what, what I thought of doing was to speak about um, public transport uh, uh, planning, uh, transport planning in Mumbai and how, what the trends are and um, how it is going to affect uh, the city and how it has been affecting the city and what the trends are for the future. So, um, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you uh, you all must have uh, probably seen some of these um, new initiatives uh, which are being um, kind of released with a lot of fanfare in the city. Um, the bicycle track, um, uh, the you know the electric buses that are coming in, and these have been announced as uh, a part of a whole range of uh, initiatives of um, uh, of the recent government on um, you know climate action and about doing something about climate change and uh, making the city uh, carbon neutral over the next um, what, 20, 30 years. Now. Uh, these are obviously uh, everybody who knows a little bit about climate change understands that uh, these things probably should have started. We, we ought to have started thinking about these 25, 30 years ago um, and never happened. Uh, it is now happening. So, you know, maybe it's a start. Um, but one must also be a little cautious about uh, celebrating um, some of these initiatives without really looking at uh, what they mean systemically uh, for the city. So this is um, more or less what I want to talk about. Mainly, you know, the thing, for instance, the bicycle track is a new project uh, uh, which has been actually started earlier. It started in 2012 or 13 um, uh, was initiated, but there, in 17 and 18, 2017 and 18, it was that, you know, there were evictions along the Tantra pipeline. Um, the Mahol issue, which you probably must have heard of, um, was basically uh, basically arose because people who were displaced from the Tanza pipeline were shifted there and so on. So, um, but the important thing about this bicycle track is to think about where it is located, where the route that it travels uh, passes through, uh, and what it is really for. Um, the, the way in which this bicycle track is designed, it is very clear that it is not for um, everyday mobility. It's for leisure bicycle. You know that is the reason why it takes a scenic route and it goes through um, around the Pavai Lake and you know uh, these areas. In 
said, if one was serious about um, non-motorized transport, like cycling, as, um, uh, as a mode of transport of mobility, everyday mobility, you know, it would really be on our arterial roads, uh, not, in the, you know, uh, uh, not in the um, less inhabited parts of the city. Similarly, with the bus, uh, electrification of buses, it's good to have electric buses, undoubtedly. Uh, but the question really is that, what is the larger policy for buses in the city? Moreover, how is the government, how serious it is uh, to reduce the biggest emitter uh, in the transportation sector, which is private automobile, which unfortunately there is very little thinking about. So these are some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, before I begin, I would like to start with this uh, very important concept called uh, the precautionary principle. Uh, basically, it says that if any uh, project or policy uh, has even a suspected risk of harm to the climate system, it should not be undertaken without near scientific near uncertainty, scientific near certainty about the absence of harm. This is an important concept because it changes the way in which one thinks about projects. You know, when we when the state plans project, uh, usually you have reports that are uh, you know produced to justify the project. Not uh, one important thing to remember is that these reports are not uh, assessments based on which the government decides to build a project and not B. But these are projects which are these are reports that are prepared to justify what has already been decided that we want to do. You know. And you can go through any of these GPRs and you'll find the same uh, thing. So these are kind of statistics and um, assessments that are, in a sense, uh, put together to justify why the project is being built. Now, the precautionary principle says that even if there is a hint that um, these are going to cause harm to the climate system, um, they should not be undertaken. And if they are undertaken, the burden of proof is on the people proposing the action, not on the people opposing it. You know, so when citizens and activists raise objections, uh, they are often asked to show why they are opposing projects. But on the other hand, the precautionary principle says that the burden of proof is on the authorities to show why these projects are important, and um, it should not be on the activists. You know, so um, we have to change the way we think about this. Um, unfortunately, today, um, people who um, challenge projects are always asked to provide, you know, it's on them that the burden of proof is placed, which is completely contrary to the precautionary principle. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who know a little bit about the history of the city, um, Mumbai is the uh, core city. The island city and especially the uh, you know the uh, earlier commercial part of the city uh, fort and um, and then the bazaar areas and so on. These were pre-automobile urban settlements. You know there was no car, there were no cars, there were no motorcycles. These were largely um, pedestrian and animal-based transport, uh, urban form that has emerged around these modes of transport. It was only later that um, you know the tram and the electric tram and buses and so on were introduced. Um, so this urban form is the automobile. Now, what that means is that if you want to make the city, make everybody in the city have cars, you will have to completely re-engineer the city, which is what we are seeing in a way. You know, um, all of the redevelopments, all of the, if you look at the Bindi Bazaar redevelopment project, it is completely re-engineering a, a large chunk of this inner city area to make it um, suitable for private automobiles and that the other all the you know, the freeway, highway projects and so on, um, which, you know, so even if the projects themselves, um, uh, the projects themselves have huge impact, but the way in which they transform the city is also has huge impact. We tend to think about projects in a piecemeal way. We think A project, these are the impacts, B project, these are the impacts. But we very rarely see that A project is going to re lead to a whole range of uh, transformation which also have very serious impact. That is how we need to start thinking about, you know, the uh, urban transformation and impacts on climate, uh, on the climate system. Next, please. 
Yeah, so you all know the story about Navi Mumbai and the idea of creating a counter magnet on the mainland. One of the proposals, obviously, was to create a transport system, uh, water-based, which would connect the island city with the with the mainland. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, that never happened. You know, Trans Harbour Link earlier was uh, was planned as a railway, you know, railway line, suburban railway line. It was uh, never built. Now it is being built, but mainly as a um, as a road link and maybe a metro link, you know, but not necessarily a suburban rail link. I'll talk about why this is uh, important or significant. Next slide. Yeah, so much of today's thinking about how Mumbai should be um, was in a sense initiated in the decade of the 90s, uh, liberalization, there was a, um, you know, new thinking about how the, uh, city should be shaped, who should be involved in planning the city and so on. There were groups such as Bombay First, which were basically, which are corporate think tanks, which uh, started talking about restructuring the city, for, uh, you know, as a finance and service center, you know, a series of uh, central business districts in different parts of the city linked with the uh, freeways and so on. So this was the kind of uh, new vision for uh, the city. Um, this comes from a report prepared by a, um, uh, you know, a credit rating agency called Crystal. And the next slide, please, um, which came from the from Bombay First. Yes. I think many of us know about this, um, which was essentially a PowerPoint presentation, you know, uh, uh, Vision Mumbai report, which had many of the projects that you see today were already, um, you know, uh, conceived in this document. Uh, the uh, two ring roads. Which is around the island city. The eastern freeway is already built. The western coastal road is being built, and then you have the Trans Harbour Link and the other link, which will create the other ring road. All of them, notice, are connecting business districts, and then you have the rail, which is not suburban rail, which is metro, right? So this is what you can see: the early conception of what we are seeing today in the city uh, started from there. But it's important to um, to um, you know trace where this influence uh, on city planning is coming from, right? Next slide, please. And what, is, what this has done, you know, all of the freeways and the hundreds of flyovers and so on, is that it has completely changed the way in which the city moves, right? Um, in 1998, um, about 75% of the city's population who were not walking or cycling, and this is all motorized transport uh, shares, 75% of the trips in the city were by suburban rail and BST, uh, which is what many cities in the world are trying to reach today. Um, Mumbai already had it in 1998, but the trend that we are um, pursuing is the opposite of make what many other cities are pursuing, right? So in 2008, already the share had declined. By 2018, it's come down dramatically to 55%, and it's going to reduce further. On the other hand, if you look at the share of uh, private vehicles, four wheelers and two wheelers, it is constantly going up. Now, we tend to think, and a lot of planners and policy makers argue that people use, you know, buy cars because it's quality of life and incomes are increasing and so on. But this is not the case. And I'll show you again when we discuss the case of Singapore that it is not that if people have better incomes, they will automatically buy cars. Uh, in fact, it's a public policy question. What are what are we doing to ensure that people prefer to use public transport as opposed to private vehicles? What we're seeing is a kind of a behavioral shift which is being affected in the city towards private transportation. There's a simple concept. If any anybody takes a course in transportation planning, one of the first things you learn is a concept of induced demand, which basically means that the more road space you create, the more you induce people to buy uh, private vehicles. And it's, uh, it, you know, um, uh, uh, but despite that, and with the with perfect knowledge of this, you have uh, more and more roads and freeways being constructed. You will be surprised if you look at the DPRs for the various projects, like they say the coastal road project, you will not even find the mention of the phrase induced demand. It is as though, you know, uh, and these are prepared by very large transportation consultancy uh, firms. So uh, the, it's very clear that uh, the, there will be only discussion about things which are uh, beneficial to the project proponents, not necessarily um, in, you know, in terms of other priorities that the city has, such as 
in reliance on fossil fuels or equity or you know affordability and so on. Next slide, please. So, for instance, the, this is how the transportation survey of uh, 2008 says Mumbai, you know, uh, how Mumbai moves. Most of the people walk, and this is generally the pattern of uh, settlements that you see in much of the global south, where people live very work very close to their uh, uh, places of residence, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, mostly walk or cycle to work. Uh, on the other hand, in Mumbai was a special case because a very large percentage of the population used suburban rail, which is uh, 24%. So if you remove the 52% walking and cycling, you will find that uh, the train, the suburban rail is a very important mode of transport and then it declines as you go down to the private automobile. Now it's important here, this data is from 2008. In 1998, Mumbai had um, you know 250,000 cars on the road. In 2008, it had 500,000 cars in the Today, it has 1 million and it's grown, right? So increasingly, the car ownership and car use is increasing in the city, which is why, which is what all of these charts are trying to indicate. Next slide. Um, now, if you think about this, where is the government spending money uh, to improve transportation? Most of the expenditure is for cars and two-wheelers, which is your road project. Now there's Metro Rail, which is another transport system. You know, it's not augmentation or improvement of suburban rail, but it's a complete new transport system that they're creating. So the Metro is actually uh, where a lot of money is being spent. But uh, if you factor in all of your ceilings and coastal roads and flyovers, there is a very large chunk of money being spent on improving transportation for five to eight percent of the uh, trips in the city of the you know users of private automobiles, not necessarily the users of buses and suburban rail. Next slide, please. Um, so you know what are these projects? So let's take the Bandra Valley ceiling, Eastern Freeway, JVLR, SCLR, 50 flyovers, coastal road, all of these, the usage is 90% and above for private vehicles, right? So which means that this expenditure is for enabling private vehicle, vehicle use, not necessarily to promote public transport. Next slide, please. Now, why is this important? It's, a, it's important because if you look at the cost of travel and you know, the expense to use these different modes of transport, which actually translates into energy costs, right? Uh, because most of the costs are actually fuel costs. Uh, which is basically what, if we, and when we talk about fuel consumption, we are also talking about emissions. The suburban rail system costs 25 pesos per passenger kilometer, right? On the other hand, a car costs five and a half rupees, you know, almost six rupees um, uh, per passenger kilometer. So the fuel consumption for different modes of transport is very clear in this. Uh, the metro is somewhere in the middle, you know? So, it, um, they, and the, the gain, for instance, of spending on bus system would be much higher than spending on the metro rail system and improving the bus system is not so expensive. Yet, the priorities are very clear. Metro is the priority, uh, freeways are the priority, not railways and bus. Next slide. So if you look at the coastal road DPR, how is the project justified? It's justified as it will increase travel speed and therefore reduce pollution, right? But it's also going to induce demand. It's going to put more cars on the road which is not factored in the coastal road DPR. Next slide, please. But if you look at the metro DPR, um, you know, the opposite case is being made, that metro will reduce, uh, you know, stop people from using cars and move them into metro. Now, if you look at the experience of other Indian cities and uh, high-income cities, you'll find that people don't prefer to move from metros, uh, from cars to metro. Most people who go to metros are, actually bus users and two-wheeler users. In Indian cities, this trend is very clear. You can look at uh, academic work on this, and you will see that people who move to metros are generally bus and two-wheeler users, not car users. Now, if you also look at the way metros are pl being planned in Mumbai, they're all being planned on arterial roads, except for the Metro Line 3, which is underground. All of them are arterial roads. What that does is that if you move, if people who are using two-wheelers and buses move from these arterial roads onto the metro, it releases more space for cars. 
which means that it is going to again induce demand. What one ought to be doing is to take away lane from cars and give it to public transport or give it to non-motorized transport, which is not the trend. The trend is to increase lanes for private vehicles and to put public transport as separate systems, maybe elevated petrol, you know, rail, or maybe to create these point-to-point -point bus services and so on, but not to replace um, automobile reliance with uh, buses and uh, cycle tracks and so on. Next slide. So, you know, and these projects are enormously expensive. You all know that. When the um, coastal road was proposed in 2011, it was supposed to be 8,000 crores for 35 kilometers. Today, the whole project, including the VBSL, uh, will cost um, more than, I think, around 25,000 crores. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is uh, by the kilometer more expensive than the underground metro. And, you know, this is a extremely dramatic uh, piece of information. How can, you know, the city spend more for a private car only um, uh, infrastructure um, when it is more expensive than mass infrastructure like the metro system? This is actually something which is uh, almost a scandal in the city. Next slide. Yeah. Um, now, if you look at the cost per kilometer over 20 years per person, so basically this data, the last column, next slide, please, uh, which is an expanded one. Yeah. Uh, so the cost per trip per kilometer for 20 years. So if you take all the people who are going to use a uh, mode of transport, um, say the coastal road, um, and you divide it by you know, uh, 20 years and you estimate the cost per trip per kilometer, the coastal load will cost the public 22 rupees to move one passenger, you know, uh, over 20 years. Whereas if you had simply built BRTS on the Western Express Highway, it would cost the public 18 pesos. You know? So this is the comparison between projects like the coastal road and uh, simple improvements to the buses. You know, um, all of these electric buses have been introduced, but the one major thing that your seminar is titled Voices of the People of Mumbai, people of Mumbai have been saying is that you introduce dedicated bus corridors on the major arterial roads, which has simply not happened because they don't want to prioritize public transport over private transport like you. Uh, Next slide. Now, if you look at the metro planning system, I also already said that they are being planned on arterial roads. But if you look, this is a comparison on the left, you see the London metro system and right is the uh, Mumbai metro system. In London, Paris, many of these cities which got their metros during the interwar period between the first, second world war and maybe in the 60s and 70s, all of these metro systems are extremely dense which means that you can walk, if you are in the central area of the city, you can walk to at least two or three metro stations from where you are, you know. Um, that's called station density. Um, in If you are in the island city, even after the metro tree is built, the station density is much lower than many of these uh, uh, other cities. Uh, another really important thing about these metro systems is that they are completely, um, you know, um, independent of the road system which means that you can connect parts of the city which are yet not connected. The metro was an act, was actually an opportunity for Mumbai to in, dramatically improve east-west connectivity. But instead, what it did was to reproduce the north-south uh, kind of growth pattern, which is, uh, you know, which also tells you, in a way, the hint as to what the metro is really for. One tends to think that these projects are for transportation. But if you actually look at the fine print, you'll re realize that the metro or the, um, you know, the coastal freeways and so on, they have a lot to do with the manipulation of land value. When you build an infrastructure project, what you do is to elevate land values in that corridor, obviously because, you know, people are going to use it and so on. So if you look at the link road um, and the kind of land use change along the link road in the past uh, seven, eight years, it has completely transformed, mainly because of the uh, expectation of land value increase. Now, in many cities like Singapore and elsewhere, where these transport networks are being built, this land value increase is used to finance those infrastructure projects, right? But in Mumbai, what is happening is that now, in fact, recently there was a news item which spoke about a metro set for the whole city. 
meaning everybody is going to pay for the metro irrespective of whether they use it or not. In other cities where these corridors are being built, it is the people who benefit directly from the metro pay, pay for it. User uh, pays principal or the landowners who benefit from these infrastructure, they finance the project. So there is also this kind of tendency in, in Mumbai to um, redistribute costs downwards, meaning people who are not benefiting from infrastructure pay the highest burden uh, in terms of impacts as well as in terms of cost. Whereas people who benefit pay, you know, relatively speaking, much less. Next slide, please. So just to give you a case of Singapore, because you know we have heard for the past 20, 30 years that we want to make Mumbai world class city, and you know Shanghai, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, all of these cities are basically used as examples. So take let's take one example seriously, Singapore. I mean, Singapore. If you look at the timeline, it has a whole range of um, measures that they have introduced over the past uh, 50 years on one with one single goal how do you restrict the use of private automobiles so registration fees then you had parking uh, schemes you had vehicle quota system and road pricing schemes or what is called congestion pricing um, all of these measures have been introduced they have something called the coe which is certificate of entitlement if you buy a car in singapore you have a right to use the road for 10 years and this coe is purchased through a bidding process. So they have a quota system. And if you want to get buy a car, you have to bid for that right to use the road for 10 years. Can you think of any such uh, policy in Mumbai? On the other hand, in Mumbai, you have almost free parking. You have um, very little uh, cost on, uh, you know, using, uh, and people grumble about the uh, road tax and so on. So this is uh, an important contrast between these other cities, which Mumbai is constantly, you know, being uh, compared to and their policies and ours. So, for instance, the uh, main pillars of uh, transport policy in Singapore is to reduce car dependency, provide alternate modes of transport, um, and to integrate land use and transport planning. To give you an example of integration of land use and transport planning, if you want to, um, for instance, reduce housing costs in Mumbai, what you need to do is to create uh, low cost transport in the peripheral area, which would mean you would need a suburban rail, right, to connect to these areas. If you build a road, the cost of transportation from, let's say, Navi Mumbai to Mumbai will increase because road travel is more expensive. But if you build a suburban rail, it's reduced. So people who have less uh, income can live affordably uh, out, you know, in the peripheral areas. But what we are doing is creating possibilities of land value capture in the periphery by building freeway projects, you know. So, I mean, obviously the Navi Mumbai airport area is, um, is going to be in the next uh, 10, 15 years, a very important site for land speculation uh, for developers. And rather than thinking about it as a place where people who have low income can live in comfortable, affordable homes, right? So this is something that, um, Again, we are not doing. So these are the things that Singapore is doing that we are absolutely not doing. Next slide, please. Now, just take this. I, I included this table to give you an illustration. Uh, Singapore also has different kinds of uh, costs based on different kinds of uh, vehicles, right? Um, so if, if you see the OMB is the open market value. Uh, if you are buying a you know a medium size or small size car in Singapore. The open market value is 18,000 Singapore dollars, which comes to more or less 10 lakhs, which is equivalent to what we pay here to buy a car. But in Singapore, if you want to buy that car, you have to pay 116,000 Singapore dollars, including all the costs that that are you know that the government levies on you, including the certificate of entitlement, which means that you're paying close to 65 lakhs for a car that costs 10 lakhs in the open market. Uh, this is the way in which they restrict private automobile use, right? Um, and what have they achieved? What they have achieved over uh, the past 20, 30 years is that they have completely stabilized car ownership and, in fact, car use has declined in Singapore. Uh, increasing role of rail transit, uh, traffic congestion mitigation, which they have managed really well, and all of their transit fares, because they are public transport and private transport is uh, charged so heavily, 
all of that revenue that is generated is then used to improve and subsidize uh, public transport, which is why transport is affordable for almost anybody who lives in Singapore, irrespective of their uh, income. Next slide, please. So compare, for instance, the subsidies, bus, sub, you know, bus transport subsidy of these, these cities, you will see that in Mumbai, uh, in 94, when you had the BST, the electric and uh, transport division, you had a cross subsidy. Today, that subsidy is almost zero, you know. Uh, yeah. Now, another thing, this is still 2015. From 2015, much has changed in the bus system. For instance, in 2015, they started bringing in private contractors to run bus. Now, uh, to justify that privatization of BSD, there was one single message that was constantly being sent to, uh, to you know, to citizens, which was that BSD is financially unviable. The losses are increasing and so on. Since they have introduced you know, uh, private contractors in uh, in BSC, the losses have actually increased, but they have just stopped talking about. It, you know, so uh, uh, privatization was justified because losses were increasing, but privatization has led to greater losses for BSC. But that is not now being spoken about. Next slide, please. I think this is the last slide. Yeah. So yeah, this is the last slide. So Usain, if up, you could just con conclude, yeah, yeah, thank you. Just, just to sum up, um, so uh, if one is serious about climate action, environmental impacts, and so on, um, this, we will have to think about uh, or assess the seriousness of our planners and policymakers in terms of what they are doing to reduce reliance on private automobiles and to increase reliance on public transport, um, and that should be the test rather than you know, glossy announcement in social media and the press about electrification or uh, bicycle lanes, um, you know, bicycle projects, track projects and so on. That's all I want to say. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Hussain. I think it was a very wonderful oversight of uh, you know, all the projects of Mumbai and looking at it uh, from a very, uh, very planning-based approach and all that. So I think, uh, uh, very wonderful. We would really like, I think I'm sure there are a lot of questions that everyone has in which we would like to uh, come up with uh, and have in the later session. Uh, I would like to introduce the next uh, speaker for the session, who is uh, Feroza Suresh. I think a number of faculties are already uh, in working with her and very closely. I think something that students, we would like you to really encourage all the students to, you know, like do what you're doing. So I just have a brief introduction of uh, Feroza. Feroza is the first bicycle mayor of Mumbai, if you would really like to understand what that is. A woman cycling enthusiast who has pledged to make cycling a currency of health and new footprint for sustainable transportation. She is also the director of Smart Commute Foundation, through which she has initiated several movements for adopting cycling as a smart choice for commuting like Cycle Chala, City Bacha, Cycle to Work, and Me Cycle Rider. Uh, to support her cause and complement her uh, passion, she has collaborated with like-minded professionals and guided by a knowledgeable advisory committee to spread the culture of smart commuting in the city. A determined, passionate, and die-hard enthusiast, Firoza is determined to place India on the global map of cycling country. So, uh, Firoz, I would really like to understand how you are planning to do this, and uh, over to you. Uh, you are. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's that's a digital migrant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're still learning. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank uh, Minaz and of course Nikita. Uh, who I've been working very closely for all our initiators in Mumbai City. But having said that, uh, this wonderful uh, uh, exhibition which you all have put up, uh, Voices of Mumbai, I think it's the need of the hour at this point of time. Uh, I've been working in the space uh, since almost, uh, uh, I'll just take one minute to uh, describe, uh, you know, all of the Mumbaikers which we are and passionate about uh, uh, this city. Um, and uh, what I've seen since 2009, I mean, being very mindful and being aware that I'm working in the environmental space and eventually, uh, you know, these words like climatic change and everything. And, you know, we have all the wonderful seminars which happens across the globe, the COPs and everything. And 
of course there's a lot of knowledge sharing which happens out there and with young minds uh, like rizvi college has so many of the students who are in that space of uh, uh, learning urban planning and architecture and everything it's very very important for them to also understand the balance uh, though uh, i like the presentation of which hussein mentioned about uh, the figures the figures and the matrix and everything looks good which is very important from the architect and from the urban planning and transport planning point of view but having said that uh, uh, i am not from academia uh my i am i have not studied uh, urban planning or architecture or anything uh so my knowledge specifically uh, over the time had uh, i actually evolved in the space of grassroots uh because i believe all of that goes hand in hand you know all of the technical knowledge and all the graphs and everything don't look good but if if anybody is not actually uh putting the effort in the grassroots work of actually um bolte hai na haath gande karne padte hain okay and that's that's very very important um india you know we have a we have a very valued asset at currently which is our youth and uh, it's very very important for the youth uh, who i mentioned they are digital uh, natives and they have so much of new age skills um uh it's very important for them to take because we are all doing a bit stalin is doing his bit in his own uh, you know work of uh, environmental you know he's really saving all the environment aslam is doing his own work minas is doing her own work for rivers and forests um hussein and i know a lot many of the urban planners and transport planners zora and i can go endlessly uh, alan abram everybody is putting in their work but you know what happens we all are the uh, sole flag bearers for the city uh i believe but it's all for the younger generation to take on it's very very important for them to understand that okay there is this whole digital world and everybody is hooked on to the mobile but how possibly we can use all of that and uh, take this ad ad uh, agenda forward which is basically for mumbai city and mumbai city uh, has various voices which mumin has rightly mentioned it's the voice of that 8 years old child to that 80 years old man i mean that's where that eight eight years to 80 years city has been thought about uh, in various parts of the world um also a thought process of the five minute city uh these are the thought processes which the young generation would think about of course there is enough of uh, knowledge in google uh, for them to read up but it's very important to adopt uh, so having said that i'll share my screen uh, i'm at kochi currently because there's a live project which is going on in kochi so if there is a problem of connectivity please uh, help me through that again i said i am a digital migrant so um is the screen visible yes ma'am okay great i just need so i'll just quickly uh, go about because i said my knowledge has always been in the grassroots uh, work um though husain has uh, mentioned lot of those uh, numbers so probably there would be some duplication in the in in the in the slides but i'll just go through all of all of it quickly so uh, uh, rightly mentioned uh, what is the role of a bicycle mayor um uh, the mayor role is uh, uh, is a leadership program which is driven by a dutch ngo which is called bycs and globally we are 100 bicycle mayors uh, in india there itself we are 45 uh with a common mission of 50 by 30 which means 50% of the commute trips should be converted into cycling by 2030 yes it's not easy it's an uphill task uh you know there is this law of work which needs to be done um so what what is it we are looking at so simply you know let's keep it very simple when you talk about integrated planning and we talk about smart moving for any cities here because we are talking about mumbai what what is required we require software We require hardware in simple language and organization and governance. When you talk about software, it's simply about all the grassroots level work which we are doing. The the culture we're building up a culture. There's a behavior change. There is willingness surveys which comes in. All of all of that is the software because uh, it's it's you know when we are talking about uh, way of life, we're making cycling into a way of life. It's it sounds it sounds very easy. I mean you know Amsterdam has achieved it. but when we talk about way of life for a city like mumbai that means uh, people should first think about cycling uh, for uh, if they want to travel from a a place to b place 
of course we are not talking about 20 25 kilometers we are talking about short distance commute maybe 8 to 10 kilometers distance maybe a first mile and last mile is something which we talk about so building culture is what about is all about software when you talk about hardware is it's all all that uh, academy and knowledge uh, you know the, uh, the 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 figures the building of infrastructure the cycle network plan uh, putting up uh, the cycle tracks uh, your cycle stands you know that's all about the infrastructure and of course um, I mean, I, I'll come come in my later slides for the cycle network plan and why why it is very very important for the city. So that's that's all about hardware, and the most important is the policymakers, um, uh, which is unfortunately you know Hussein has already spoken a lot about it. I am not going to touch upon the subject, but most important thing is the road safety. Is are we do do we? Like, uh, you know, when I when I've been working in the space since 2012, you know, promoting cycle to work uh, as a program. I mean, of course, we had all the instant gratifications uh, where we award awarded people in Mumbai, be it the uh, elite cyclists or be make it inclusive with all the livelihood cyclists in Mumbai. Um, road safety is always a major concern, and. Um, 2016, when um, the municipal commissioner, Mr. Ajay Mehta, uh, when I met up with him and he saw that enthusiasm, you know, generally about cycling, the, the one thing he mentioned, you know, Firoza, just tell me one thing which is very, very important for a cyclist. And I said, it's the road because we need we need good roads. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's full of potholes. And I think that's the major deterrent when it comes to cycling. Of course, uh, you know, junction management and everything will follow. But the most important thing is having good roads and policies because we do not have a non-motorized transportation policy yet for a city. Uh, because if we have that, then there would be budgets. You know, currently, there are budgets for the coastal roads and the uh, numerous uh, flyovers and all of that, which is coming up to this for the city and the metros, which uh, Hussein rightly mentioned. But what about the non-motorized transportation? Are we are we are we talking about? Uh, is there any budget which? Uh, I think the only city uh, which you all need to you know if, if the students are is the is Pune Pune cycle plan. There was some effort which has gone into it. Currently, I really don't know what is the status, but yes, they made an effort uh, to have um, a, a plan in place uh, for their city. So there always a crisis situation. Amsterdam was never a cycling city. You know, 30, 35, 40 years back, it was a, it was a car-centric city. So there is always a, a crisis. But how do we look at crisis? Okay, we say okay, it is my responsibility or it is someone else's responsibility to make that crisis into a solution. Well, it's everybody's responsibility. When I talk about software, hardware, and the policymakers coming together, that's where you find the transform transformation. And it is not easy. It will never happen in a single day. It takes some amount of effort and uh, and a collective people, like-minded people, to come together to bring about the change. Um, as I said, you know there are a lot of soul, uh, flag bearers for the city, but it's very, very important for all of us to come together. And it's very important at this point of time. You know, whenever there is this, um, um, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the you know, whenever this voting, you know, <laughs> all of that when comes it. Everybody has comes up with, okay, I will do this for the city and I will bring about this change for the city and I will. But most important thing, everybody who's working in this space, we know that there is, has to be a manifesto, a manifesto, which is very, very clear. Of course, we have the DP plan and we have all of that for the city, which is properly laid down. But if we do not have a proper manifesto for each and everything, when we talk about rivers, is there a many manifesto? We always talk uh, in a Mitty river. I know we always, but there has to be specific manifesto for every little, maybe mobility, maybe it waterways, be, maybe it uh, be for forest, maybe it for rivers. Uh, and it, I think it's time, maybe we've got excellent uh, minds in our city. And it's very, very important. The transformation will not come when we talk about only mobility. It's not about that. It's transform, transformation when we talk about holistic. Maybe the transformation will not happen in 24 wards of uh, Mumbai city. Maybe a look at a transformation in one ward, make it into a pilot place, make it look beautiful and make it look happy. That's that's what we are looking at. 
Uh, having said that, I've been working in this, I mean, back to the uh, uh, conversation of uh, cycling, I've been working the space since 2009. Uh, this is the only uh, headline which changed globally and was a game changer was the corona pandemic though it was you know had their own plus and minus with for cycling it was a boom we had seen uh, close to 40 to 45 percent increase of uh, cycling which has happened specifically for mumbai i have never never seen so many youth on the road especially the youngsters who will pick up their bicycle and uh, travel the length and breadth of the city for whatever reasons they have invested into a cycling uh, but now is the time uh, that we have to sustain the, this momentum. So having said that, uh, uh, we, we uh, actually did a lot of uh, interventions for the city, which I'll come to it. So that's why I mentioned we have to sustain the momentum. And uh, we made, uh, during the pandemic, we made this very bold vision to make Mumbai the cycling capital of India by 2030. Uh, currently, we are 97th in this position. Let's look at current infrastructure, which if that's the timeline, this is how currently our infrastructure looks like uh, primarily, which we are sharing the road uh, with the motorized transportation. So this is the mode share. Uh, so when we talk about uh, investments, uh, you know, all of those uh, uh, investment which are going into coastal roads and metro and uh, public transportation and non-motorized transportation. This is the hard fact that 51% of Mumbaikers, they walk and cycle. Uh, where do you think? I mean, train, 25%. Uh, where is all the money going in? That's for that cars and the 2%. That's where all the infrastructure um, uh, investments are being made. Uh, so I'm just, I don't want to go much, much in it because Hussein has already explained uh, much in detail, but 51% is where most of the investments for Mumbai city should be going in because we have a lot of people walking first mile, last mile uh, for one, one kilometers or two kilometers. And each city has their own mode share. Um, some cities, it's, uh, uh, the cycle is 13% or 12% or 9%, but this is, this is the fact for Mumbai city. And the walk, non-walk trips are close to 22%. That means one to three kilometers is what people take their uh, shared mobility or their bike or their, uh, you know, their, their, their vehicle, their personal vehicle, which is close to 22%. And that's the kind of our carbon emissions. Which, so even if you look at this number, you know, as transport planners or urban planners in the city, this is the number if we are able to target, I think we, we've got a good story for our city. So let's look at uh, who are the people who cycle. Um, so clearly, um, this is the ground reality that we have the elite cyclists and you know, cycle being a very unique vehicle. Uh, we can use it for leisure, fitness, which most of them have actually picked up during uh, Corona because that was the easiest way for social distancing also. And uh, we have uh, people who take it for multi-day touring. Uh, people take it for endurance and competition. And, and uh, um, most important thing is that a lot of the people who have actually picked up a bicycle for cycle to work during a uh, pandemic because there was no um, there was no uh, public transportation which was there and cycle was the easiest way to travel from their home to office. And the hard facts. Hard facts is um, uh, Mumbai um, has uh, almost half of the population which will stay in slums. So just a thought, where should the focus lie? I mean, of course we have transportation as a bigger realm of the conversation which we are talking about. And uh, there are uh, people who are taking the public transportation. That's a huge number of uh, Mumbaikers. Uh, then uh, the car owners, then there are shared mobility or apps and uh, there are cyclists on uh, Mumbai roads. Now, what are those cyclists who are actually commuting? Uh, because uh, uh, urban cyclists and elite cyclists, they are the ones who are actually commuting in the morning uh, to, uh, to their, you know, for leisure or fitness or whatsoever. Every boy is your Swiggy, Zomato and all of them. Uh, I hope I am uh, audible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. 
So these are the ones uh, who are cycling. I we call them invisible cyclists, but actually they are not invisible. They are the visible cyclists for Mumbai City, and they have been cycling the length and breadth uh, since so many years in Mumbai. And I, I can probably say because I've been traveling across Mumbai quite a lot, and uh, we still they still exist for Mumbai City, and they form a very strong ecosystem which we need to nurture, because if we lose them. because of behavior change or you know this whole thing about cycle is a poor man vehicles we have lost the entire um, i would say the, the the whole mobility the green mobility for mumbai city so this particular um, bunch of uh, cycles the livelihood bicycles should be nurtured and should be should be brought in the forefront uh, when it comes when we think about uh, transportation and mobility for the city and they are half they are almost they live in slums half of mumbai mumbaikers live in slums and that's where our thought was that okay fine we have cycle to work for the elite and you know we started another movement for mumbai mumbaikers which is called me cycle rider where we donate old and new bicycles uh, currently uh, so we have pledged uh, to donate 1200 bicycles for the low income women we started this uh, pilot in k west ward where we are training the low income women uh, so it will be 50 numbers in each ward uh which means 24 wards which means 1200 uh, cyclists i am talking about women cyclists is where we are looking at uh women because i feel you know giving them the visibility is a bigger message uh, for us uh, in mumbai uh that's 1 lakh cyclists uh, if we really want uh, our, you know we want to really increase ridership Uh, for mumbai for mumbai city is 1 lakh is what we need to touch now it can happen in the urban poor settlements you can you know because because that's that's where the behavior change is not there i have spoken to as many um dabba walas and dood walas and all of that that, that there's tell me one problem which they which you face in mumbai kids in mumbai city all of them has the same same thing is about the uh road infrastructure no one spoke about humidity and you know the, the the traffic problem no one spoke about that yeah they had this problem of the pedestrians walking on the road rather than a pedestrian walking on the footpath but more of the more of them they mention about the road infrastructure so the game changer is where we came up as i mentioned that it's always a grassroots level work uh, uh, which we which needs needs to be put up uh, Yeah, in parallelly with uh, all the infrastructure, the software and you know the hardware needs to go hand in hand. Because even if the hardware is given to you, say tomorrow you have a cycle track at uh, Carter Road, and Carter Road cycle track which comes up, and if it's only utilized in the morning and evening, what happens during the day? Okay, it is underutilized. Now the only thing is to if a a a, a, a cycle track is being given to you and it's underutilized, the next thing the media starts writing about it is a failed project. so the green paint on the cycle track is never a fail project it uh, built a uh, build renewed or maybe uh, inclusive uh, ridership uh, for that particular cycle track uh we uh, in cycle chala city bacha because uh, that's the that's the campaign which we started during covid because to sustain the momentum which was created because of uh, the pandemic Uh, we uh, appointed 24 bicycle counselors uh, for mumbai for mumbai city each ward currently has a bicycle counselor of course uh, each counselor nurtures their ward ward uh, their individual wards uh, gives us a crowd source data for cycle stands uh, meet up with authorities locally if there's any problem of any cyclist within the ward uh immediately the counselor was any uh, that particular person cyclist emergency cyclist has been already been issued to all of the ward riders across mumbai so all of the work has been doing this lot and enough you can go to social media and have a look at all the work which we do in cycle chala city bacha uh these are the couple of ward rides so of course we have fun rides too we have the halloween rides and we have the valentines but uh, the most important thing is to get the community together and have a regular um uh, uh, regular ward rides so that uh, a kid or a woman who wants to be part of a group ride they are not alone so they are not riding alone at 6 o'clock or maybe at 5:30 then alone they are along, they are wrong with a group of cyclists uh, and keep the momentum going because we don't want after that pandemic gets over and everything that cycle will be used for drying clothes that's that's never the idea so we wanted to get into this so there's a constant uh, community engagement 
I mentioned about the me cycle rider of donating the bicycles. We've been doing it constantly with the urban poor kids and the women. This is the map of uh, a delivery boy who sells uh, agarbatti. Uh, it was very, very important for us to capture the data. This guy travels close to 30, 35 kilometers. Same goes with Swiggy Zomato. They travel to close to 60, 60 to 65, 70 kilometers. In some cases, I have met up with Swiggy uh, cyclists who travel about 100 kilometers in a day for doing the short distance uh, uh, deliveries uh, within the city. But that's a huge number. And I mean, how many, I mean, that's that's commuting. That's legit commute trips for Mumbaikers. And it's very, it was very important for us to capture it because this is what this is what will make, these are the routes which goes back to the authorities and say why this is the route which where the cycle track needs to come in. It's not only the route of Carter Road. It's not only the route of uh, Worley and C, Worley, uh, uh, you know, C phase. It's not the route of Marine Drive. That's not where, you know, it's it's okay. That's where the regular leisure cyclists go. But you know what happens to all the internal roads of Mumbai? That's the data which we wanted to capture and we we constantly do this uh, currently also with all the livelihood cyclists. Uh, donating the electric bicycle, in my uh, knowledge, it's going to be a big thing, big revolutionary uh, thought process. Uh, uh, and uh, we started off uh, donating, uh, we had an engagement with LS Raheja College and we donated electric vehicles to the sw one Swiggy and one Zomato cyclist. Uh, and also wanted to understand uh, how much jump in deliveries they could do and uh, co collect the data from them. Uh, Hussain has already mentioned the game changer plans. Yes, uh, there is this uh, cycle track which is coming along the pipeline and some projects which are cropping up in the city. Uh, but do we look at uh, this cut pace cycle track which is coming in? Because again, it goes into the leisure spaces, which is fine because uh, at least there's some kind of cycling conversation which is happening uh, along maybe a pipeline or maybe a cycle track which is coming in the low peril area or, or Mahalakshmi area or all of the, the those. But my problem is, again, it comes to the same thing. What happens if it is underutilized? Do we say, again, it's a failed project like BKC? Uh, so, again, it's the same thing. It's just a matter of balancing between the hardware and software. The need of the hour currently because of the momentum and we are we are actually uh, in co conversation with uh, the local uh, uh, MCGM for this 600 cycles track because we have the data which was given by the councillors. Uh, need of the hour because you now there is this whole momentum and there is we don't have a cycle stand. That's a basic necessity of the city. And I have seen enough of the cyclists, even the uh, delivery boys, um, enough tying their cycles to electric pole or some railing and all of that but that's not what transportation is all about that's not about our architect mind thinking that oh this is not this is not what i thought this is, this is not what i learned in my space of architecture i am going to be the change maker for my city i am going to even even if thought think about cycle stands I mean, make an innovation cycle stand for the city and give it to the city uh, I did mention about comprehensive network plan. Uh, very, very important. Even if we talk about 24 wards, even if one ward has put a thought in mind, you know what, let's have a comprehensive network plan, a proper cycle network plan for one ward. Maybe take it take it like a H West, uh, but let's think about it or to put up a cycle network plan because that's where a lot of work in it. It's not going to be easy. Uh, you know, a lot of junctions and where where the cycle track can come in, there would be a shared space, there would be a, a cycle track, uh, individual cycle track, but all of that needs to be worked with because um, looking at the dynamics of Mumbai, each ward is different. Each ward is a city by itself. Uh, we have uh, the arterial roads, we have the highways, we have the narrow by lanes in, uh, in Bandra. How are we going to share it? What are the signages going to be out there? Uh, all of it constitutes uh, being a part of the cycle network plan. Uh, this is my this is my team. Uh, we have uh, Zora and everybody has got the expertise. And of course, we have collaborated with Studio Pod and uh, uh, various other organizations in this space uh, because I believe it's all about collective voice, and we all need to come together. Um, Rizvi College has been working very closely with Minaz and uh, Nikita. Nikita is a bicycle counselor of HOS Ward. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, happy and thanks for giving us this opportunity uh, to share our thoughts uh, on transport and mobility.
thank you very much uh, Rosa. It was uh, very insightful i would say uh, although very uh, close to us but uh, you know you just made us aware of certain things which probably you know uh, i would say enlighten in a sense so thanks for your presentation um, we move to our next uh, presenter uh, let me welcome uh, stalin sir uh, Stalin sir is, uh, is a conservationist uh, who is affiliated to a Mumbai-based environmental NGO called One Shakti. Uh, he's a chemistry graduate uh, uh, and has a postgraduate diploma in business management and also uh, has done a diploma in travel and tourism. Uh, his passion for environmental protection and conservation has uh, has been uh, resulted to a lot of success stories. Um, these predominantly include, uh, you know, uh, his efforts to uh, uh, maintaining the wildlife corridors of uh, Western Ghats uh, in in Maharashtra, uh, which were which were which would have otherwise fallen prey to uh, destruction uh, due to mining. Uh, his uh, his efforts for wetlands in Maharashtra, protecting the mangroves, especially in the Thane Creek, and and Sivri is is uh, is commendable. Uh, and also been documented, I would say. Uh, he has uh, he has uh, put efforts to save around three thousand trees from being cut uh, for a road widening project in in Wadala. Um, in RA, for example, his his work has been um, commendable. He has been um, uh, he has been instrumental in keeping RA as as what it is uh, right now. Um, the the Thane Creek uh, flamingo sanctuary has been, uh, I would say, uh, a, you know, a, a great feather in in, in cap. Um, these are these are just just some projects of his of his credentials and and uh, his uh, his uh, his accolades. Um, I I welcome sir. Uh, I welcome you, sir, to uh, to this forum, and uh, I would I would like you to take up the the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, college and principal, for having me over to talk to the students. Uh, it was very interesting to hear the previous speakers, and I, I was also impressed very much by Hussein's hard data, which he has collected, and. Uh, also about the cycle track, which was mentioned about costing three hundred crores. Actually, that is a complete disaster. It's it's absolutely a waste of money because there is already a road which brings which is, can be used for cyclists exclusively. But still, they, there has been an attempt to blast the hills, they, and they have blasted hills, reclaimed the forest areas, cut the trees, uh, quarried. Everything has been done just to make a cycle track, and that cycle track is actually a DP road. It is being masqueraded as a cycle track, but it's a DP road in reality. So when there was already a cycle track existing, uh, a government has gone up into a new track uh, and they have given it a very convenient name, green wheels along blue lines. Now it's a very fashionable thing to do, put the word green and everything gets washed away. It's like the, the proverbial Ganga gel where you can just put, sprinkle a few drops and you're pure. So that kind of an attitude has come in, but uh, definitely the need is for cycles to increase on the road and people need to look for more eco-friendly modes of transport. Uh, well, uh, my earlier speakers have uh, very correctly and very clearly shown the data and the need for it. I will share my experiences uh, during the course of this presentation. Uh, you mentioned RA. Now, RA is a historic battle. I was just part of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a complete uh, unique phenomenon. It's a, it's history now. It's made its way into the history books. Citizens coming together to save forests and getting about 850 acres at one shot inside a city like Mumbai, which is which is a battle zone for real estate uh, sharks. To get 850 acres out into a forest and notified as a forest is, is a good achievement. And of course, the fight continues because we still need to move that uh, accursed or uh, godforsaken car shed out of RA. Uh, that is another uh, hard battle which we are still fighting. Uh, we'll go into my experiences. Uh, I can share screen, I guess. Na? So I'll okay, once again I'll share some. Please tell me if my screen is visible. It's visible now, sir. Yeah. So I can go into full screen now. It's ready. 
Uh, is it full screen? No, not yet. You might want to exit full screen, you say? No, top right corner. It says my screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Okay. But when I go into full screen. <laughs> this is visible, I guess, right? Yeah, it's visible now. Is it full screen or it's still in the? Uh, no, it's not full screen. I guess you uh, will have to go to top right for that and make it full screen. Top right of the Zoom thing? Uh, no. Uh, On my slides, before that yeah. when, when I did that, the, uh, it's, it's okay. Because when I do that, it says it pauses. Then that should be okay. Uh, you can share your whole. You can share your whole screen, please, so that whatever is there on the screen will be visible in that case. Is it seen now? Not in full screen, but. That's okay. I think they've instead of wasting. Yeah, that is okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we are here to talk about environment, transport, and sustainability. Um, a little about the work that Manishakti does. Let's have the next slide. We are working in the field for conserv of conservation for over a decade now. We have been instrumental in protection of wetlands, rivers, forests, mangroves, wildlife corridors. Uh, we conduct educational programs for educational institutions. We also do ground interventions for restoration of ecology. We promote livelihoods for forest dependent communities. We help take their help uh, to enlist their cooperation to prevent forest fires and to go into sustainable methods of living in forests. We have filed over 30 PILs for various purposes. And that's what keeps us in the news actually. Though we have a lot, of, we have a small team. It does a tremendous work outside litigation also. You may visit the vanashakti.in website or the vanashakti social media pages FB, uh, and then get more information about it. Now, this screen, uh, maybe your students can take a snapshot of the screen and ask more about a detail. Each case is a one hour uh, discussion. It's worth one hour of discussion. So these are 30 PILs, which are in various codes. And there are many smaller PILs inside these ones. Also, I mean, smaller applications called intervention applications, in interlocutory applications, etc. So it becomes very difficult to explain all of this in one uh, session. So maybe if anyone, any student wants to know more about any of these matters, they are free to connect with me on these issues. Now we go about, we are talking about transport infrastructure projects. Let's take some examples, the coastal road, the metro three project, there's the Uran railway, there is the Vada road widening and the Ghorbanda road widening. I'll be talking about these projects and how uh, they are good or bad or what's wrong with it, those things. Now, uh, when we talk of the coastal road, it basically is a unique selling proposition is that so what to suburbs in 30 minutes. So what uh, ideally takes one and a half to two hours, they're saying you'll cross it in 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes sounds very good and uh, very attractive also, but how is it supposed to be done? If you see way back in 2011, there was an application by MSRDC for the same road. And they applied to the Maharashtra Coastal Zone Management Authority saying that we need permission. So the authority said that as per the notification, CRZ notification, only a road on stilts is permissible. The road on reclamation is not permissible except at landing points or constructing the stilts. So, so the authority decided to request MOEF to allow the roads on reclamation as a special case for Mumbai. Roads on reclamation only for making the stilts to ease the traffic related problems, et cetera. At that time when this application was made, MSRDC said that if you reclaim the coast, it will, uh, it will, cost, it will uh, cause coastal erosion, it will destroy the marine ecology, it will increase flooding, all these things they said. And so the permissions originally were sought for making it on stilts. 
Now suddenly, in, way back in uh, when you see it in 2017, it, it's a complete U-turn. Now it became a project on reclamation, and the very same arguments were turned on its head that it is cost-effective to make it on reclamation. Reclamation is more stable; it will protect the coast from erosion. In fact, a complete U-turn. There is absolutely no logic in what was being said. Now even that was accepted. So when this matter uh, took a turn and went to the High Court, the High Court correctly observed that it is a land creation project; it's not a transport project. Because very simply said, for 20 hectares of road, you are trying to reclaim 110 hectares of land, of the sea rather. You are taking the sea, 110 hectares of the sea was sought to be reclaimed. Now, how could this be a transport project? Now, what were the casualties? Some of the casualties. How many of us know that there are such beautiful corals on the coast of Mumbai? And the, the presence of these corals were also hidden. It was never said that coral sites would be destroyed, it would be reclaimed, intertidal biodiversity would be disturbed. Nothing, 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 nothing of that kind. Uh, it was left to uh, Saga Shakti, a division of One Shakti, along with Marine Life of Mumbai, who documented these corals, and then we brought it out in public domain, and we put it before the court also, and to which a very leading scientific institution combated us, saying that, no, there is no such corals here. And then when we showed the photograph, then they turned around and said, no, there are no reef building corals here. Then we had to show them reef building corals, and finally they admitted that there are corals. And based on that, the High Court ordered that there should be a relocation plan, a mitigation plan, and all these aspects should have been thought of before the project started. Now, like Hussein correctly said, that the onus of proving that a project is not environmentally destructive lies on the project proponent and not on us who are trying to save it. Now, every time you go to court, you are put in the dock and you've been asked questions, you have to explain why it is destructive. Now, the resources are with the planning agencies, the executing agencies, and we as an NGO are expected or as citizens are expected to go and do a research and then bring out the findings. Now, that was very ridiculous thing to do. Now, what is the consequences of this to the city? We will lose our coastline, we'll lose our corals. Even today, if you see the co corals cannot be completely restored back where it was. There is an increased risk of flooding, the beaches are going underwater, we are lost bird habitat, now, when you talk of bird habitat, the explanation given uh, for reclamation uh, and the impact of it on the bird habitat was that the feeding grounds of birds are being taken away, but you will give them roosting sites. Now, it, it's, it's a complete, mis what you call it, it's a completely distorted idea of conservation. When you say you're taking away the feeding area of a bird and saying, I'm giving it a place to stand. Why will it stand there if there's no food there? It's not, birds don't go there for a walk and take a recreational stroll. Did you understand that? Loss of intertidal biodiversity, loss of livelihoods of the fishermen. The fishermen found their access being blocked and their livelihoods impacted. The fishing areas taken away. The artisan fishermen were the hardest hit. Now, all these things were, should have been factored into the project planning itself, but nothing. But then finally, when the work started at breakneck speed, what could citizens do? They had to file court cases, which was done. Now, court cases were about six cases which were filed. Uh, with the worldly fishermen, then um, these, these breach candy residents, Vanashakti, Conservation Action Trust, Shweta Vag, and uh, Lakshman, uh, Prakash Lakshman's petition, all the six petitions which were, and all of these petitions said that this is not right, what is being done is environmentally destructive, it's impacting livelihoods, all those issues were put before the court. And the High Court correctly observed that this is not a transportation project, don't give us this rubbish. And But immediately they after that judgment was passed, the corporation who was building the road rushed to the Supreme Court. They managed to get a stay on the court order, high court order. And what's worse, then it went to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court said, okay, fine, go ahead, no problem. Now, the Supreme Court says, go ahead, you can reclaim the land. But interestingly, it says that, uh, but it will be subject to the orders of the coast. The natural rock formation which kept the areas like early sea phase intact, after blasting them, after removing them, flattening them, what kind of natural barriers will you recreate? Now, it is it is a complete absence or connect with science when these orders are kind of orders are passed. But what can we do? It's the apex code of the land. We need to respect its uh, decisions. Now, can the damage be undone? No. Could there be a better way to execute the project? Yes. Now, how, like I asked you, how will the court ensure that the natural contours of the coastline and the ecology will be restored? Is it possible? No. The damage is permanent. So let's go to the next one, Metro 3, Kolaba Seeps Metro. Now, ideally, this is shown as a very big, uh, glamorous, uh, a, a much needed project, which will, which will ease the transport issues of Mumbai. Like Hussein correctly said, 
uh, I would put it in a but in a one sentence that if the coastal road is supposed to um, reduce traffic, but it is actually bringing more cars in, and the metro says it will take cars off the road. So here you are just playing around with words. There is no logic to what is being done here. According to me, this project competes with the Western Railway, and there are solutions in the Western Railway which can which which will show that there is no need for this metro here. But since it's a modern way of transport, people like to be updated, or it is a need of the hour that Mumbai stands on par with the other cities of the world. So we won't go into that. It's a very controversial project, and this is one which has faced the maximum resistance in any urban areas. Now, the, what was the reason for the resistance? Uh, few people opposed the metro, but we, as a Sevari movement, we always opposed. the location of the car shed the metro service center inside a forest there was no need for it there is no need for a station inside ra we still firm on it that we do not want any of these things inside ra there are many barren sites there were alternatives where this car shed or the service center could have been located but they refused stubbornly refused and refused to talk to citizens they had no dialogue finally it became a monumental a long prolonged battle between citizens and the government and finally somehow by whatever you call it a uh, fate a uh, twist of fate the government changed and a ra which was denied as being a forest in fact in the supreme court also the government and mmrda or mmrcl uh, filed affidavit saying that there is nothing which resembles a forest in ra it is full of slums and settlements and uh, government institutions from that to get 850 acres at one shot that is the first starting point a small victory for the citizens bigger battles are remain ahead but it remain the fact remains that a destructive project was sought to be brought into a forest the project part of it the service center part of it now we spoke about the wada road widening in my introduction i was told now this is a very classic example which uh, i always feel that it was a monumental blunder on the part of the government agencies now there was a road which is sought to be widened this is road uh, it's along the gujarat highway it starts from chilsat fata and goes up to ambadi in on bhiwandi side now the plan was very simple just remove 3000 trees on both sides of the road the road will be wide now we wondered what what kind of logic is this how how can you do this so we had to move court after pleading with them to stop it this is a photograph of the road and most of the road is like this these are banyan trees mango trees all beautiful trees along the road it passes through the pilgrim towns of uh, ganeshpuri and vajreshwari so this these trees actually were uh, meant for what they call it had a religious and spiritual connect also for the people who use this road it led to the temple towns there um, now when you look at this um, project it says just remove both the uh, trees and then we can asphalt the sides of the road and then it will be big enough so we wondered because this road we have traveled it we have a team working in wada we, and we did a study to understand why this road was being widened and what is traffic load on this we found that there were hardly any uh, uh, what do you call that volume of traffic was very small on this road and we also went into the accidents which have happened on this road even those were very minimal very minimal so we said there is something wrong now what is the justification now if you look at this slide i'll try and move it up a little yes if you see this is shirsat fada on the gujarat highway this is ambadi naka near bhiwandi and this is kapur baudi in thane the justification given was that when you widen this road here which is 43 kilometers from this junction the traffic here will be reduced now that kind of absurd arguments where logic was given and so we then went ahead and we did a survey of the toll collections which was done here we found out how what was the toll being connected on this wada manor highway which was supposed to be having so much of traffic and we found that the toll books were running in losses and they have shut down now so it was completely a misconceived idea maybe for whatever reason someone wanted to make money or what we don't know but we managed to try and stop it we tried we did stop it we took it to court we went to court and explained these issues and the honorable high court of bombay was pleased to stop the spelling of these trees the battle continued for almost 2 years and then finally mmrda relented they said yes we are not interested in widening this road we are okay with it and it has been uh, almost now say 6 uh, years but the roads have still been the same there is no issues there the environment is safe it falls in the eco sensitive zone absolutely no problem so a needless destruction was successfully averted now we go to uran uran if you look at the history of uran over the last decade it is one of the biggest and site of the one of biggest environmental crimes in india today thousands and thousands of acres of beautiful wetlands 
wetlands which had millions of birds anyone who wanted to learn birding was directed to uran earlier but today even you see there are roads railways godowns everything coming up in crz wetlands everything is being made inside that we documented some of it we are in court with it we have raised the supreme court on these issues uh, we hope to save something and panja is one such example where a concerted effort by different individuals has managed to save a wetland for the time being at least now this is a place called jasai you can see how the birds are feeding there and the reclamation is underway behind and this continued and even as we pleaded with the courts to intervene we couldn't get a hearing they somehow said no no it's not so serious but we couldn't do a beyond pleading but what results today is this is what is standing there the water body the lake is completely gone the wetland has vanished and it is flattened now tell me couldn't you locate any kind of logistic facility somewhere else or a bus depot or a transport structure in uh, depot somewhere else it was very much possible now even today if you look uran is a history uh, where uh, what you call the environmental pattern is from the wetland to a dust bowl there is so much of dust in uran today that you won't believe it was a wetland and today coastal villages are getting flooded and why railways are being made and how are they being made on 5 meter landfills 5 meter landfills and all the low lying areas are getting submerged or inundated and the water is not doesn't have space to disperse it is being blocked and sent into villages now when the villages protest then they will say we have to make more do more reclamation more constructions so it's a cycle which has been set off in uran and we we trying to fight it tooth and nail now ngt has passed certain orders saying that no stoppage of apply of tide water etc let's see how it phases out now now these are stories where things are gone bad whether these things could be avoided now the ghorbandar road which again connects from thane to vasai creek uh it is seeing very heavy traffic on it there is no doubt that the road needs some kind of intervention to help the traffic move more smoothly so there was a proposal to to make a wider road now making the road wider meant that you would take away uh, the areas of the sanjay gandhi national park so the wildlife board said no you have to make it elevated so then they decided that a 3 km stretch or 2 and 1/2 km stretch would be elevated and that would have underpasses for wildlife so that is one way and this cost of this 2 3 km road 2.5 km road is about 700 crores so the money is there to be spent if you can protect environment and mitigate the impact on wildlife maybe that's the way forward we, sh we should be taking now we need to ask ourselves these questions could these projects have been executed better why is the cumulative damage to ecosystems not assessed prior to the projects being started and why are simple solutions being ignored how long will we provide more roads for private cars while killing public transport at the same time now when i said talked about the metro 3 what was easier was it easier to run trains at 3 minute intervals from church gate to virar that deaths maximum deaths of people falling from trains is from borivili to virar so you need to have end to end trains running at 3 minute intervals and that is that is the least you can do once a person who is trying to hang out of the train or putting his life at his or her life at risk sees that there is a train which is coming in 3 minutes time they will pause and eventually the crowd will also reduce but here you have trains which have one in 15 minutes one in 20 minutes and you have shorter routes in between so people don't really get that train is they want and the population the working population has shifted from out of mumbai suburbs it's gone into the virar mirabandar those areas so we instead of giving dedicated bus lanes and running trains with more frequencies the mega projects are taken and every time it is like uh, people's money are, is being taken away telling them that it is for your good but actually the private car owners are the beneficiaries of all these activities now what what is the problem with this the entire process is flawed how do you get the permissions see what happens is the urban development de department uh, envisages this project and then it goes ahead and uh, pro proposes it makes a plan everything and it runs through the checks and balances which they have to do and finally you it reaches the environment department now the environment department i would say it's almost a toothless body they cannot challenge the urban development department because in the moment they do that they will be hauled up and as who has to stop this project you are stopping development all those things so the pro process itself is flawed where the environmental issues are addressed last and if they are not addressed then citizens have got to fight for it now we need a stronger legislation and guidelines or the process itself has to be reversed 
that when you conceive a project, first send it to the environment department and say, this is what we've conceived. Is this okay? Will it run into problems? Then those problems should be addressed first before moving ahead. Now here, people's opinion is never sought at any stage. It's always the case you take it or leave it. This is what we brought for you. You take it or you just go your way. So people are not involved in the entire process. So we need to have that change that people should ask what they want. A person who is trying to reach home and risking his life, he needs immediate relief, not something which will come three years later and hope that he will survive this entire three years and hope to be on a metro train which will take him home. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. So, thank you very much, sir, for uh, your presentation. It was uh, it was really um, it it really helps us understand what's going around as far as the the environment of the city is concerned. Although we keep reading it in newspapers, but uh, I think uh, it was it was very uh, in detail that we could we could understand these situations. Um, I think uh, I would just open this forum for questions, if any, and uh, would like the students, uh, other participants also to contribute if they have any questions. Yeah, the students can drop their questions in the Q&A box and then the moderators will take the discussion forward. Okay, before the students uh, start asking question, I want to congratulate Firoza for her wonderful initiative for Thank making so much. Yeah, and at least Mumbai has started taking baby steps. So we have to go miles ahead, but at least some by baby steps have started. But Mumbai is very hostile city for cycles. I have experienced like in uh, say Europe or Netherlands, you have infrastructure everywhere and you don't even feel bother any botheration for cycling. But here, right from your home, if you are not staying on the ground floor and if you are staying in a tall building, the lift size is the issue, an issue. Then if you have staircase, how if you cannot, you, you, if you don't have a lift and you have to take staircase, then how you are going to take the cycle down the staircase? In Netherlands, they have the system kind of railing, like a small ramp in every staircase where you can take your cycle down. So you can walk down the stairs and then that small ramp, which is there on one edge, you can take your cycle down. So similarly, everything in urban realm also, this kind of infrastructure is there. So is there like you are, you are talking about manifesto. So is there any manifesto for the cycling, which is in place at this moment? That what kind of infrastructure, what kind of guideline has to be right from architecture to urban spaces and the roads, what infrastructure is needed that Systematic study. So, uh, rightly mentioned, um, you know, because we worked in the grassroots work, and uh, I've been actually visiting a lot of societies and corporates, and uh, corporates being, uh, you know, the safety is always a concern uh, for most of the uh, HR. Uh, you know, when they tell, when we when we go up to them and say, okay, fine, you know, why don't your employees cycle to work even for a short distance? Though they have the corporate engagement programs where they tell us to put up a small cycle ride for the employees, but when it comes to actually the uh, you know the commuting aspect, that's that's where they say the statistics. Uh, I'll just come to the statistics when it comes to fatalities of cyclists. Most of the uh, cyclists uh, have ha either had uh, an accident or have you know they have lost their life is during the leisure space. It's never happened in the commute space. Uh, commute space because the average traffic uh, is about you know do, prior the pandemic I'm talking about used to be about 10 kilometers you know that's that's how the the, the traffic was it was pretty pretty slow uh, but having said that the leisure space is because the roads are empty every motorist or a biker feels that they own the road and the the, the, the two people who are you know uh, susceptible to all of this is the pedestrian and the cyclist where they are actually sharing the road with them and um, yeah, so this is one area which uh, is a major concern because we've lost a lot of cyclists recently due to uh, the road, uh, 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 you know, the traffics and the, the, the accidents and all of that. A second point which you mentioned about uh, the cycling being 
you know because we all stay in a in in societies and all of that yeah that's a that's a major concern uh you know i did have that concern when i used to cycle to work and i had to take my bicycle to my office which was on the uh, second floor uh had to invest in a folding bicycle because there was no parking facilities also for my bicycle below my building yet there are all of these problems we also try to speak to a lot of commercial hubs so uh, within uh, you know we say worli area or andheri east or low parel we spoke to a lot of those hubs for example india bulls we said okay fine there are all these cyclists who are coming in this particular hub is there any way we can uh have a small space within your commercial hub to put uh, to park those bicycles because um uh, what we realized that there are a lot of cyclists who invest in very expensive bicycles so there are cycle cyclists who have cycle for about 35 40000 and then carbon bicycles for about uh, 1 lakh where would they park their bicycle because they are very protected about them and this is uh, this is because you know, the brand conscious cyclists and everything but when you say the cut cut pace when you come to amsterdam amsterdam it's become a way of life they are not bothered about what brand of bicycle they are riding and all of that they just want to ride their bicycle from point a to point b so this um you know there are all these solution the urban problems and the solution you can say a cut pace model ke amsterdam's cut cut sorry i am not able to hear firoza you can work in mumbai you have to come up with local solutions over here and i you can hear me uh, yeah you can hear me now so i think most important yeah so the most important is i guess is the uh, local solutions uh, which we really need to think about even the compliances which you mentioned about having a ramp uh, we need to have ramps if we are talking about picking your bicycle and going to a metro then definitely you need to have ram otherwise i have to pick up my regular bicycles in i am currently in kochi city uh, uh, cycles are allowed in uh, the metros whereas when you talk about mumbai they only allow a folding bicycle we can't take a regular size bicycle uh, into the metro though in you know all that thing was revealed that when narendra modi sir had come and you know cycles will be allowed in the metro and everything but that's all a good photo ops when it comes to reality there's always a fight uh, to uh, get uh, the demands which we actually make uh, to the local authorities out here so yeah it's it's a lot of work uh, uh, i that's where i mentioned the young minds really do need to come together and um, put up a really good manifesto for the city and it, the time has come for that yeah thank you firoza thank you so much uh, we, do we have uh, students question suti um not as yet so okay i i had one question so we are talking of uh, you know like a very interesting uh, lookout one is environment one is looking at you know bicycling and uh, look at i actually i was very surprised to read in two presentations that 50% of the people still are walking and cycling you know so where are these 50% people going you know so very very interesting so uh, when we are also looking at mega projects we are looking at large projects coastal road project mthl and all so can we look at integrating these ideas of say public transportation uh, dedicated bus lanes or even uh, say the rail uh, network or bicycle lanes into these and what is is it is it being done or is it something that can be looked into because we are already constructing all of these roads which are going to be fast corridors and uh, if if it has to happen can it actually and i think there's a lot of scope for incorporating this into it so are we really talking about it or is there something being done about it and uh, like to know your views on that or uh, this is for who said you want to take this uh, it, it's uh, for yeah, everyone okay. <laughs> yeah okay um, um if uh, unless somebody else wants to go first uh no no please go so, okay no so i think um, it, you know in a way these projects look like they are all coming from uh, they are all separate and they are separate in terms of the planning agencies uh, the kind of clearances and permissions that they need and so on but if you look at let's say the comprehensive transport plan of 2008 <clears throat> many of these projects are there uh now it's not that these uh, you know these kind of uh, comprehensive plans are uh, um always say the same thing uh, for instance in 1994 uh, 
uh, Atkins, which is a British uh, transport uh, consultancy, had prepared a transportation plan for MMR. And their uh, recommendations were very different from the 2008 CTS. The 2008 CTS was funded by the World Bank. The 1994 Atkins was earlier where they spoke about uh, not building any new freeways or road links in Mumbai in the north-south direction. They said, if you want to create road space, you only create it in the east-west direction to improve east-west connectivity. They have suggested that you connect a full up, you know, um, PT with the church gate station, improve um, suburban rail, you know, all of that. Basically, public transport, pro public transport orientation. And they also said that you have congestion pricing and all that. So it came more from the kind of a London experience rather than the American experience. You know, the 2008 CTS is very much modeled on the American uh, city. So, um, which is, you know, oriented more towards the car, uh, car, four uh, wheelers. So, um, yeah, now these other things that are happening, like the bicycle track and so on, they're, you know, they're kind of like showpiece projects. They're like uh, to establish a certain kind of uh, environmentally friendly credentials of a particular government and so on. Um, earlier, when they started the green wheels along blue lines, it was, uh, you know, almost a way of uh, removing slum dwellers from uh, along the pipeline. That was the intention. Now it is kind of, you know, being spoken about more as a green uh, project for cyclists and uh, for the environment and so on. So they also, you, even the way in which these projects are sold keeps changing. You know, it's not the same all the time. So one has to watch out for that. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to these large projects, they're kind of, uh, at least conceptually, they are tied together. They're not very, uh, uh, they're not uh, conceptually not very separate from each other. It's not like they're not thought about together. They are. There is a design, a larger design at play, but we tend to experience them more as single projects by different agencies and different DPRs. Uh, my take is that uh, why why a coastal road? Um, I think we have enough uh, um, existing infrastructure to be utilized, specifically in the space of uh, public transportation. Uh, I think that's where uh, this particular budget should have been directed. Um, coastal road is definitely for, again, the elite. Uh, do, we really, do we really require that kind of uh, budgets to go, go out there for those uh, more transportation of 2 to 3%? Um, if they could have directed that uh, to the Western or Central Railway and improve that situation out there, uh, which is much needed. Uh, you know, they, they talk about uh, double-deckers coming in, the, in, the, in, 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 uh, in, I'm talking about the trains. Uh, uh, it's, it's good to hear all of that, you know, it feels wow. I mean, it's, but when, what is the timeline? Every project uh, just kinds of, okay, there's a 300 crore cycle track uh, coming up. There's, there's, there's no definite timelines. We get momentarily, you know, the cycling community celebrates momentarily, oh, fine, we, we're getting this. Again, if we talk about coastal grid and we're talking about the cycle track out there, uh, even C-Link had promised, if I, if, you know, Stalin and everybody, I think they had kind of had this conversation, there would be, but eventually, because of whatever the, 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 the there's too much of pressure of, you know, all of that, they kind of, uh, but now again, the coastal road, they're saying that between the coastal roads, wherever there is this land grab, which has happened, uh, that probably out there in the beautiful parks uh, and those the sit out areas, that's where probably the cycle track could possibly be integrated and I guess uh, one of the R uh, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to the local authorities. Now how much of that is going to be consumed and uh, how much of that is going to be uh, actually uh, you know kind of implemented is something which is which is very difficult because as all us you know as, as I said we are Indian to be the flag bearers we've got that limitation that this is how much we can actually uh, uh, voice ourselves. Uh, beyond that, everybody needs to work uh, somewhere closely with the. I think the coastal road is not required for the city. As cyclists, I enjoy the contours of Mumbai, whether I go to a heritage site or a fort or forest or my rivers. I really wish that they invest in waterways 
you know, during British, uh, all of those six or seven or four of those waterways were utilized uh, for internal transportation. Why aren't we using those now? The conversation has started of waterways, but why? Why can't? Why? Why don't we use it? Uh, I am Kochi city currently uh, the, the the third river. And there's so much of so much of uh, you know the local authorities. We put in the thought process of utilizing the existing ecosystem rather than damaging our environmental uh, fronts and. Uh, dim damaging because primarily we have the four months of rain and maybe we should uh, have a what do you call a commitment for every infrastructure surface road projects to have a dedicated uh, safe cycle track if that is built into every planning authorities uh, works maybe then we can have this concept of more and more people cycling uh, because in in the city like Mumbai, that safety is the biggest thing that is keeping people away. And if you have a protected cycle lane which assures you that there's no accident going to happen, I'm sure more and more people will take to cycling and try and cover those distances. So we need that provision to be built into the system that if it's a new road or whatever it is, you have to first create that cycle lane which is protected. And then maybe we can go ahead. It will require a little money, but that's okay. In the longer, nothing is more precious than the lives of citizens. We can spend that kind of money. I'll just add to what uh, Stalin had mentioned about cycle tracks. So there was a time when Mr. Uh, Prabhin Pardesi was a municipal corporation um, head and uh, we had proposed because, you know, me and Zohara, who's a transport planner, we, we really work together. And my conversation, whatever, and I'm able to understand in the urban planning realm is thanks to Zohara. And having uh, traveled to uh, Amsterdam and Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil, um, what I uh, really saw was the median cycle track. Uh, just a thought, because there are you know kids out here who are in the space of learning, you know, architecture and urban planning and all of that. Just the thought that the best way for Mumbai to travel on a bicycle is the median cycle track. If we are able to have it in middle of the road, of course there is a lot of junction management which happens, but it is it is a design solution. Uh, where the where the planters, which are in any case, you know, not kept in Mumbai city, it could be flushed down. And we had given this idea to uh, Mr. Pravin Pardesi that metro start with below the metro, the left and side, left left and right hand side of the metro flush down. We do not require the planters because it's planter is just about one month before just the inauguration which happens. It's kept properly and after that it goes to drugs because they look for private parties to manage those planters after that. Uh, so uh, yeah, the median cycle track is what had proposed. Uh, I think it's the game changer uh, rather than focusing on the left and side, left and right hand side of the road uh, because uh, there is encroachment, uh, there is uh, your bus stops, uh, there is uh, pedestrians. If they don't have footpath, they are on, on the roads. So uh, median cycle track is something uh, which is which, which could be possible uh, probably work out in some parts of uh, the city i had a question uh, for Stalin. so i mean uh, your work is really staggering i mean i we can see you as like a city vigilante who's out there you know bringing about real change and, uh, you know, through your presentation, we understood the kind of, you know, roadblocks that uh, you have to face all the time. But uh, my question is about uh, the other side that where do you find support? Uh, like you said that, you know, many of these uh, missions were uh, like a group of people coming together. So how, how do you mobilize support? Where does it, what quarters of the city does it come from? And how can we ensure that this kind of support keeps growing? See, support hasn't come in except for RA, I would say. That's because RA resonated with every Mumbaiker. Now, when you talk of something in Uran, the villagers there don't have the kind of social media presence or influencing here. And all other like Western Guards also. If you go and see what is happening in the Western Guards, it's horrendous. Uh, we've uh, actually, um, support in the sense, we have certain good well-wishers who help us with limited funding for these projects or whatever we undertake. Money is a big challenge always, that pulls us back. And uh, we don't get really the kind of support that we should get from the people 
in the cities also because i have seen one thing that beyond sitting on whatsapp and becoming intellectual expert uh, discussions and all kinds of venting happens on on social media but when it comes to the ground you hardly find people who are willing to put their um, what you call presence where their mouths are that doesn't happen but having said that there is greater awareness on environmental issues because of the social media presence of the youngsters and now it is becoming a little fashionable or metal important for this youngsters to talk about it we don't get support i would say that is a big challenge overcoming that is a big challenge because every time this new issue comes up before you you first thing you scratch is that how do you go for this now how do i approach this where is the money going to come from where will the data come from because each of these 30 cases has extensive research i i this is it, it takes away all your bandwidth you don't have any personal life you don't have any kind of breathing space your organization is always under pressure your life is under threat all these things continue but someone has to do it so we do it and and now we find that uh, what we do is we encourage the instead of getting support we are trying to support people who are willing to take up battles okay when they want to do something we tell them okay you do it this 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 is the way you have to do it you will succeed this is the best chance for you to succeed we will help you with the uh, knowledge we have gained over the years so but if for us it's a lone battle it's continuous that way Have we have any questions from the students? Us, I have a question for Stalin. Please, hello. Yeah, yeah. Please yeah, you were talking about the metro as well as the local, which is like north south in Mumbai, and you you were saying that they could have augmented the local railway line instead of having metro, and why they didn't think about it? The problem is when you are talking about the uh, metro. it is under the state government under urban development department when you talk about the railway projects they are under the ministry of railways and every infrastructure project however small it is it is a huge asset financially also and real estate wise also so it's a huge asset and everyone want to control that asset, asset because there is the political power to control that thing and uh, when you are talking about Uh, when uh, central ministry is uh, controlling that railway line then obviously state government will want some asset that they can control it so i think they, this is the problem of their jurisdiction as well as the governance so how do you uh, see how how the solution can be found out for this political problem more than infrastructure problem because mm -hmm. it, it may be obvious for us ki why they have not augmented it but they have not So no, now we had this discussion in the Saint Xavier's College, uh, where the chairman of MMRD was also present. So I asked him these questions in front of the students, and he said, "We are doing all of this, but we will do it after the metro projects are completed." He said it very candidly. Okay, and uh, that's the approach. Now it's not the case that all the projects. Now, for example, MMRCL is also you know, subsidized, or uh, there is a partnership. The stakeholder is also the central government in it. and now you have hit the nail on the head the entire fault lies in this political system politics today is the art of survival and staying relevant to stay relevant you need money how does the money come by doing all this kind of uh, ill ill conceived ideas executing them helps you get that money so unless that culture changes we have sent these people to power we can't uh, blame anyone now so we have to change that so we are going into a very deep discussion of kind of people who go there so when you talk of mumbai you should have someone who will speak for mumbai what does it cost to the representatives of mumbai the elected representative to ask for a train every 3 minutes nothing why don't you walk down to the central see it doesn't require special tracks you are just asking for it to go from end to end so this is something which can be easily done but they don't want to what is in it for them so we have to make these issues count in public eyes and where people really make it election issues then things will change then you will find central government also coming to uh, now if you start shaming the central government for not listening to the needs of the mumbai people they will automatically come because their party is also here so citizens will have to demonstrate that they have the power to pull down a government if they want to but right now we are all scattered everywhere we are more interested in you know like uh, whatsapp discussions salim you stand for mla we'll all uh, 
good no. for you <laughs> you have my vote at least <laughs> i'm honored but no thank you <laughs> no, we need we need people like you seriously no, sir the passionate people, people like because you. you understand both the sides yeah yeah so the thing yes. is that dialogue has to happen that is our main complaint if these things have to change when whenever you plan the projects you call the people who are concerned there are town planners like this hussein there you are there i am there there are many other people also you know you talk to them if you find the all the experts which have come into our conflicts have come in after we started the fight yes. then they are left trying to cover up and they also express helplessness they how can we cover up this is all blatant what is happening is wrong you have taken up the right issues now how do we cover it up so public participation is zero in zero. most of the exactly yeah. that you have said it correctly unless people don't make it an issue how will the government needs to understand that their acts are being watched by people people understand it but unfortunately we don't they have kept us so busy trying to exist that we don't have that bandwidth to sit and think or do something yeah one more question one for hand, all the family there's families. one hand that is raised there's one hand that is raised city potta for for a while now yeah let's take students questions also city potta um hello all panelists thank you so much for your presentation so i have two questions one is for feroza ma'am and one is for standin sir so uh, uh, the question of feroza ma'am was that uh, Uh, when you uh, spoke have you tried to do like a pilot project even if it's at an academy level wherein you're trying to juxtapose with the current situation a cycle track or a cycle infrastructure within the existing city anywhere like even a small part so currently we are in talks with of course along with a uh, 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 urban uh, planning uh, organization uh, for g south so g south is something which we are working um, yeah but there's a talk going on currently uh, some part of it uh, uh, was public participation where we were involved uh, into the planning uh, 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 of course it's a it's a funding which has come from a private uh, entity uh, it's it's not what uh, the authorities have only given permissions in g south area uh, so the cycle track has come over there uh, personally uh, not very happy uh but um, but that's what uh, the limitation is uh when you have your own organization in the urban design space your limitation is about giving the uh, design okay then when it comes to about implementation implementation will be done by the local authorities in our case it is the bmc which means their local contractors will take care of the a uh, material being used how much ever you would want to say okay fine this is the material which will be best for the track this is the ultimately uh, it's 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 the local authorities which needs to understand that i'm just giving you both the sides yeah but g south is something which we will be focusing on um uh, in, in as a first word uh, there are a couple of uh, infrastructure and couple of software i'm talking about the community building which will happen um like the um, like the equal streets which we had at linking road uh, where that one uh, road was shut so that people could uh, the, the local community or the cyclists or people could come and enjoy that particular space uh, we are talking about the same uh, uh, thing for g south where it could be localized where there are seven corporators seven particular zones in g south where they'll have a local uh, neighborhood cycling plan and a periphery um, a, a longer route for the for the elite i mean people who are pro cyclists they don't want to do just like 5 kilometers they want a longer route so we've kept this whole thing between the elite and the community and the kids uh so this is the plan which we have actually submitted now it's just the time for implementing because i am very busy with the kochi project currently i think march is where we start the conversation for g south but yes i will definitely require a lot of help from minas and uh, uh, rizvi college because again it's not easy to implement anything for the city uh, if we do not have a participation from the youth uh, for the on ground activity because that's that's where the you know when you're getting the kids and women out on the road um road safety is a priority uh, and that's that's where we'll require all that support from you guys 
Uh, absolutely, ma'am. I think whatever you said is very on point because even I have. Uh, so I am not uh, a student here. I'm just a fellow Mumbai car, and I loved uh, the whole panel that Rizvi called it uh, has curated. So I'm attending this session, and um, so even I have had the opportunity to work with BMC on certain urban level projects, and I know what you're exactly saying. So uh, the reason I asked this question was because there was a lot of um, uh, concentration on points where uh, what do you do within the existing fabric? How do you change that? Because uh, like. Uh, after the failure of the BKC project, um, can like having like a separate lane altogether, it's not maybe always possible within a congested city like Bombay. But um, that's the whole reason of my question. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and my second question from Stallion, sir, was, uh, uh, so have you been uh, observing the Ajni one protest in Nagpur? I am sorry, I'm digressing from Mumbai. But the case is very similar to uh, uh, RA. Uh, there is an IMS being set up right within the heart of the city, and they are capturing over an urban forest, uh, which the current government and um, the political party whose agenda this project is have completely denied of it being a forest, which I think was a similar case with RA. So um, what if you have been, if you have some views over it, no, because it's a different I fabric. No, no, like Sakhi, Bombay, it's a different city. Nagpur is a very different city. So, no, no, how wherever would... it is, urban forests have to be protected wherever they are. If you spend a little more money, all your projects can be executed without touching the forest. I am very clear on that. Not a single project will suffer if you spend a little more money. Uh, the people who are fighting it in Nagpur need to take cue from the RA battle and make it. Uh, whatever. See, the RA battle is different because it's always based on facts and documents, which were always in our favor. And we, whatever was thrown at us, we gave it back with equal measure. So we, we will have to build that kind of resource. It won't, see, campaigns won't run on emotions alone. Emotions, oh, absolutely, there are no doubt, but they need to get the data and show. See, there is already a Supreme Court order which says that whatever forests are, are existing should be notified, identified, recorded as forests. And then you you have to file in the, in, on that line, show that it is a forest. It's very easy to get an academic institution to certify the kind of species, do a rapid biodiversity study there, and then submit a report and say that you cannot do it. And Actually, sure all, can... all this is already in the court there, uh, in the uh, Bombay court, the Nagpur chair. It's already there. I think there have been a, a couple of PILs that also have been filed and on the same grounds. So. No, they should go to the Supreme Court, is my opinion. At least someone okay. should go to the Supreme Court. There is a forest which is being uh, not, not which has not been notified, and the the authorities are in content. The other battle can go on in the High Court. See, right. we, unfortunately, we are left in a situation where the courts have to sit in, in governments. Literally, these are decisions which have to be taken. And I'm sure that if they exert the correct amount of pressure on this government, they will come out with some kind of solutions. All said and done. Uh, without any political bias, I would say that this uh, chief minister uh, has uh, what you call give us some hope that something can be saved. If you push it with a solution, I think definitely they will accept it. Absolutely. So uh, there is a solution of shifting the IMS on the outer boundaries of the city. And uh, so there was a recent uh, support by the environmental minister as well. He himself went and visited on ground. And uh, but post that. Uh, the minister who's been uh, proposing this project has put in um, an entire different picture saying that maybe the citizens don't want the project. And so if this project happens, it comes in the heart of the city, right in the forest, because it is not a forest or else we don't do it. So, uh, yeah. So we have to approach the chief minister with the correct documents and facts and uh, everything cannot be uh, handled by the environment minister. See, again, there is political tussles inside also. There are internal right, push and pulls which are going on in the government, which is not visible to the common citizen. We think that by targeting a one particular individual, we'll get through everything, but it doesn't work that way. They need to push the chief minister. He has the power to call everyone together, sit on the table and discuss it out. They should try and put more pressure on the chief minister. And I'm 100% sure that he will find, if you give him a solution, he will definitely move and push for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. And thank, thank you, Rizvi College, for uh, managing this entire event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Aslam also has a question. Yeah. I think we, we'll 
take this as the last question today. I think there's one student who wants to take the question. Yeah, there's one, yeah, one. So after Aslam, there's one student and then you can call it. Acha, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Aslam. Yeah. Okay. This question for Stalin and uh, even for uh, Pisbi College of Architecture. Uh, Stalin, since you're addressing architecture students here, I want to know what role they can play uh, as an architecture student and what, as an environmentalist, what you expect from them. Uh, second question is, if there is any chance the student can learn and come, uh, like if Vanashakti has any uh, space or scope so that they can uh, join for a shorter duration a course or maybe something, some sort of interaction. That's, that's it, yeah. No, we always welcome interns. We are happy to help children, students with their projects. We will do everything we can for them. Uh, from the architecture point of view, I would always uh, tell the students that take some part of nature into your designs. So that, so long as you remain connected, your project, for example, I would just give a very, very simplistic example. There may be a small water body inside your proposed area of construction. Instead of filling it up and making a tower there, maybe you can go in and get a little more FSI and get some incentive to protect it and show it as some kind of natural space in that area. So if you can take nature into it, or you can have a biodiversity park along with it. Right now, whatever is being promoted as uh, green space, and it's, 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 it's very terrible. It's very small areas which are being given out. Instead of, you know, make the presence of the natural indicators there or the natural ecosystem which you can find in a place if you can showcase it inside your project and make that project a high-end project then that you know that should be the way forward okay and uh, the question uh, goes to uh, architecture uh, college uh, like whoever the faculty is is there any uh, you know, deliberate attempt to meet environmentalists and see how they are fighting for the issue and what are the problems when when these environmentalists are fighting for the like uh, some uh, projects like construction projects? What are the things they uh, look upon and how they fight? So, is there any attempt to do that colleges to study that? This I wanted to know from uh, uh, from Rizvi College. So Aslam, I mean, my take on that is like you have uh, environmentalists, there are also uh, a whole lot of architects who are uh, attempting to design more sensitively and more uh, in a more, uh, you know, climate uh, responsive manner. And uh, our focus uh, is also on getting uh, students to not only study their works and uh, uh, understand the theory behind what they do, but uh, say attend workshops uh, with those kind of architects. Some even take up internships uh, with uh, you know architects who uh, practice only natural uh, with natural building materials, natural technologies. So that is one attempt which we have uh, definitely done. But yeah, I think this whole idea of you know opening up uh, to uh, other uh, disciplines who are also into, uh, you know, like I would call even someone like uh, uh, even Firoza or Hussein uh, to me is an environmentalist because whatever they are doing in whatever method they are using, they are doing something which is, uh, uh, you know, their, uh, their method of uh, uh, responding to the environment or making a comment or, you know, compiling, analyzing data about what impacts the environment. So uh, opening our uh, study to a larger uh, realm, to different disciplines is, yes, very important. Okay, so uh, I just wanted uh, to tell you, like, uh, we are doing a wetland walk with Stalin, and this is, uh, for undergrad, is free walk. So that, uh, like, Hallolo is doing a wetland walk with Stalin. Uh, we, we are going to announce that. So we welcome architecture students from Bisbee College to come and understand what actually wetlands are and how their contribution to the like for, for saving the like doing the conservation okay so yeah thank you there was one more student who wanted to ask yes i think there was one more student question no? Teacher, you are taking students' questions, no? Uh, yeah. 
it has done no questions yet. Okay. Yeah, I think so, some one student was directly connected and was wanting to ask a question. Yeah. So she connected directly. So are we done with the questions? Yeah, we're done with the questions now. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think we've had a very wonderful uh, whole uh, panel discussion and whole presentation that we have. And there are, I think, more questions raised than answers given uh, through this entire thing. And we really hope to continue all these questions and extend uh, this idea to the students to keep questioning and keep looking for answers through all of their projects and their work. And uh, I think also like uh, Aslam, so uh, Aslam asked very, uh, you know, like a pertinent question that how can students really participate in this? So we would really encourage all of you to, in, uh, you know, kind of uh, help us even have Rizvi College uh, participate in all of this. Uh, you know, we'll try and uh, be as much as part uh, possible for us to do that. So I think uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. And I think we'll have uh, Rekha ma'am uh, kind of uh, have a few words from Rekha ma'am before we end. So I would uh, just end it by saying that, yeah, we as a college, we've been always talking about environment, like, you know, for our old, all designs and everywhere, we are continuously talking about environment and architecture. So uh, to answer Aslam that it is a very much a part of something which is taught and by creating these talks and dialogues and having people like Hussein and Stalin and Feroza on board and maybe many more talks if we uh, have it, I'm sure students will be more encouraged about uh, the concerns which we all face. So yeah and we also welcome any kind of works uh, uh, are been conducted or any kind of workshops are been conducted by all of you to just keep us informed so we can also ask our students to participate from our end like you know and always we i believe that we will be happy to have you in college and have more um, any kind of discussions if you want to have uh, these things like you know and it was a really informative, I think, session. We had, uh, I was a little bit in and out. I would be frank enough to say that I was not there for the whole time because being the principal of the college, there are so many issues which come up. So I was uh, in and out. But uh, yeah, it was nice hearing you all. And thank you, Hussein. Thank you, Feroza. And thank you, Stalin, for uh, being with us. And we will be in touch with you for uh, some more discussions in our session two i mean season two talks maybe yeah thank you thank, thank you, you so much, much. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir yeah thank you sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you to all the panelists. We'll now take a lunch break for an hour and please be back at 3, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. So it's not an hour. Huh? We'll be back. We'll be starting at 3. Yeah. Lunch break is 45 minutes, 44 minutes actually. Yeah, please be back. Kadesai. To all the faculty, students. I would now like to call upon Professor Jigar Patel to introduce Semester 4 Students Project to us. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Ma'am, hai na yaar? Okay, lads. Ma'am, hai na. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi. Yeah. hi. So this semester, uh, the fourth semester, the studio revolves around understanding the East Indian community. And uh, we chose this because they have multicultural history, very rich tradition and uh, very colorful architecture. So we wanted to understand a bit more about them. And we wanted uh, students to know about this very indigenous community. So East Indians have a very turbulent history of conversion and their occupation. So in 16th and 16th, between 16th and 17th century, uh, Port, when Portuguese invaded a uh, certain part of uh, Basai and uh, you know uh, the part till Goa and more, uh, they converted a lot of uh, locals here. So that is the conversion we are talking about. 
and then occupation. So the influence of Maharashtrian culture and Portuguese traditions makes their identity very complex. So the students have tried to understand and build a relationship between both, right? And the, the whole idea of the documentation was to look at physical elements as uh, like, uh, to understand the community and draw a relationship between the intangible elements in order to understand like, uh, you know, uh, uh, what are the stories, you know, what are the legends, what are the, you know, uh, things that uh, drive them, what are their, what is the identity, how are they thriving in times of globalization. So for that, they've carried out interviews, they've made drawings, and they've done a beautiful mapping. And uh, so let's see, over to you students. Yeah, let's start the presentation. There is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Uttan is a coastal town just north of Mumbai in Thane district of Maharashtra. The village is one of the few that have still held on to the retro culture of Mumbai as the dis destination is comparatively less explored. The entire area has lush greenery and it all comes alive during the monsoon season. The Uttan beach might not be the cleanest beach in Mumbai, but spending some time here gives a law, raw, blunt look into the daily lives of a typical Indian village and a fisher folks village. One unique aspect of the village is its colorful houses. Everyone here believes in painting their houses in garish colors, which gives the entire Uttan village a magnificent view. Uttan village is on a hill and the houses are on an ascent, so it's a steep climb if one wishes to go to the top. There are some spots in Uttan that are on an elevation and one gets a beautiful view of the Uttan village from these spots. The road up is not the best of construction and is more of a me meandering kind of a path. Uttan village is a predominantly Catholic area and there are prayer halls at every other corner. The village is one of the best ways to experience the vibes of old Goa. It is also one of the few places that have actual fishing boats, boats that the fisher folk take out in the sea. These boats are as colorful and as garishly painted as the houses and make for great photography subjects. Wondering more about the experience there? There's more ahead that semester four students, Firdos, Taikum, Aisha and Zahid will explain in their presentation. Please have a look. Hello everyone. So myself, Firdos, from second year. And let's discuss more about the film. Documenting a required area and about a certain community is a huge process. So the question arises, where to start with? Which led us to first document and analyze the intangible aspects of Uttan. Uttan, which is a blend of East Indian and Tamil community, allowed us to learn about multiple elements. The origin of Catholic community is due to the conversion of East Indian into Catholic by Portuguese in the 16th century. As we embedded into the Catholic community, we were greeted by the vibrant house of the pleasant and welcoming wives. There were churches acting as landmarks entailing religious and cultural aspects, including photos outside the outside the churches, acting as prayer praying and discussing sports. There were stone tablets near the church to honor the people for their contribution in the community. The areas surrounding the church were used to religious as well as community work. There were grottos and cross placed in the front of their houses, acting as a gathering spot for formal and informal discussions and also for weddings. Moving ahead towards Koli community, we were greeted with fishy order and topograph topographic land. Holy people as a community have strong union among themselves. They have their own ways and their rules for functioning. A typical Koli house includes a veranda, Oli, where they re re repair fishes and make nets. 
where they prepare fish nets and make nets which were taught to them by their ancestors the community used the existing ancient wells for their daily purpose activities including washing clothes and keeping them above the well for drying drainage space is also created around the well by laddling the land around it so that the water can seep into the sewage area the most of the, they use most of their open land to dry fishes in form of by hanging them on the bamboo or by keeping them on the open land so this was all about intangible aspects of uttan i will hand it over to the next person so my name is saikum and i will be talking about the topography and the landscape and the general occupation of the people of uttar so the first thing we did is mapped out the sun path of the site which uh, the sun traces the trajectory from east to west via south so the general topography of land is uh, 7 meters on average there are steep hills towards the east that recede towards the arabian sea towards the west uh the top soil is uh, primarily comprised of alluvial soil which is perfect for farming vegetable crops uh, which we will see further uh and the major water bodies of this land are uh, obviously the arabian sea but there are also some minor water bodies such as there are many wells which are also in the gathering spaces and also a nala that is near the market that works as a drainage system that empties into the arabian sea there are also many perennial lakes the perennial lakes of work are a multi purpose in the sense that during during the monsoon season they uh, act as catchment ponds that collect water and uh, are supplied to various houses but during the summer when they are dry they are open fields that are used for grazing as well as uh, a playground for children so here you can see a, a really large catchment pond over here and here on the bottom left bottom right you can see we have compared two sections of the site the sections represent uh, some major landmarks of uttan one of them being the church uh, the uh, others being a farmers house a small residential cluster etc the vegetation in uttan is not only used in the form of farming but it is also used in the form of landscaping such as there are pine trees lined on this street near the church where the major catholic community lives the pine trees obviously represent the christmas trees that are used to decorate during christmas and there are other many which uh, flowering plants that are used for landscaping such as poinsettia etc poinsettias are obviously red and green which represent the colors of christmas and then uh, the farmers houses also have a very uh, general uh, language around uttan such that there are uh, these wide plains outside the jara houses the first we were wondering that what these plains are for then one of the farmers we talked to we interviewed he explained to us that these plains are not a uh, construction uh, for construction purpose but these are used just for drying fishes they have also made this sort of contraption with like two vertical bamboos and six to eight horizontal bamboos that are used for drying fishes uh, and the farmers fields are also multi purpose in the sense that in the during the summer they are used to grow vegetables such as brinjal turai uh, lalmat etc but during the winter they are used as a uh, grazing fields or even as playgrounds for children etc there are also a lot of banana farms and to in interrupt I suggest that if uh, you could zoom into that uh, you know that sketch that you are talking because this look very beautiful and i just don't want to skip them okay Understand what you're saying uh, much better. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So your, as I was saying, we have compared two elevations of summer and winter. So here you can see during the summer they are growing crops such such as brinjal, etc. But during the winter the same fields are used for uh, playing uh, games or even grazing. Uh, and also what we noticed that there were these small residential clusters and uh, between like four or five buildings. there were these trees that were always fruit bearing trees such as coconut jamun or uh, jamphal or chiku etc they were obviously planted purposely by that small community so that they can 
or use the fruits for themselves. Where does this happen? If you can show it in, on the plan, is it like an open uh, community space? Yeah, so here you can see there are like between uh, like a small residential cluster, there is always like a small collection of fruit bearing trees most of the time. Okay. And even the buildings are almost of that height where the coconuts uh, are growing. So they can easily uh, uh, harvest those fruits from there. Here, as you can see. How is the, uh, you know, the ownership or the control? Uh, is is it like a, an understanding in the community or is it? Uh, like we actually did uh, talk to people that were sitting outside their houses. They said that uh, they, these trees have been here since they have bought the house. So they don't know exactly know if those they were planted, but we are assuming that those trees were planted after the buildings were built so that they can share the fruit bearing trees among themselves. Like this, whatever the tree uh, boundary connects to the these houses, for example. Okay, so it is uh, like an understood, uh, mutually understood thing uh, yeah. takes the fruit, right? Yeah. Okay, because that is a very interesting observation and, uh, and like here you can see this coconut tree. Yeah. It, the coconuts are growing right onto the terrace. So if anyone goes onto the terrace, they can easily grab the coconuts and make, they can even share it with their surrounding buildings. Okay. The other major trees that we no noticed were Tarvula, uh, Ashoka trees, which were mostly used for landscaping, bananas, Gulma trees were very prominent over there, etc. Uh, some of the uh, fauna life we noticed were the bagulas near the fish market, the honey buzzards, the fly catchers that obviously prey on the dead fish that the um, fishermen throw away. Another thing, very interestingly, we noticed that the trees that are used as landscaping are also used uh, in the form to create an interesting uh, space for people, such as here in the rehab center. Right next to the church, there was a rehab center in which the trees were used to create a form of a uh, pleasant environment for the uh, people there. Then we come to the occupation. In terms of the occupation, there were majorly two communities in Uttan, the Kolis and the Kumbis. The Kolis are usually associated with fishing, whereas the Kumbis are associated with farming. But when we interviewed a person over there, like a farmer, he said that he doesn't exactly know what community he belongs to. He might be a mix of both. So there, uh, and he was from like our generation. So uh, we noticed that uh, with time, like those boundaries are being faded. Like even that person that we interviewed, he was quite uh, well educated. Like he. He even uh, had a job in the city, and he only helped out on the farm because it was active, because it was his ancestral farm. Uh, and uh, in terms of the coalies, the fishing is another very big major uh, occupation of the area. Uh, the what they do is that the fishermen they go out to sea, they go uh, they go and uh, they go and stay in boats on sea for like a, a week or maybe ten days. And then they come back to shore to sell the fish. The major fish they sold there are uh, mushi, bangra, curly, or even crabs and prawns. And uh, they sold it in the market itself. That was along the shores of the beach it itself. And we also no noticed there was a, a pier in which the trucks can dock themselves so that if they want to ship the fish somewhere, they can easily tra uh, transport it. Uh, I'll now pass on the mic to the next person, Aisha. Hi, uh, I'm Asha. As we move forward, um, we further documented about built and open area and many constructional elements like over here. You can see that we have seen the kind of construction that has taken place and uh, the kavedu and the tiles that the clay tile that has been used over the roof. And then um, 
we used, uh, we talked about uh, the built in open spaces, as you can see here in the map, um, the open area was comparatively uh, more than the built up area. And the open area was usually used for storage or as a transition space or accessibility from like uh, primary street to secondary street. And in semi-open spaces, and open spaces, the secondary street, most of the houses have porch over here. Most of the houses have porch. And on the primary street, most of the um, play, uh, shops uh, area was acquired by the market, bhaji, uh, and uh, shops. And the, there were many places that have been observed that were left unused as ruins. The built up area, um, the built up area around church, as you can see. Yeah, so the built up area around church have more green spaces uh, in front of their house, which partially block their views for privacy reasons. And there were um, adjacent placement and level didn't notice in two adjacent buildings and to block the visibility and uh, to create uh, more privacy centric houses. The open spaces around the church were used as um, gathering spaces um, for religious and social event over here. The market area primarily have comparatively lower plinth level as we can see over here. Uh, it has comparatively lower plinth level as compared to the plinth level we have seen around the seaside. Um, the spaces accommodated by the fishermen's um, were more crowded and the open spaces, spaces in front of their house uh, were used for storing and processing purpose. And uh, there were more common access area to multiple houses creating more interactive spaces. Um, houses that were built near seaside has comparatively more um, larger plinth level that was approximately 1.4 uh, to 1.7 meter because of the high tides and the plinth was used for multiple activities um, such as drying fish and uh, uh, even as a social interaction space. Um, the orientation um, was observed that the windows were placed towards the west side. So um, for the wind direction and uh, there were lesser window um, towards the south side to avoid uh, harsh days and night. As, as we move further, um, we see that the old, old houses were built using multiple different materials such as wood, brick, clay tiles, etc. Uh, it consisted of various such textures to enhance the aesthetic purpose of the house. The new houses uh, that we are seeing were usually G plus three structures and um, the uh, stone, um, the plinth level was uh, made using stone and cement uh, to withstand the water pressure. The material, uh, okay. yeah. So the material of the pavement uh, defines the area for the parking. Uh, by segregating different materials, the movement and the rough texture to avoid skating as well. Yeah, I'll pass it over to the next. Hello, uh, you are not audible. Yes, ma'am, the next person Hello. 
so i'm zahid and i'll be presenting this panel on uh, the streets and social mapping like how the community is connected to the outside and also internally so we did mapping on three different levels that is uh, that is community level and uh, community level open spaces cluster level and then the private spaces that the people have the private spaces would include the front yards backyards and the alleys that they have for the uh, for the internal private uh, for for the internal private spaces and there's this primary uh, road that connects uttan to the outside that is uh, like the mira behind the area and to the national highway too so uh as you can see over here for gathering spaces they don't actually need gathering spaces i mean they have the beach so that is their treasure so they don't have to like create a specific space for you know gathering and all so they have the beach they carry out uh, most of the ceremonies over there and even the streets that they share with their neighbors they uh, they are not skeptical that they are not skeptical of the privacy that uh, that will be intruded or something they celebrate and uh, the ceremonies they are all in the open and they uh, put out uh, when we went there to actually document we also saw that there was this mandap in the street and uh, i mean that street was obviously shared uh, shared by so many people but it was on the street and they were like uh, celebrating with everyone like the neighbors and obviously the family members also so that is about the gathering spaces then the other spaces uh, will be around the church the church has a a uh, significant promenade so people do gather over there and this is not okay on the top you can see the church over here so the church had a promenade where the people would gather during the masses or and this is a section of the street as you can see this uh this this building and also a flat house so it's shared among all of them and these narrow uh, alleyways that are used by uh the people who have uh, like bigger houses usually and not a building or something so they have private apartments that is why they uh, they have kept the entrances to that specific area a bit narrower so that not many people can come in i was not able to follow uh, much of what information you gave me since i couldn't figure out where to look and uh, whether you had that kind of drawings also you mentioned that you know people don't have the need to gather and i think this is something quite revolutionary <laughs> what i'm hearing oh, so uh, i didn't mean to say the need to gather like the need for a specific gathering space like uh, a dedicated space like they have the beach so they can uh, use that space but you so mentioned that there were three levels because not every for a small chat you would not go all the way to the beach uh, that is one but i think you have made some very interesting sketches if i i mean if you want to take the time if we have the time to zoom in into one and maybe you can explain and then i didn't really understand what is happening at the church where is the promenade that you are describing oh uh, yes i'll zoom in and sketch maybe if you understand even one level i'll you know kind of get a grasp of what's happening yeah so can you zahe zahe ek bar orient kar do pura uh, map and uske baad ek do cluster bata do sir theek hai okay right you can show one level of i mean uh, aapka jo 
three circles no i think is is it talking about three levels because i i saw three hierarchical uh, something that you mentioned that one is the beach one is the community and one is the uh, at every unit level so even if you show me one case because there's this very beautiful sketch you've made on the top uh, which is showing your otla and all other things so how does that work and i think in the previous presenter also showed uh, or mentioned something like a 1.7 meter plinth height i was really keen to see how that interacts with the street if at all you have or maybe you can just describe what happens at that edge uh, unless you're going uh, more detail in the later slides i'll definitely wait for that no the otlas and the plinths that is always there it is also used for uh, it is connected with their occupation i mean the fishes the they after they're done fishing they also keep it uh, when they just come from the beach they keep it over there and also for interacting it's open to the street so every passer by like if he knows who lives over there they obviously communicate and stand over there and talk to people so it's all can you speed. zoom the uh, space was of otla yeah one i was interested or you want to see it zoom the sketch zoom into so otla no and oh. if it is in previous slide just show it to her but yes. was i right in hearing that 1.7 or uh, i heard it wrongly because okay. that is something which you know it is it will be interesting to see it might be quite a unique thing that they've come up with uh in this slide um so the plinth level that was observed, observed right near the sea was approximately 1.4 to 1.7 like right next to the sea okay. uh, because of the high tides and as we they go, look in that direction or i mean the, the yeah, does the house yeah. have anything to do with that edge or it's just a dead thing so no obviously it does have the plinth is like uh, functionally used for um, their um occupational purpose as they use that space for um drying out fishes and even uh, as a social interactive spaces since there there is a lot of fisherman community observed near the sea so uh, a lot of crowding has been observed over here so they try to um, accommodate as much space as they could and occupy it um in a progressive manner so whatever the plane that has been observed near the sea uh is comparatively higher uh, even uh, it as a functionality purpose as well and also as an activity purpose yeah um actually what i was interested in is is there a street after this between the uh, sea be beach and the house uh, or it's it's uh, you know the uh, the entrance of the house is on the other side and this is the uh, rare rare side of the house no um, no so the entrance um, there was a street going from the uh, um, sea and the edge, uh, entrance was on the adjacent side um, so obviously the water whatever the water flows up during the high tide uh, there was a stone uh, curving that was created near the plinth level so even if the high tide goes up um, it just get absorbed by stones and glide down and the entrance was given to like this adjacent side as they walk in as you can see through this section so there was the entrance was on this side and the entrances of the house were like opposite to each other mm -hmm. yeah please proceed and maybe we can come back to this <clears throat> yeah so this is the section of the street that i was telling you about um, you can notice the plinth that aisha was talking about it's higher over here near the sea 
and uh, mostly the social interaction that happens uh, is in the marketplace of course like uh, most of the people there do consume seafood so they will come at the market and uh, there's a bus stand which is on the outskirt so people who have to go out daily they obviously gather over there for the bus and uh, they have uh, crucifixes in between streets like in the christian part of the settlement so uh, religious processions uh, would have would be taking place over there as well um, yes yeah, so that is all about the streets and social mapping of putan i hope uh, you 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 all have an, you all have an idea about putan in brief of course but through our eyes and through our words if if at all we were able to convey that to you all so yes i would like to end this presentation any hello hi ma'am are you there uh, i'm here okay great great so uh, let me just introduce everyone uh, to kokila uh, ma'am she is an architect she is an urban designer and she is a social entrepreneur working across uh, scales of furniture to urban spaces but with uh, people at the center so maybe she uh, she looks at participation as a core to design so uh, i i uh, have not had uh, any personal interaction with her but uh, she was a faculty here with us uh, probably uh, meera ma'am can uh, elaborate uh, more about uh, her work hi kokila welcome here hi meera today symposium and it is great to see you again in uh, with us uh, kokila used to be faculty in visri college of architecture she still works with us for say design ad you as well as some other uh, subjects and just a minute i have some just a minute okay hi there was some bandwidth issue so we had to switch on the camera now we have switched on the camera so hi kokila welcome here uh, kokila is to be faculty with us uh, for uh, ninth semester ad and then i had interacted with her so she is as uh, jigar has already uh, introduced her she is uh, urban designer from sept and she is social entrepreneur uh, urban entrepreneur and she is working on various urban sustainable solutions and i am sure when we were working together i i saw her skill the way she interacts with the student as well as the kind of feedback she gives pertinent feedback she gives without actually making student feel that they have done something wrong and i really like that uh, interaction of kokila with the student i i hope kokila will be able to give appropriate comment to this goran uttai village students also what they have mapped etc etc so welcome kokila thank you thank you very much mira your for... camera is switched off kokila yeah i'll just turn that on yeah, yeah thank you so much for having me again and it's amazing to see uh, like you rightly said this so many beautiful drawings i just hope they are printed at a nice large scale you know so it does justice to uh, you know every beautiful line there um so whoever i think uh, i think the faculty member in place i think needs a big uh, applause there yeah we are sure actually we should have used prezi next time probably we'll be using prezi when we are present bdm yeah absolutely it is very That'll easy for the prezi yes it is yes. very easy for the prezi to zoom in on the details correct correct um 
nice work. I think very nice uh, documentation. Um, uh, do we go brief or how do we go? <laughs> this is only one presentation, right? Yeah, you can. You, uh, we have 10 15 minutes, I think. Can have so I'll keep it brief. Uh, reason why? Because I think it was put together pretty well. Yeah, I think it was put together really nice. Uh, and was this a second year work? Yes, I'm... yes, yes, second year. It's Both really good. Yeah. Second year of uh, undergrad, no? Yes. Second yeah, year. I think in that case, it is like a really good um, uh, piece of work here that I saw today. Um, I think the attention to detail, attention to what needs to be observed, uh, whether it is at architectural or an urban level, I think they are starting off really well in their uh, course of five years, I would say. Um, having said that, I feel um, I had uh, the documentation or the data part seems to be uh, rather than there seems to be a good lot of hunger to capture as much as possible or maybe it also looks like a good lot of teamwork you know because some person sees this and the other student sees this and all of that has been collated really well um, so that is it I think what uh, work can further uh, you know rather this work can be carried on in a way that if we are able to infer right infer i would not even say from each sheet or an each or each aspect let's say if we we're, we're boxing these things right i mean as a, a profession or as a training we we quickly come to this that okay open and build or uh, this is vegetation this is economics or this is social but i think also because they are second year i would really encourage that uh, we can come up to those categories or rather, uh, you know, I'm specifically speaking to students now uh, in the sense that uh, one before you start putting it into those boxes, no, like I think even in school, we are taught yeah, science, hai, yeah, maths, hai, uh, yeah, uh, you know, sociology, hai, yeah, geography, hai. but at that level, we aren't uh, really shown the lens that all of this is together you know, life happens or rather uh, if you say this is a house and if a scientist has to see it or if a chemist has to see it or if a biologist has to see it, he's going to infer in his own way. But the house as a subject is not going to be split in parts for everyone to, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't say that you only look at me from this angle. So even when we're looking at an urban fabric, um, I think the boxes can arrive much later, but I think the curiosity or the inquiry has to come first that ye plinth hai, yeah, this is the kind of roofs or this is the kind of streets before putting them into the uh, the under the title or under your slide as a street pattern i think it's more important to be curious about why that street is happening in that sense right for example we we spoke of the plinth the plinth now or the otla or that um, veranda that you you all were showing it does it belong to the street or does it belong to the house right and are you going to put it as a social space? Are you going to put it under your occupation? Are you going to put it under economy? Right? So, and I, the way I see these sketches are, and I said, you know, something that there is a lot of hunger. So I think a lot of time can actually be spent on observing each of these in light of all these, uh, you know, titles that we are very excited to put that on our sheets or even in our minds. Um, right. So when I was very curious about asking, what is the plinth? Because does it interact with the street or like historically our river banks, for example, they were not really meant to be social spaces. The, the entire town or city, um, you, other than let's say these um, holy towns, which everything responds to the river, but mostly the river was seen as much of a danger to be kept away. Uh, you know, and the houses may or may not have really looked onto the river as a social space. It was a, an activity that you go collect water or it is to harness for your fields and agriculture. So it, it shows in the house type. It shows in whether your community space is open out to that area or do they have a back to it. So I was, you know, trying to understand that when I um, asked about this 1.7 because 
you know, suddenly how you go along the street, what you see uh, as a person on the street about that house or how does the person sit there uh, on his otla and does he interact? You know, what is the angle of uh, vision for him? You know, people are walking at, his, at this level, at your floor level, and that is the height of the person's eye or her head. So uh, I think as much as the 3D, uh, the space was explored in 3D drawings, I think a lot more could go into sectional understanding as well. Um, two is even in the plans, I think this looked a lot like how you would do an illustrated book, right? But I think if we have to slowly get into um, architectural or urban design drawings, you might want to really zoom in and infer what that detail is doing because it is, um, it's not by accident that people reach those details or, uh, uh, you know, it just get, doesn't get built like mm, bus kar diya, right? Because these details are evolved over generations, over centuries. And we like, we like it or not, there is always a reason why those details are like that. I just took a, a few notes while we spoke. So I understood that there was something called catchment ponds, um, right? So how is it really used? Is it that, you know, there's just water, is it stagnant water? And in the, uh, you know, in the drier months, it's like completely dry. Um, so what happens there really? Because, uh, you know, in, if you see in, uh, uh, places like Calcutta, etc., they actually fish out of that, um, uh, out of the water. It's basically freshwater fishing. And uh, also in areas of the country, they actually auction out that pond. You know, so the pond, that little pond, are auctioned out. Maybe they have a lease for every 10 years. And then that one family or that one ownership only can uh, fish there. So, you know, it becomes like this economic um, in, in economy or livelihood generation kind of a thing as well. So what is the water table? Can everyone just dig a little, uh, you know, pond? Because I think the uh, built open ratio was pretty good here. So then maybe does everyone have the capability to just dig a quick pond and then you do um, a fishery or you do, um, you know, freshwater fishing there? Is that a possibility, right? So these questions can get answered when the inference is more solid, right? When we say that we are observing these things and the sheets that I see is that they're great observations, but when we start looking at inferring it or converting that data into, you know, some kind of a points to be used or how do we, let's say that we're talking about upgradation or uh, we are talking about um, triggers, uh, right? So can we simply just introduce these kind of a thing? And something which is very interesting, and I think uh, it, it could do a good lot of uh, positivity to, let's say, um, ideas like urban farming or urban orchards is what you brought about, that who owns that yield, right? And why is it not that, uh, you know, our tree plantations on our urban roads, why don't we have fruit trees? Right? Why don't we have, because there's this whole conversation, even if we have flowering trees, we feel everyone is just coming and taking away the flowers. Um, even in the public gardens, you see that people just come and take away everything. So that whole attitude of let the trees or the let the fruit be there till it, till it reaches fruition. And uh, how does that whole respect come about? So I think this is a much deeper understanding of the people themselves, how satisfied, how contented they are and and where is that break what can a common person learn from their attitude of respecting a common resource you know i'm not uh, thinking about legally who does that tree belong to i think your observations also were like um, you know whoever that tree is i mean whoever whichever house is along the tree and there is this uh, subtle understanding that that the fruit belongs to me i mean how how rich is that uh, kind of an attitude, right? So there are a lot of things I think if we borrow or if we really get, dig deeper, I think there are a lot of clues that we can use in urban planning and urban design. So that is a learning that I will want to inquire further from here or maybe if uh, someone is in, really interested can go and see how that works. 
uh, one more thing is, I think in today's uh, context, what was nice is um, one of you all spoke to that one uh, person and he says, I don't know which community I belong to. I mean, this is like really something really cool, no? Uh, where everyone is fighting for their faith and they're saying my faith uh, bigger than your faith or my dad bigger than your dad and here someone is saying I don't I don't know and it's okay you know I have my community who uh, you know who, who still accepts me so what is that you know and I feel a lot of this attitude has translated into the built it is not separate right uh, people are uh, drying their fish and you know I think the Kohli community uh, I know, uh, I know in the sense I'm, I kind of got the opportunity to see also, is that they are so much, uh, you know, like a joint family, anyone is walking into anyone's house and there are no boundaries per se, not even in their minds and it shows on their, uh, uh, in their built spaces also. So I would love to, uh, you know, help you all see that kind of uh, barrier, not really barrier free, but those soft edges you know, and how that, uh, the, the beliefs of that community and how that is translating into the built space. I think this was my biggest learning I, from your uh, presentation and uh, yeah, uh, quite an insightful work. Um, there's also uh, one point where you all said that the fishing, fishing is done in such a way that the fishermen are off for almost a week or so. Which means that what is the method they are using? Are they, which is the kind of boats they are using? Because this has a lot of bearing on uh, the environmental issues that are doing today. You know, big ships versus small boats. If you have small boats, you can't stay out in the sea for so long. Uh, you know, they do this early morning, you know, before dawn or they leave at night and they're, they're back by dawn. Uh, and the kind of fish that is left or that survives uh, after this line of the big big ship, you know, which keeps you away for a week or more, does does that stretch become barren? You know, so and there are a lot of environmental questions also in this form of fishing. And has that changed their day to day life? And has that day, uh, reflected into their built spaces? You know, and when they go away for a week long, which means that uh, maybe there are no men in that community for that. Uh, that stretch of uh, time right and how does that translate yeah so i think after the study there there uh, after the kind of data and the observations that you've done and the sketching that you've done i think you guys would have been full of questions you know so and it's very important to try and understand those questions rather than taking them at face value because I think a visual study will, will simply stop uh, your level of inquiry and it will also, you know, how will you use your learnings into the work that you do, right? So, uh, whereas for me, I think these four or five points, which are really rich takeaways, I will actually be more hopeful that, you know, things like collective urban farming really works. For me, that is a takeaway, but how that works, maybe I need to do my studies or I can depend on you for giving me that answer over, over the due course. So thank you very much. I think this was a, a lovely, lovely uh, work done. And I hope that you all, uh, you know, continue to sketch uh, way later as well. So for second year, I think this is really nice work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh... Actually, the comments were really, uh, I hope that uh, they've understood, they, uh, understood it. The drawings were beautiful, but as you rightly said, uh, there has to be a certain level of inquiry in terms of analysis or making diagrams out of those sections that you mentioned. And uh, even they had, you know, a lot of cluster, uh, cluster drawings, but if they could maybe convert it into a line di diagram and then superimpose it with each layers, probably, because yes. they all have those layers in hand. They just have to superimpose on each other and then they could easily extract the analysis. And uh, I think uh, this would help them. I hope that uh, they work on this and they move ahead in their studio. Uh, so with that, uh, we thank you, ma'am. Uh, this was very insightful for us and uh, really, really good for your, uh, us to get your comments.
Aja Rupa. So I would also say that the work was really good looking at them as uh, these batch they have hardly seen college like you know they were the ones who came in in the lockdown like you know so still if they have produced a little work I think which is really commendable but that does not give them the liberty that they get away thinking that um, oh yeah like you know this is it like they they as Kokila said that there's lots they need to understand and they need to do a lot of sketching and also how how what are you going to extract from these drawings you know what what are your learnings this has to be really i think taken into consideration and it was a interesting work because i also saw it for the first time i didn't get a chance to see it so i did see it and uh, some good work done I yeah. was really happy with the you know, level of drawings they came up with and level of maturity they came up with in terms of presentation itself. Uh, definitely there were some shortcomings in terms of uh, you know, presenting the work here today. But all, that's, uh, all, uh, all that is said and done. But uh, they did this uh, without uh, you know, uh, faculty being on site. They did this during the third quite week. A, quite so, a quite a yeah, uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah work yeah. and uh, yeah I cannot emphasize line drawings enough right so I yeah. think when I was saying inferences which is basically pulling them down into uh, sticks and bones and that is where their secrets or their um, you know really solutions might lie so uh, wonderful wonderful thank you for having me on this so thank you Kokila in fact we are I'm seeing you we, we we did interact on the messages like you know we've never met in person so now hopefully we are expecting you to come as a visiting faculty also for our other years so maybe we will get in touch with you if you are still free and if you have some time uh, you can uh, uh, tell us and we will be happy to have you on board sometime. thank you very much I'm yeah. looking forward to it yeah 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 Thank you so much for your time and uh, crits. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are done. Uh, students have any questions? Do st does students have any questions for Kokila? I have a question for Jigar. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jigar, these are really beautiful drawing. Even I have seen it for the first time, though I have seen the exhibition, but as full fledged presentation. So they are really nice. But I have one question, this community, you studied this community and their lifestyle. Uh, how does this pandemic affect their lifestyle? Any students wants to uh, answer that or should I answer that? Khadija, you can answer. Um, yeah, so obviously it is a general thing. Uh, the pandemic in general affected, you know, all all the departments everywhere. And so uh, the fishing or the fishery department also got hit. And as we know that uh, in Uttan, the, the actual occupation or the majority people um, are occupied with the uh, fishing um, fishing department, the fisheries. So that got a major hit. And uh, in terms of the travel, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, their travel got really, uh, as in they do the travel by boats, but as you know, there were travel restrictions even in the sea. So that ways, um, you know, uh, their travel got really uh, restricted in that sense. Uh, so these are some of the uh, things that, you know, um, make make us think that even the younger generation there uh they would they want to kind of they're they're questioning their identity you know they're questioning their uh their roots which is very dangerous which is which is you know very very dangerous so um i mean pandemic might go but there's still this thing that we need to we need to keep reminding them that they're important their community is important. We need more. Um, we need more uh, rich communities like these, and we need to nurture them. So that uh, that is irrespective of the fact if there is a pandemic or not. Uh, I, I I I believe that. So about identity, I would like to add uh, uh, one thing. Uh, whatever uh, Khadija has added, 
uh, i think uh, in terms of occupation definitely the younger generation is looking uh, for, uh, to you know go outside and uh, have jobs or uh, new jobs in cities uh, but in terms of identity the community is uh, that way you can say conservative uh, they they are opposing any kind of development that uh, uh, in this belt which government is proposing so this region had been marked as a tourist zone for uh, by uh, mumbai uh, uh, so so uh, definitely uh, bandar and uttan is in the uh, vasai virar uh, sorry they have their own municipality but gorai and manori and all the pulwem all these villages have uh, are under bombay so they had marked this as a tourism uh, tourism pockets but uh, these communities are opposing that and uh, in that sense uh, they they know their value and they are uh, i would say not questioning that part of their identity they are very rigid in that sense and uh, it is i think uh, that is why they uh, that is why we can differentiate and the, we can identify them in the in first place uh, definitely uh, uh, pandemic aaya jo bhi hai jaise bhi modernization ho raha hai fishing uh, you know because of pollution the uh, fishing is not as much beneficial as it used to be uh, farming unke paas utna land nahi hai jo zyada uh, crop aa sake unke paas so that is also one of the issue so in that sense they are moving ahead they are going out but uh, they are taking their identity uh, you know uh, keeping their identity as it is yeah also to add to that you know there are middle, middlemen in between with the with the coming of the pandemic those middlemen are not were not there anymore right so selling of fish became very very difficult for them so now they so what we are working towards is finding a direct relationship between the fisher folk as in people who um, people who go out to catch the fish and the consumers so there needs to be a direct connection between the two because times like the pandemic they kind of make you realize that middlemen don't always like they're not available all the time for example during the time of the pandemic so what do you do then so there needs to be like a direct connect between the seller and the buyer which is the fisher folk and the consumers i think this is very important point you observed khatija and i mean because once you have observed what is this problem then obviously you are you will be able to analyze what kind of solution there will be though you may not give because you may you may be restricted to the special solution for this community but yes there will be some solution like you have identified one particular problem of their livelihood how their livelihood has affected because of the pandemic because now the middleman that layer is not there anymore similarly i have seen this urban fabric it was very close knit fabric it must have affected but uh, but point well taken nice analysis for your whatever the effects of pandemic yeah any more questions from students faculty um yeah so your inputs were very valuable and going through your remarks um we just realized that since urban and urban movement is grasping over their community how are we supposed to create a space that incorporate both their heritage as well as development grasped by urbanization as in the correlation creating a harmony between both the um spaces and development so uh, just uh, closing this i would encourage uh, you know that you all can look up uh, concepts or other movements um like uh, sita slow you know c i t t a s l o w which is basically saying slow city uh, it's an italian term and uh, it means that you know what basically the fast fast pace of life or globalization and um, uh, but this movement talks about respecting your regional um uh, specialities and uh, being able to really see what is important uh, aspect of ours like you know the observations that also that i had um that and these are peculiar these can just get easily washed away like you're rightly saying you know it, it, you just might want to wear certain clothes or own uh, own certain things or even when you mentioned about identity so you know it it 
sounds very healthy that uh, there is a kind of ambiguity this is okay we don't know and it doesn't we but we don't know whether he says it doesn't matter does he say that oh my god you know that it's a big deal now that i'm i'm not sure and i'm out there going to uh, figure out what i am etc is that the tendency right so it can be on left or right it can just fall on either side and uh, then it can either be a really nice or a really dangerous kind of a thing the other thing uh, about koli communities that i notice is uh, or rather you know the way they take ownership you know they take ownership as a as a community and over their public space which is like they can actually or they in fact own the beach you know in that sense the way they play did you did you all observe how whether they play on the beach they play uh, football or they would have put up a volleyball net they oh. we see that they put up swings right did yeah actually they did the kids were around playing using the fishing nets and balls and using or whatever that was available even the ships and the boats that were over here and also um, they were very proud in inheriting what they were as in their identity they were very proud of being a fisherman being a coli and being whoever they are and as a whole community is is indian community as a whole they were like a they didn't segregated themselves because like uh, there were multiple kind of catholic residency koli residency but as an entire community they uh, didn't segregated themselves as uh, oh this is a different kind of occupation or different kind of belong belonging uh, what we have observed is they have taken the entire community and when taekong said that um, a person said that he don't know who he is it was in the context of as in there have been so um, Uh, combined together as an entire whole uh, community as a familiar place that they don't really feel the um, need to be left out fantastic yeah so in fact i would encourage that you uh, you know whether you have time or not but at least make one last slide where you put down these uh, you know these uh, i wouldn't say salient features but they i think far beyond salient features there's something which really the world needs today you know and uh, just le- even if there are questions now or observations i think it, that's okay but it's important to really put that in black and white and otherwise you might just forget over the years and the whole speciality thing about that community and then somewhere it will come up again maybe 10 years 20 years down the line and you might want to find that answer somewhere but it's important uh, that it's recorded yeah so uh, great i think you all have a good capacity to uh, understand these deeper things so all the best yeah thank you thank you ma'am it was great to have this discussion with you um and thank you to everyone attending the discussions today i hope that today inspires ideas and discussions around the ways that can make our city a better place i would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists who made it possible to spare their valuable time and be a part of these discussions we couldn't have pulled off today's symposium without the hard work of principal rca moderators all our faculty our coordinators the student council and all the students last but not the least i would also like to show my gratitude towards the administrative and supportive staff of the college for facilitating the event Thank you everybody we're looking forward to meeting you again at 9:15 tomorrow have a great even evening ahead thank you 9 o'clock you. right we'll meet at 9 okay 9 not 9:15 9 yeah. okay hello okay. thank you bukila see you again thank, thank you, you thanks for inviting thank you thanks so much rekha bye bye bye, bye. so yeah khadija and the students all of you have put up good work